Yeah, we're going. All right, welcome everybody to the third annual Trader Line Trading Conference. We're super excited to be doing this once again this year. Uh, right, as I mentioned before, this is my absolute third. favorite thing to do. I think it's an amazing way to pick up something new, learn a new edge, a new setup, um, and just okay, no, you know good. come out of this with um, basically nice having improved really as a trader. So I'm really looking forward to this year and all the stellar presentations. I learn something new every single time. And I'm sure this year will be no different. Yeah, uh, getting a little bit into rain. our lineup. We're super excited this year for all the presenters. Here's a quick preview of some of them. We'll be speaking this weekend as well as next weekend. And as I mentioned, we've got four days of stellar presentations planned from market wizards, fund managers, trade psychology experts, and U.S. investing champions. And we couldn't be more excited to hear everybody speak. And uh, I think in total, we've got over 25 speakers and it's going to be an awesome weekend this weekend, June 3 and 4, mm -hmm. as well as next weekend, we come back June 10th and 11th. So you Talk don't want to miss it. Make sure you subscribe down case. below. Uh, that you'll, that way you'll be notified uh, when we do go live. Now, we do ask that you please share this conference with your friends, fellow traders wow. on Twitter. Uh, there'll be a link popping up in the live below. chat, as well as it's down below in the description. Mm -hmm. That allows you to basically share uh, the conference in one single click. Uh, please go ahead and do that. Uh, it's great that we can keep this free and we want to reach as many traders as possible uh, to get the biggest amount of impact. And I think everybody uh, will learn something new. I think this over here before. very quickly. Um, yeah. Now, before we it's go any further, here. I do just want to, you know, say a quick thing about um, William O'Neill and, and kind of have a quick moment reserved for him. Uh, we'll be kind of dedicating this conference to him and kind of uh, his legacy um, if you're not familiar with William O'Neill, he's the founder of Investors Business Daily, uh, William O'Neill and Company, and uh, yeah, was a fantastic trader, human, and did a lot to um, advance the knowledge base for um, all traders out there. Uh, he's the author of How to Make Money in Stocks, which if you haven't read, highly recommend checking out, um, and watch it be giving away a few this weekend and next. Um, so he recently passed away just a few days ago, um, and... Um, I personally wasn't able to learn directly from him. I really wish I could have attended uh, one of his uh, seminars and conferences, uh, but hopefully he would have, you know, really supported what we're trying to do here. And I've learned a whole lot from uh, Ross Haber, who is one of his PMs. Um, I've learned a lot through uh, him, Mike Webster, Charles Harris, Mark Minervini, uh, David Ryan, and Justin Nielsen, who presented last year. And uh, he's really had a huge impact on my trading indirectly and has had a lot of an impact um, directly to a ton of traders. So I uh, just want to remember him a little bit and uh, definitely go ahead and read his book if you haven't yet. Um, and uh, with that, we'll go ahead and move on. Uh, the day one schedule, here's the list of presenters and topics. Um, starting things off, we'll have Jared Tendler, who's a trading psychology uh, mental game coach, really interested in his presentation process over PL. Uh, next, we'll have Eve Bobak uh, trading the IPO advance phase. Um, as well as a few other tidbits here. Uh, then we'll have Matt Petralia after lunch, environmental awareness, when to be aggressive versus when to play defense. Then we'll have a little bit of a fireside chat with Denise Scholl, Evan Marks, and John Burns from the Rethink Group. Uh, definitely a very interesting conversation. And finally, we've got Jason Shapiro, contrarian trading and risk management, bringing his unique perspective. So a really stellar lineup today and really looking forward to getting into it. Uh, moving on, uh, I know I'll get asked this question, will it be recorded? Uh, yes, it will. Um, and you'll actually be able to watch the recording pretty much live. You can actually scroll back in time and watch me give this presentation once again if you'd like to. Uh, but basically, the recording will be available at the same URL link that you're watching it at right now. So go ahead and come back to it whenever you wish. Uh, scroll back in time, watch another presentation over again, and I'll be adding timestamps as soon as I can. Uh, to make it easier uh, to find uh, the spots that you want to rewatch, So definitely will be recorded. And if anybody asks in chat, please go ahead and let them know. Um, I won't always be able to, you know, be paying attention and answering their questions. 
um, a little bit on how to get the most out of this experience. Uh, first, I'll go ahead and once again say, uh, please subscribe to the Trayline channel. Um, that will allow you to be notified when we go live, as well as post other uh, content and educational material. Um, also, go ahead and take notes. We've had some fantastic notes shared on Twitter in previous years. I think Charlie uh, posted some great ones, so we definitely encourage that um, and sharing the knowledge that you gain here today. Um, as I mentioned, give back. There'll be one other way, which I'll mention just in a bit, uh, that you can give back after watching um, and attending this conference. Uh, then definitely go ahead and engage in the chat with others and with the speakers. There'll be a few that will be asking questions. Uh, definitely uh, drop any feedback and thoughts and, and comments and questions in the chat, and I'll try to um, kind of relay that to every speaker uh, so we can get that relationship going. Uh, then please go ahead and share key takeaways on Twitter. We'd love to hear what you guys have to say and what you guys really took away from each of the presentations. And finally, definitely go ahead and re-watch your favorite presentations uh, because it will be recorded. Uh, moving on, uh, I do want to mention that this is brought to you by TraderLine. Uh, we're super happy to be able to bring this to you for free. And uh, yeah, basically uh, put on this event. Uh, we will be giving away a free ultimate trading guide and email course, which is accessible using the link down below in the description, as well as popping up in the live chat right now. Uh, this is 100 plus pages of educational material, uh, edges, setups, examples, entry tactics, routines. It's kind of got it all. Uh, definitely go ahead and check it out. I highly recommend clicking the link down below, uh, giving us your email and downloading it. Uh, we'll send it to you right away. And along with that, there'll be a free email course that kind of re-emphasizes uh, the key points that we share in the guide. So definitely recommend this resource. And once again, uh, the link is in the chat right now, as well as down below in the description. Uh, in, in addition to that, um, if you're interested in further education, I highly recommend checking out our TraderLine masterclasses uh, that we've put on with some stellar traders and educators. Uh, Stan Weinstein on the left, Eve Bobak, as well as uh, the rest of the IPO lifecycle trade folks. Um, a fantastic um, masterclass earlier this year. Uh, Jared Tendler, who will be speaking in just a minute, covering trade psychology. And finally, Oliver Kell doing an excellent, excellent swing trade masterclass that taught me an immense amount and really sped up my learning curve. So definitely go ahead and check out all these masterclasses. The links are down below in the description. And with that, uh, I do also want to mention uh, one other way that you can give back through this conference, and that is by considering a donation to St. Jude's. Uh, we raised, I believe, over $12,000 last year, which is fantastic, and hopefully we overshoot that this year. Um, and the way you can donate is by using the link below the chat right now, and even $5 is great. Um, please give what you can, um, and if you find any value in the conference, the presentations, which I'm sure you will, uh, please go ahead and consider a donation. Uh, that would be fantastic. It's an amazing cause uh, that I'm sure everybody can get behind so definitely an awesome way to give back if you do enjoy this conference and find it valuable. Uh, lastly, once again, I do want to uh, please ask that you subscribe to the channel. Uh, we'll have a ton of other educational material posted later this year. Um, continued interviews, which are my favorite thing to do on the Trailline podcast. Tutorials, free webinars, key clips. Uh, we've got it all. So definitely go ahead and click the subscribe button down below. It's completely free and click that notification uh, bell. And with that, uh, that's my spiel to kick off the conference. Once again, thank you so much for being here. Really excited to get going uh, with the first speaker, Jared. And uh, yeah, just sit back, enjoy, take notes. And thank you guys so much for joining us. And I'll be right back with Jared to kick things off of the 2020 uh, Trader Line Trading Conference. So see you guys in just a minute.
All right, welcome back, everybody. It's great to have you guys here at the 2023 Trailer Line Conference. Uh, we're kicking things off with a bang here, starting with Jared Tendler, the author of The Mental Game of Trading uh, and the lead educator in the Trading Psychology Masterclass. Uh, Jared, thanks so much for being here. And uh, yeah, it's always great to chat with you. And I always learn something new. So thanks so much for being a part of this. Yeah, thanks, Richard. And thanks for having me. I'm, I'm happy to be leading the conference off here, batting in, a, in first first position here. So um, I do want to encourage everybody, you know, please donate to the St. Jude's uh, Foundation. It's a phenomenal charity. Uh, and I love the fact that you guys are uh, kind of organizing this conference around that. So um, I've donated already. So please, uh, everybody else do the same. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, we posted a link to the survey that's part of your presentation earlier on in the chat. I'll post that again in just a minute, but please go ahead and fill that out. Uh, that will help us get going. Uh, but with that, Jared, I think I'll hand it over to you and uh, I'll go ahead and paste that in chat once again. And uh, as we get going, please go ahead and leave a like down below on the stream. It helps us get reach a wider audience and go ahead and subscribe if you haven't yet. Uh, and with that, Jared, uh, the floor is all yours. Awesome. Thanks, Richard. Uh, yes, as Richard just mentioned, uh, the survey link is in the chat. Please fill it out because actually we're going to use it today uh, as we get a little deeper into a topic that is really important for all of you. Uh, you know, when we look at trading, there's no way around it. I don't want this headline to confuse anything, right? Results are what matters most in trading. Right? You trade to make money. Uh, as some of my seven figure traders might say, they they also trade not just for the utility of money, but this that, that money is the scoreboard and they love to win. Like any competitor, that's what drives them. So, but either way, right, results drive you. But if you allow results to define you day to day, a whole host of problems get created. FOMO, revenge trading, greed, loss of confidence, risk aversion, hesitation, cutting trades, whether it's uh, you know entering trades too frequently. There's violating rules to have one more trade, you know, violating your daily loss. There's there's a host of mistakes, emotional problems, and chaos that happen intraday, day over day when results dominate your focus and really start to dictate your execution, your decision-making, and ultimately your performance. Now, the ideal mixture is an intense drive towards those results combined with an intense drive to perform in the short term. Because you know that ultimately your results are dictated by all of the decisions that you make, the execution uh, that you are uh, gearing yourself towards every day. So it's both, it's not one or the other, it is both. And while on the surface, that may not seem like a novel idea for most of you, <laughs> okay? But if you're like many of the traders that I work with, you know that's how you should approach trading. And yet what happens, right? The market opens and then suddenly things change. You're in the SIM, you get into the live market, suddenly things change. You've had you know decades of experience and yet still, in the live market, your emotional uh, your emotions can get hijacked, and that plan goes right out the window, and results start to dominate. So intellectually, you understand, you know that that's the right mentality and approach you should you should take. But how do you actually get yourself to adhere to your strategy, to your rules, in the face of a drawdown, uh, in the face of you know winning for several days, weeks, even uh, months, when the, the, the outsized focus starts to kind of pull you in that direction. How do you, how are you able to do that? Uh, you know, how about when you've taken like a couple decent trades, you know, made some money, but then you look on Twitter where you thought you look in your, in your trading group or with your friends and see other people that have made, you know, even more on the same trade, right? It's, it will spark a little FOMO in you, it will spark a little revenge in you. And then that process starts to go out the window. So okay, there's a kind of an infinite number of situations where it can be hard for this to occur. Now, the question is, why is that? Okay. And I think the primary reason is that as human beings, we need feedback to perform. We also need feedback to learn, but just on a day-to-day -day performance basis, right, we need feedback. And the problem is, of course, that results are an unreliable source of feedback to tell you how you are performing. So let's look at this just from a, a 
bit of an analogy here. Now, golf's my sport. You can see my, my bag in the background. I played, you know, at a high level in college and continue to do so. But if you take any professional golfer, right, they are highly tuned instruments, highly, you know, uh, you know, high level traders are the same thing. You're, you're highly tuned instruments. And if you remove a primary source of feedback for a golfer, it would be right. They can't see where the golf ball goes. So they hit it out into the, out into the, the, the course and they, they, they never get to know where it went. You do it once in a while. It's fine. Actually, there's a, an amazing story of Tiger Woods when he was a kid. It was getting dark. His dad said, all right, it's time for us to go. And, and, you know, he's, he basically said, Tiger, like, if you can hit it and find it pretty much in the dark, then we can keep playing. And I think he ended up playing like nine holes. So, I mean, here you are in the, in the dark hitting a golf ball and being able to know where it goes. But if you do it long enough, right. And especially for professionals, you take away that source of knowing, right. They, they hit the ball and they, they know, I mean, you've seen maybe videos online where, you know, they can tell you like within a few yards, how far the ball actually went. When you remove all that source of feedback over time, what's going to happen is they're going to naturally start to make unconscious adjustments. They could be hitting it perfectly, but the not knowing, removing that feedback starts to really undercut that sense of calibration in their mind. And those are top level pros. Now, trading is the exact same thing. If we remove sources of feedback in the short term, you start to operate in, in a, a, the sort of unknowns, the unknowns magnify. There's already enough unknowns in trading. They magnify and make it even harder for you to maintain that mental and emotional stability necessary to continue to uh, execute at a level that you, you aspire towards. So, but what you need is reliable feedback, okay? And 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 that is what we want, is reliable feedback day-to-day -day so you can be far more focused on your execution and less focused on results intraday, okay? Results maintain dominant focus long-term, short-term, it's intraday, okay? And so what I'm going to give you today is a system that is actually going to help you to get the type of proper feedback that you need. And let's just talk about some of the benefits of this um, out of the gate, because I'm going to jump very quickly into giving you a very practical tool to use immediately, something that we're actually going to ideally work on today so that you that come Monday, right, you can put it into action. Hey, those that don't know my work, right, I've, I've been working as a coach for over 18 years. I've written three books, including The Mental Game of Trading, and I've worked with uh, traders, including institutional traders uh, for the last 10 years. And I've also worked with golfers not shockingly, poker players. I work with sports betting uh, clients as well. So I've worked with a lot of uh, range of professionals and this tool has been essential for all of them, okay? And it's something that is not complicated to do, but it is really practical. And that is, you know, a big part of what my, my work is designed to be. Right? We wanna take these ideas, like be more process focused and turn it into something that you can use practically day to day, okay? And here are some of the benefits. Number one, it actually will train you to focus less on money results in P&L. This isn't just about the idea of it. We want it to be internalized like a skill, like many of the skills you have as a trader. It uh, tracks your non-monetary performance. Okay, let's create a game here, right? You want to you want to be competitive? Cool. Let's be competitive with your own execution and do so in a way that is more pragmatic than you've, you've approached before, okay? Develops emotional stability through the ups and downs in your results, okay? That is essential. If you do not have a process that you can reliably get feedback on, then your emotions are gonna be tied to results and you're gonna ride the roller coaster of the P&L, you know, intraday and, and, you know, day over day, week over week. And that doesn't lead itself towards the kind of, long-term growth, both in your own skill set as a trader and ultimately your account that you ultimately are after. Organizes weaknesses in your game so that you know what you're battling. Okay, Every single day you show up to trade, you have your own demon. You have your own weak points. And the best traders in the world, they have them. No, nobody is perfect here. If you don't know what they are, then you're operating in a, a bit of a deficit out of the gate because they will show up. And if you're not prepared to deal with them, uh, they are going to bite in the ass. Okay? So having those weaknesses a bit more organized gives you some, some measure of, of practicality out of the gate here. Provides clarity on your day-to-day -day capacity. So many traders come in with blinders, right? They, they want to be at their best. They expect themselves to be at their best, but they're not necessarily always pragmatic on those days where you actually are a little off. 
Okay? And we can actually use this system to, well, I don't want to say quite go as far as like create real probabilistic reasoning, but like you can start to kind of create some estimates in terms of the probability that you're going to perform your best versus the probability actually might be quite weak and performing poorly. And then it defines your peak performance, giving you a clear target to aim for. Okay. So I'm, I'm literally going to jump right into this uh, this this uh, task here, but I want to pull up this survey real quick and see how many people have uh, responded. And let's just kind of see what's in the room here uh, before we uh, launch into this. So here yeah. is... And I'll paste it go one more time. All right, thanks, Richard. So we've got 28 people. I know there's many, many more in here, but this just gives you an idea. So are there times when you're overly overly focused on results, money, or P&L, and it costs you? So obviously the vast majority of you agree with that. Can you accurately define the levels of your performance, A game, B game, C game? So a lot of you know that it's costing you, right? What is like 90%? And that's probably par for the course, I think, for a lot of, a lot of traders, as is this, right? So the vast majority of you uh, uh, cannot or are unsure that you can, which effectively means you, you, you can't. Uh, is there a big gap between your best and your worst? Now, this is really important as we get kind of later on in the presentation. Uh, in terms of how you're going to solve this. And I know there were a couple other questions, uh, which will be really helpful as we begin to kind of, uh, in a way, almost like kind of crowdsource this tool in a sense, right? It sometimes can be hard to have that kind of self-awareness, the, the recognition for yourself of what your A game, your B game, and your C game looks like. So the questions in that survey help to do that. If you can fill it out, it'll give your fellow traders and maybe yourself some additional ideas as to uh, what, um, what you may be struggling with or how to define your range. All right. So here it is. Okay. Uh, this is what's called an A to C game analysis. And you can see very clearly, right? There are categories for C game, B game, and A game, right? And you'll see a lot of criteria, right? Do not worry about looking at this. We're going to go through it very, very clearly. I just want to give you the overview first. Okay. So we're looking at it from a mental standpoint and also a tactical standpoint. And okay? now as I've continued to work with this tool, uh, there have been some refinements. So even uh, further refinement from the trading masterclass that we did uh, with Trader Line, this is a, an essential tool, but here is a, a, a way of creating an A to C game analysis that'll make it easier for you to actually work through practically. So let's look at this, uh, each line uh, together here. Okay, number one, we're looking at uh, focus. Let's get this out of the way. Uh, so, each dimension as we look downward, okay, uh, should have like a different kind of criteria to it, a different factor that would make up your mental game. Okay, so this is an example that came from a client. Okay, so here we are looking mentally. If you look first at your C game, so what does focus look like at a C game level? Mind looking at price action, unfocused, uninvolved, sloppy, missing, not entering many setups. Okay, now B game. So B game would be average, right? Not awful, not great following chart price action, but not in top mental form, missing some setups. A game actively focused and entering trades with clear sense of setup direction, tape speed, okay? FOMO, so FOMO, if we look at A game, seeing setup early to prepare, uh, to be prepared to enter, right? And this for that, tr that trader lessens FOMO for them. But as we look at B game, there's FOMO less, uh, but entering setups with incomplete information, right? C game, now, now actually, actually FOMO is kind of uh, fully problematic. Okay. Now we look at the next next column here. Uh, fear. So in C game, scared to enter. There's some trauma, right? The scar tissue that many of you have from prior losses or maybe even blown accounts, you know, can lead to you know that kind of paralysis around your entries. B game, there is some fear or anxiety surfacing, but able to kind of work with them, recognize them, and deal with them. And that often is a, a great way of kind of characterizing B game. There is this um battleground, right? C game is not active because you're not making those those severe mistakes. A game is clearly not present because there is actually uh, some fear uh, and anxiety there. All right. And then in A game, there's calm, calmness, but kind of engaged and settled. Okay. Uh, execution fear. So now there's some anxiety after entering trades, getting out too soon, taking unnecessary losses and cutting profits too short. Right. B game is anxious after entering trades, but able to deal with some of those early exit issues, uh, but not all. Of them. So some mistakes, some progress. Right. And then in a game, there's no extra thoughts when I place a trade and let it play out according to a plan. P and L focus. 
right? Obviously in C game, there's lots of focus on PL. In A game, not even worried about, it, just consumed with following my strategy. Distractions. So now this is sort of outside of trading distractions for this client, right? So in C game, it's distracted by non trading impulses. So I think it was a bit of uh, extra Twitter time for this client. Right? The, the, that line between knowing what could actually be helpful to making some market based decisions versus you know, clearly now just wasting time and energy. Uh, B game would be limiting non-trading activities to as little as possible. All right, you get the you get the general idea. So what we're looking for is clear delineation, all right, kind of down the levels, right? You've got, you know, so additional factors we could be looking at, right? Fear is not a big one for you. It could be revenge trading, uh, it could be greed, it could be lacking confidence or overconfidence, it could be some some discipline things. You could also talk about uh, differences in in uh, just sort of physical state, right? Sometimes there's this like kind of jitteriness, which can be present in A game. Not a bad thing, right? C game could be like disengaged and kind of bored and lazy. Okay, but we, what we want is some delineation kind of working downwards and then a clear delineation between A game, B game, and C game. And you do more than these three categories, of course, but you have to do at least two. We, we, we need that B game because B game becomes uh, the battleground and I'll get into that more later. Uh, all right, so let's just look at the tactical side of things. Now, there's a lot more variety here than is relevant, you know, for this conversation. So don't take this as like, this is how you should do it for yourself. Uh, but but more specifically, right, the tactical stuff includes anything that wouldn't be in my category, right? I am not a professional trader. It's like, wasn't it? I'm not a professional poker player. I'm not a professional golfer, right? And 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 my expertise here is in helping you all, right, and them, to unlock their potential. So all of this stuff should almost not make sense to me. I mean, I know enough about it, right? I've been involved in the markets for 30 plus years, but not as a, as a highly trained uh, trader like all of you. Okay, so from a risk management standpoint, right? What's C game? Sizing too large, breaking my daily loss limit. B game, doubt my risk management rules, justify taking more risk, just this one trade, and then I'll follow my rules. Right? Nobody's ever made that mistake here. Uh, a game, follow my tested risk management models, able to set and forget. Kind of a nice little line there. All right, decision making. What changes? So, questions you can be asking yourself like, what changes in your decision making process? Okay, let's look at A game first, right? Able to integrate these factors and cross asset analysis into my decision making. Okay, B game, there starts to become a little confusion where everything doesn't kind of line up. Right, C game is kind of overwhelmed by that. Execution, okay, C game, not entering setups quick enough and having to pass. B game, entering entries and exits are close, but still need to be cleaned up and process tightened. Of course, A game, you know, it's going to be rock solid. Exits, get panicked out of positions. I know I should cut, but I crave the gain or I hold, but fear the loss. Okay, B game, cut failing trades early, but conflicted by the possible gains and loss more than I should. And of course, A game is just like kind of holding till invalidation or obviously target. Right, Wes? Um, okay, criteria. You can kind of see here what's uh, just in those three levels, um, as does with the correlation for this trader. Okay, so I want to now begin helping you all to create this. Like I said, I want on Monday. I want to have. I want you to have a draft that you can begin to deploy. Okay, again, fill out that survey. Let's get some more answers in here. Uh, and uh, and see how you all think. But the first the first step here is just to brainstorm, okay? And the brainstorming can take the form of just like ripping out a, a blank sheet of paper um, and just starting start answering some questions, okay? So here are some questions uh, to get you thinking, okay? What are your biggest mistakes? Just list them all out. What minor mistakes do you make? What is your focus and energy like when you're performing at your best? versus when you're performing at your worst and your average, right? Sometimes it's easy to look at these from an extreme, you know, like, what does it look like when I'm at my, you know, when I'm, I'm, I'm trading great and then, you know, the extreme opposite. And then we start to converge on begin. What emotions are present when performing at your worst? And then can you actually define some of the early signs of them? What is peak average and poor execution look like? How does your perception of the market change as your performance degrades? 
What indicators, criteria, or factors are used when you make great trades and absent when you make average or poor trades? All right, so let's look at the answers here that just have come in through the survey monkey and see where, uh, if there are some specific ideas that maybe will be helpful for all of you to. All right, we've gotten some. All right, so energy and performing your best. I, uh, all right, so this is this following rules of bang stop loss is feeling in the zone, right? That wouldn't be described as focus. So one of the, one of the biggest um, issues that clients have as they're beginning to do this is right. It's it becomes uh, difficult to kind of delineate between kind of mental and technical. At the beginning, the brainstorm, we don't care, okay? But as you begin to kind of break things apart, we want things like this, right? Following rules would be technical a game, right? Technical a game. Uh, you know, feeling in the zone, right, would be the mental side of it. Um, able to feel flow of the market, not anxious about losing or giving back profits, right? So the lack of anxiety, the feeling of flow. There's high levels of energy and focus, alert, energized, ready to capitalize. Uh, feel price action pattern, cool insight, right? Again, that would be kind of more on the technical side. Um, best as a focus on execution. Uh, way more patience and able to execute on the fly. Okay, so we got some general ideas there. All right, now let's describe the emotions present when performing your first negative, FOMO, panic, rules go out the window, regret, fear, fearful to make a mistake, some calmness, mental distractions, mind drifts off, frustration, YOLO and FOMO, despair, uh, nerves, faster heart rate, right? So you get the idea here, right? Changes in your perception of the market as your performance declines. So it's perception of the market, Sometimes you'd also do changes your perception in uh, your own positions, right? If you're a swing trader or you hold positions longer than, you know, three to five minutes, right? Sometimes as that time goes on, right, your your emotions can start to manipulate your perception, but that that they, they tend to happen in, in consistent patterns. So if you understand the way that your mind gets perceptually misguided about your positions, you know, then you can track it, put it in the A to C game, and it starts to give you that kind of feedback, uh, right? So uh, lack of confidence, feeling of betrayal. There you go. Market's out to get me. That's a good one. Uh, mental focus reduces. Yeah, that's again, that's kind of more of the mental and emotional side. Uh, let's see. Recognition that I was wrong, which may or may not be real. Uh, feeling of missed opportunities magnifies. Chasing trades, thinking of P&L. Start thinking about missing out. Yep. Right. More aggression. Uh, quicker changes in thoughts, more erratic and denser with emotions and haste, right? One of the one of the big things that can, can happen, right? Your mind actually does shrink. When your emotions rise, it does start to shut off the, the amount of conscious thinking that you can utilize. And when that happens, right, you can create a little panic. Your mind can get kind of dense and cluttered, or it can start to actually shut down and you're only thinking about, you know, you're, you're thinking about fewer things than you would normally. All right. So you get the general idea here, right? And so I, as we continue to go along, I would strongly suggest that you've got this piece of paper open. I'm actually gonna give you a link in a second to uh, download a worksheet from my website, but you can see the construct's not that complicated, right? I wanna give you one other uh, way of looking at uh, categorizing your A, A game, B game, and C game, just to give you another form of sort of feedback here to better understand how to create that delineation, because that is the large, the biggest challenge that, that, that clients have. So when we think about C game, um, just bucket any obvious mistake that you uh, make would be in that category, right? The obvious mistakes uh, can be different, sorry, are different for everybody. And it doesn't matter if you're a trader with 20 years of experience. If you make a mistake that is in this category, right? It's gonna be far more marginal relative to, to a newer trader, but relative to you, it is an obvious blunder, right? That is C game. Now we go to the other side and go to A game, right? A game we define as learning mistakes. As I like to describe, you know, an infant learning to walk or a toddler learning to walk. When they fall, we don't call that a mistake. It's just a part of the learning process. When you hit the outer edge of your capacity, if you are making mistakes at that time, they are inevitable. They have to be made, right? A lot of times on the other side, the, 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 the hindsight bias will make it feel like an A-game mistake, especially for the perfectionists and the people with high expectations out there. These learning mistakes will sometimes feel like they could have been avoided, but we look closer and that wasn't actually possible. B-game would be kind of the marginal mistakes. You kind of know better, and if you were in a better headspace, you would uh, perform better. 
Okay, and just for additional clarity here, C game obvious mistakes are always caused by a mental or emotional flaw that has caused your energy or your emotions to either be too intense or too low. Right? The too low is the laziness, the boredom, the burnout, you know, kind of the classic discipline problems. Emotions being too high would be the greed, the fear, the FOMO, the anger, the revenge, loss of confidence or overconfidence. Okay. If you make an obvious mistake, there's nothing for you to learn technically, right? For a mistake to be that obvious, you already know very, very well why it was a mistake, which means that it wasn't something in your knowledge base about trading. It was something mental or emotional that was the cause. Okay? And this is where a bulk of my coaching, right? Bulk of what the trading psychology masterclass and the mental game of trading is about correcting your C game mistakes. Okay. Now, as we get into the B game, B game is kind of this intersection. It's a blend of both, right? There's clearly something weak technically, but it's not that weak. And it's also, uh, you know, there's a little bit of emotion going on or there's a lack of emotion or there's a little loss of focus or just something's a little bit off mentally. And then the learning mistakes are purely technical. There's, you're in a, and I, in a, an ideal mental state. So any mistakes that you make at that time are unavoidable. Okay. And, and so it's sort of a purely technical thing to do. Right. So, uh, here we are kind of moving down the steps to complete your A to C game analysis. So you've done the brainstorming. Now it's time to actually create a draft using the details you found. Now you can go to my website, jaredtendler.com backslash worksheets right now and download a copy of this for yourself. Or as you can see, it's not that complicated. Just take a piece of paper, draw two lines and one line, and you've got mental game tactical and you can start actually drafting it. Okay. Now in the early stages here, this might be what your draft looks like. And I'm not going to go through the technical side. I'm just going to go through the mental side. Right. Okay. Right. We, we compare it to the, the very detailed examples that were provided before, right? This is relatively basic. It's still correct. And it's a great start. Okay. I think a lot of people, when they utilize tools like this, they feel like it kind of has to be perfect out of the gate. And the answer is no, right? For it to be perfect, you need a, a good amount of time and effort and energy devoted toward it. Now, now I'm not saying do it, doing it all at once is even going to give you that, that outcome we want. It's more of the consistency of looking at it day over day over day that allows you to train your vision. Okay, we go back to the survey, right? Many of you were unsure whether you could delineate between A game, B game, C game. Unsure if there was a big gap between your A game and your C game. Well, this is your opportunity to actually train it. And it's not that complicated. It just takes consistent focus. Okay. So you can see the examples here. And, you know, this is the first attempt. Totally fine. Right. And it becomes your starting point. Then what you're going to do, okay, is you're going to take notes during the trading day or at the end of the trading day. You, on my website, there's a tool I use called a, a data collection worksheet. Okay? You can use that to help you here. Okay? Just to make it clear what that is, what you're looking for are to write down the thoughts that emerge when you're in the thoughts that emerge when you're in your B game or your C game. Right? We already talked about the emotions. What specific changes in your focus, changes in your decision making, right? All the things that I've kind of outlined already are part of that data collection worksheet. Again, it just gives you an opportunity, gives you a way of very clearly kind of organizing your work so that over time you can kind of pull together these puzzle pieces, right? If we look at this as being kind of like a puzzle, right? Here you are trying to uh, complete a puzzle. And for many of you, you don't even know what the box looks like. There's no picture on the box. So here you are kind of grabbing these puzzle pieces and you don't really know where they fit yet. And that's fine, okay? But the data collection worksheet or just keeping like a, a, a tally of these kind of individual moments throughout the day where it could be right after you've entered, could be right after, right before you've entered or, um, uh, you know, around your targets. If you're in a trade for, you know, a few hours and market changes and you can feel your emotions rising, like there's lots of instances when you can be kind of getting a snapshot of uh, your mental and emotional state, uh, your changes in your, in your uh, decision-making. Uh, so kind of keeping that kind of clear is, is, is really key because over time we want this thing to evolve. So eventually you can create a, a final version of it. 
Okay, and that obviously is the last piece here. So when we look a little bit more uh, closely at uh, these system benefits, okay, and I want to reinforce this again, right? Trains you to focus less on money results and P&L, and helps you to track your non-monetary performance. Okay, well let's let's look at how to actually do that. So here you have now constructed your A to C game analysis. This thing, this tool, you can actually keep up and open in front of you during the day or print it out and put it on the side. And it will give you real time feedback so you can monitor your performance throughout the day. So let's say, uh, you know, two trades have been invalidated and, and you've lost your normal position. OK, you feel a little revenge start to get to, to kind of creep up in your mind and the thoughts that are are consistent with that, which is there are no thoughts. You just immediately start to look for uh, another position, right? And that would be described in your B game, right? Immediately looking for another position, right? Rather than, uh, you know, kind of analyzing a trade as you normally would. You can see that, right? You recognize that that data point has crept up. You recognize that your mind has degraded and it gives you a, a clear indication that you your, your performance has dropped. And if you take a trade at that level, it is by definition going to be worse. It has to be. So you can monitor your performance and of course you can grade your daily performance. Some of my clients will grade their sort of mental and emotional performance with every trade, right? It's easy to kind of grade a trade on its own, right? But you can also be grading kind of your mental performance too. And you could do that in an Excel file. Uh, you could do that just kind of in your trade journal. Uh, okay. And then um, attaching your emotions more to your performance and less on your uh, your daily results or even your individual results, right? And what that means is you are actively pushing yourself to care more about your mental and emotional state and the state with which you are entering trades and making decisions than you are on the actual results themselves. And yes, there's going to be some noise in the interim. It's going to want to push you to deviate and to break your rules and to go into the bad behavior that typically happens when your focus on results tends to dominate intraday. But that fight is the battleground that, that, that has to be won. This tool can help. And if it's if it doesn't help entirely, right, that's why this is just one piece of my entire system. But right, it, that, that's the battleground. right? And, and so in the short term, it might mean that you make decisions when uh, your performance is degrading and you can't actually stop it, that you stop trading at that point and see what you can do to recover. Um, I say commit to a time frame or a sample size because maybe more so for, for the newer traders that are out there, you know, kind of less than three years, uh, this retraining can be more dramatic. When I worked with more experienced traders, this tool is often very easy for them to complete. Um, at least a, like a solid draft, they'll, they'll kind of refine it over, you know, seven to 10 days or so. Uh, but their ability to kind of intuitively and instinctively uh, understand the utility of it and have it change their emotional state is very often quite uh, immediate. It's not true for, for all of them. But where, where the biggest kind of challenge is with the newer traders, because they are also lacking a lot of um, inherent knowledge about the nature of trading. You've just seen less, you've experienced less, and trading is very different from a lot of life and the types of feedback that you get um, on, on, a, on a normal basis. So when you commit to, let's say, a week where the only thing you care about is your execution and really pushing yourself to adhere to, you know, being in your A game and uh, grading yourself based on the quality of uh, your mental and emotional state or your execution and less on the results, right? Good or bad, right? Good or bad results that that it, it just helps to make it a little bit easier so sometimes the time frame is like a week uh it could be 10 trades right just pick something that you can really commit to and just see how it how it works i mean very often these these tools um don't get implemented because and i don't mean just this i mean any tool because if it doesn't work right away you kind of will disregard it well this is not going to work right away this is not going to instantly change uh, your mental and emotional state you need to train your mind. Like I can't give you muscles by, you know, giving you a bunch of workouts to do right now. You actually have to do the work consistently over a period of time. So giving yourself a little bit of, of, of leeway uh, in, in that time frame 
uh, to kind of train yourself is, is, a, is a key. Uh, and sometimes it also means scaling down. So you look at this as like a bit of an incubation to develop a skill in the live market. Right? This is not something that's going to develop that sophisticatedly uh, in the sim. Uh, develops emotional uh, stability through the ups and downs in your results. So I've already kind of talked about this, um, where that stability comes from, um, you know, but you can now start to imagine how impactful this can be, right? So here you've, let's say, made 10K today and, you know, your emotions normally would have spiked, but you realize that you actually stayed in the trade way too long, right? You know, your rules said you should make six and you made 10 you should start to feel a little bit worse about that because the execution means that that mistake is going to get, you know, hammered in the future. So you care more about the failure in execution than do than you do about the 4K that you, know, you just kind of happen upon. And then the flip side is true too, right? You lost four trades in a row. You can feel yourself starting to get a little frustrated by that. We're starting to feel a little loss of confidence in that. But you look at those four trades and you're like, I would have done nothing different. I'm not saying we're going out for drinks and celebrating. Yes, I've lost. But you do get to feel a little bit better about yourself, right? And, and this is a, a really, really essential for the newer traders out there who will very quickly start to system hop, right? And you're going to start to look for something to work. Well, if you're making really good trades, the more that you're going to come up with is not spontaneous. It needs to be more thoughtful, right? So, yeah, sometimes, you know, it's easy for, for newer traders to abandon a, a strategy that's actually really working, but their emotions convince them that it's not because their execution is uh, being hidden from their, from their eyes. Uh, organizes weaknesses in your game so you know what you're battling up against, right? Here it is. Here are your weaknesses. C game and B game. Bam. Battle. Develop a strategy. And, and push yourself to improve on those, right? And the reality is, right, you will be faced with these every single day until you've proven that they're gone. And then you graduate to the next set of weaknesses or mistakes. You're not ready for them. They will show up. Provides clarity on your day-to-day -day capacity. Here it is, right, in a nutshell, A, B, and C. This is your capacity, right? You you can, yes, occasionally supersede that A game, right? You find kind of like a, an intuitive move, right? You're less than a year or two into trading. Intuition, don't trust. But for those that are more experienced, right? Intuition starts to guide you farther or, you know, you see a new opportunity uh, in, in the moment spontaneously. Sure, that, that obviously can happen when you're in the zone and really operating at, a, at your peak. But by and large, what you see here is your potential day to day. And what happens is that most traders come in with blinders on, like, no, 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 B and C game are an option today, right? They're not thinking that consciously, but you go in with the hopes and the aspirations and the optimism. Ah, today's a new day. Let's go. Let's get at it. Is it really that new? You've heard the, the, the phrase, right? You can take the kid out of the city, but you can't take the city out of the kid. Well, that's here, right? You, you can take yourself out of that mentality that you had the, the days before, right? You were in, in a bad state, you know, bad trading. Well, you know, go out and have some, you know, go out with some friends, have some drinks, whatever you reset in the way, whatever way you do, I'm not suggesting advocating for them. I'm just saying that it's very common. You come in with a fresh attitude, fresh mentality. Guess what? You ain't different. Your, your mentality at that time is different. So maybe, maybe at the beginning, A game has a probabilistic uh, tendency to exist or, you know, higher probability of existing at the beginning. But if those first two trades get, uh, get taken out, C game and B game are going to come roaring back. And that optimism was really just blind. This is pragmatism. This is you preparing for battle, right? Maybe SEALs. They don't, they don't visualize glory. They visualize the 40 ways they can die. And that's what you need to do as traders. You need to have a clear visual. And this is what the, you have it. <laughs> that's what this tool gives you. Okay. 
defines your peak performance, giving you a clear target to aim for. There it is. Okay. And so what can you do? You can now start to isolate the factors that produce your A game more often. Okay? Develop a routine, taking into consideration those factors to help to encourage your A game more. So we can reduce the odds and the probability that B and C game will, will occur. And of course, then increase the odds that A game will happen. Okay. So I've got a few more points here. I realize we're getting a little short on time and I want to leave some, some space for some questions. Um, but I want to just give you a little bit of an eye towards the future. Okay. So we've got this tool that I hope many of you have begun to brainstorm. And then we'll kind of take into next week. Okay? It is very practical. Just kind of keep at it. It doesn't have to be something, you know, I'm giving you kind of the parameters for how you can do it, but like we want to go to the minimum. At the end of the day, spend one minute and look at it and reflect on the day and try to come up with more data points, right? Just do something daily. And over time, you will surprise yourself by how much you actually know about your game. When it's defined, it makes everything a lot easier, okay? But now what we've done so far has been like the snapshot. Here you are now. Well, what, what does improvement really look like? Uh, now, I will say that what I'm about to show you is a little odd, okay? But like many things in nature, they oftentimes reflect internal processes of ourselves that can really be helpful. And so this little guy is uh, our, our help here, okay? And this is called an inchworm. And if you just observe how it moves and then look at a bell curve and then observe how it moves, Right. What do you see? You see that an inchworm is a moving bell curve. Okay. And the bell curve, as it reflects the A to C game analysis, is very clear. Over a large enough sample, right? A game is going to happen infrequently, in part because over time your A game should actually improve and become your B game. But also in part because regression to the mean, right? It's hard to be your best all the time. Even the best traders in the world, right? We've all had our moments. But it's, it takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of preparation, a lot of diligence, especially because you're not like professional athletes where, you know, football players or, you know, American football players play one game a week, right? Football, you know, soccer players play a couple of games a week, golfers play four. It's like the, 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 the amount of time that they're competing is much less. And even then, it's still hard to be at their best at all. You are trading sometimes. 40 plus hours a week. You want to be in your A game 40 plus hours a week, you got to do a ton of work. So bottom line is right, B game is what's going to happen most of the time. Okay. So here we've got this moving inchworm. Well, how do, how do we get you to progress over time? Well, how you get to progress over time is by moving your C game forward. Okay. You have to eliminate all the things that are in that category. If I scroll back down here, right, here's your C game. You gotta, you gotta develop a system and a strategy to eliminate those. Okay, that's because is really kind of dedicated towards. Yes, also in getting your A game to happen more often. But if if we don't eliminate C game, right, then that gap between A game and C game gets wider, and and your performance gets even more unstable. So we need to eliminate C game so that inchworm can continue to move forward, right? And so that's what your progress really looks like over time. Okay, we eliminate C game, and then what happens? Then your current B game becomes your C game, and your current A game becomes your B game, and you get to create a new A game. One of the best things about this process, especially for those traders who might get a little bit pulled in many directions, or you're not, you're trying to develop a strategy system that you can work, or you're having to adapt and adjust to changing market conditions. I know this has been a tough market for many of you. If you eliminate your own weaknesses, you've organically cleaned out a lot of crap. And, and when your mind is freed up to not have to defend against this, all of a sudden you're going to start to see new opportunities. You're going to see things about your own strategy, about the market that you couldn't see before because it was too consumed right, by having to defend against this or even deal with this. So the organic development of your own strategy right, really de-risks the potential for you to get distracted uh, by another shiny object that is another system or a strategy that 
seemingly works better, but may not work best for you because your fingerprint is unique and you need to develop it. We don't want you to, to become the copy pasting of somebody else that, that rarely works. Of course, we can learn from other great traders. Like that. that's what you, you all are, are all everyone here has done. Nobody has innovated entirely. We've we've all, including myself, learned from others. That's the nature of the world. Okay. Well, before I run out of time. Um, okay. Interim concept. Other key things. Sucking less is the key at times. Uh, sucking less at key times is essential for long-term success. Meaning, if you've got your A to C game analysis and you're trending towards C game, if you can suck less, if you can avoid C game just a little bit, okay? Uh, traders in a combine, right? You've got 30% left in your account with two days to go. And you say, F it, you fire it all in. Or unfortunately, traders with a live account, you know, who have lost 30% of their account say, F it, let's throw the remaining 70 into five trades and position ties goes out the window because you're willing to just blow it up to get it back really quickly. Okay, those moments of desperation would be extreme. But the point is, regardless of whatever is you are seeking, if you allow it to occur, then you miss an opportunity to actually train and harden B game. So the sucking less is not, let's jump to A, which is what a lot of you attempt to do. You try to go from C game to A game, try to recapture it all. And effectively you're like gambling. It's like, this is, this is mental game gambling. Here are apples to apples. All right. I want all of you to think for a second, how does your C game today compare with your C game from a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, go far back. It should be head and shoulders above where it was. And if it wasn't, that means that you're not working on your mental game the right way. Okay. But even from like a day over day, week over week scenario, it's very easy to get caught up, right? Thinking that no progress has occurred, right? So three weeks ago, market was really, really tough, you know, for your strategy gets a little bit easier today. Well, we don't really compare that, right? If you're in your A game more often on those kind of easier times than you were, uh, you know, three weeks ago, doesn't mean that you made a lot of progress. It just means that the circumstances are not making not making this challenging. So then you're going to have to be prepared for C game again, you know. And the opposite is true too. Just because you may be in a slump now doesn't mean you've lost, you know, the good trading, the good execution that you had before. It just means that it's hidden under a little bit of a cloud. Uh, and then lastly, uh, you can't always be at your best. Okay? And you can't always be at your best because range is reality. And ideally, your best is continually actually getting better. But the way to do that is not by pushing from that front end. The way to do that is actually eliminate C game. And then your A game naturally advances higher. All right. So you could in the chat. What was your biggest takeaway? Was it a new method of analyzing performance, right? That A to C game analysis? Was it maybe realizing new details of your own performance? Maybe you've had some, some insight into that already just from this conversation. Was it this three categories of mistakes where you've got obvious mistakes, the marginal mistakes, or the learning mistakes? Or was it this inchworm concept that describes how your whole range moves forward over time? Post in the chat. Here's what, uh, what you all think. Uh, and as I said before uh, earlier, uh, you can download uh, not only just a, a free worksheet for the ADC game analysis or the data collection worksheet, but I've got many other uh, worksheets that you can download. Um, and if you want further resources, um, especially around correcting your C game, right? The trading psychology masterclass that I did with TraderLine, um, it really brings to life the mental game of trading, goes in a ton of examples and a ton of details uh, utilizing my system for trading psychology. Um, and it's been getting a ton of great feedback, um, as has uh, the mental game of trading, uh, which you know really uh, goes into a great detail around certain aspects that the masterclass doesn't. So the two of them, uh, I think, work very well together. All right, so I want to thank all of you for listening today, uh, and and for Trader Lion for having me. I certainly wish all of you very well in your uh, your future trading pursuits, and uh, hopefully the A to C game analysis and this. A process for getting you to be more process focused and less results focused uh, feels as pragmatic and 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 more tangible 
uh, and doable and not just kind of wishful and hopeful. Perfect. Well, Jared, thank you so much for the excellent presentation. I hope everybody was taking a lot of notes. Uh, the replay will be available. I think you can actually just scroll back on the stream and watch it again if you'd like to uh, later today. Uh, but Jared, thank you so much for taking the time to put that together. Um, I saw a lot of uh, inchworm concepts as the biggest takeaway, um, documenting emotions uh, as, as, a, as a key takeaway, a lot of great ideas here. Um, as I ask a few intro questions, uh, please drop any questions you have for Jared in the live stream chat. I want every single person who's watching right now to drop one question. I know you have at least one, so go ahead and do it. And we'll do a Q&A here uh, and get going and dive even deeper uh, into this system. So first things uh, first, Jared, I think it might be uh, great to talk on, uh, touch on um, what, what are some common difficulties that you see working with your clients uh, when they are developing their A to C game analysis, when they're first, first putting it together? Uh, what are some common you know, issues people run into and, and maybe some ways to avoid that, uh, knowing that going forward? Yeah, probably the biggest one is, is you know, I think kind of feeling overwhelmed, right? And, and not being able to kind of categorize it, which is why it's helpful to kind of do it on a day-to-day -day basis where, you know, you're kind of gathering up those puzzle pieces and just putting that on, on, on the table in a sense, like looking at them and beginning to try to make sense of it and to know that it's okay to be overwhelmed. You know, I think so many people want things to just like kind of neatly fit into place, but like if you dump a thousand piece puzzle on, in front of you, some people feel overwhelmed by that. I, I, I personally feel very challenged by it, right? But if you feel overwhelmed, that's a good thing because the the alternative is I think worse where you are operating at a, at a, at a deficit and don't have enough information. Uh, the other one is a feeling like I, I have like a very distinct A game and a very distinct C game, but the B game is is kind of absent. And, and again, that's kind of okay uh, at the outset. You do have a B game. Nobody is as quite kind of polarized like that, or, or I shouldn't say most, most traders are not. Uh, and so what we look for is more of that kind of intersection. Like where are the times where you're kind of battling for that progress um, and try to define what that looks like? Um, it could just be sort of the the standard times. Like for you, uh, B game might be you're not in a position and you're just slightly bored and maybe miss like uh, the ideal entry. Okay. Not awful, right? It's just a slight deviation. Um, so again, I think you kind of look at those kind of two um, polarities, right? A game and C game, and then look for either something that's slightly less bad or is slightly bad, slightly worse, uh, depending on the direction you're going. Yeah, perfect. Uh, and I want to highlight a, a comment that just popped in the chat from Chris. Uh, I had never thought of reducing my C game as a way of improving, and that changed the way I thought about improving. And I think I think that's a perfect, almost key takeaway from today is just work on that C game and you know pushing that inchworm forward, which is a favorite concept of mine uh, from your book and both masterclass. Um, <clears throat> I think that's a perfect way to think about improving, just sucking less, and to to you know use an analogy more with trading, just improving your average loss and, and minimizing that just a little bit can have dramatic effects over the long term on your P&L. So just, in, just sucking a little bit less can make a big difference. And that's that's why it's so, so important. I, I love this framework. And I, I saw somebody also in the chat said, uh, the worm looks pretty cute. So that's always a bonus <laughs> as well. Uh, perfect. Let's get into some more questions here. Uh, I saw a good one here. Let's see. A uh, question from FFTY. Uh, many concepts still sound kind of abstract and feel like jumping from a, one item to another when going through the analysis. Is there any way to organize them in a less subjective way and I guess get more into the details of what people are feeling and going through in the moment? Yeah, I think like the subjectivity comes as you get more proof. So like the reliability of any trading system is not something that happens on a single data point. It's something that happens the more and more you look at it. So for example, you know, a client might have a thought, uh, you know, or like a reaction to FOMO, right? You see a position just sort of uh, beginning to take off. All of your criteria hasn't been met. You'll have a thought around that that says, oh, like I, I have to get in now. And so, yes, I, I, as a single data point, that's subjective. But when you see that pattern happen again and again and again, it starts to actually become objective. This is an object. If you don't have that thought in that kind of way, with that kind of velocity, with any, you know, uh, maybe an added heart rate or uh, a feeling of, of, of like uh, desperation or urgency, 
then, uh, sorry, if you don't have that at other times, right, it becomes a reliable, uh, concrete, practical, objective measure of, of your performance, right? And that would be, let's say, a B game tendency. And so then C game and A game, right, the reliability comes the more you look at it. So it's fine if it feels subjective right now, but in one month, it, it shouldn't be if you've done the work. Uh, I, I will say one other thing too, uh, once you create the A to C game analysis, it really shouldn't change, you know, very much day to day, right? You kind of need like at least a month, maybe even longer of time before you're going to update it again, because it, it it should be an objective measure. Right? The problem is a lot of people have this sort of subjective sense, like, ah, the trading day ends. How did I do today? Ah, I give myself an A, made money, had a lot of good trades. There's no, there's no objectivity to it. So that's what this process is really trying to do is take away some of those uh, extraneous data points that are really kind of irrelevant to getting that good grade and, and find the ones that really are objectively confirming I am in my A game because of X, Y, and Z. Ah, uh, no, now I'm in my, in my C game because I see X, Y, and Z. Yeah, perfect. And taking a step back, uh, just because your material might be new for, for some people watching, um, and this is kind of a callback to last year's presentation, uh, could you touch on uh, why it's important to, you know, keep track of your emotions and and take that uh, as as data, as you as you've said before, versus trying to be robotics robotics suppress them, uh, as you know a lot of common trade psychology books might say. You know, ignore the emotions, push them to the side, follow your rules, be be a strict disciplinarian. Can you kind of touch on that a little bit? And uh, if people want more info on that, Jared did a full presentation on that last year, but uh, just to touch on that for anybody who's new. Yeah. So, so the first thing is that, that, you know, you're trying to kind of map a pattern, right? A pattern of, of emotion that would occur. So whether it be fear or anger, confidence, so that you can see it in real time, uh, you can't correct or stop a problem that you can't see. And when we're, when we deal with like mental and emotional stuff and trying to actually improve that C game, move that C game forward, emotions are not really the problem. Right. The negative thoughts are not really the problem. The problem is the underlying flaws, biases, wishes, illusions, hopes that are kind of forcing your hand, so to speak. You know, we would never consider uh, pain to be the problem. Right. So you're walking down the street, you feel pain in your foot. Pain is not the problem. Right? The problem is, let's say in this example, there's a rock in your shoe or no, actually, I've kind of jacked up my Achilles and. You know, it's like the, so there there's the problem right but so emotions and those negative thoughts are are signals of those underlying flaws biases etc so it, 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 we go we kind of go to war we go we, we are we're working very hard to correct those problems because when you do that it helps to unlock that back end rather than providing a lot of tools to kind of manage and control it because what will end up happening is if you use a lot of good theory around emotions which as you alluded to, right? A lot of the training psychology books do this inadvertently. There's a, a ton of great material. I'm not criticizing at all. But if it if it's not used to actually resolve or correct those weak weaknesses, what you end up doing is kind of paralyzing your C game, right? You're trying to kind of numb it, right? Like, all right, I'm going to get a cortisone injection in my ankle to stop the pain. Cool, pain's gone, but your Achilles is still jacked and you can't fully perform well. So You've kind of paralyzed your C game so it doesn't happen as often, but you've also now chopped off the ability to actually progress your A game as much. And that's one of the biggest problems that I see with a lot of people that are actively trying to manage and control their emotions versus identify them, dissect them, and correct them. Then that back end can move forward and you create the potential for even uh, greater performance, which is what the, the inchworm highlights. Yeah, and, and just to add on, um... I think somebody mentioned it in the survey that uh, one of the signs that they were trading well was having a great feel for the market. Those emotions are kind of part of that feel, right? And that kind of builds into that intuition. Um, yeah, where, where does kind of intuition fit on, on this A to, C, a to C game analysis? Yeah, a great point as well, right? So that's further evidence of why emotions inherently aren't the problem, right? In this case, it's a signal, right? So intuition, if it does come with emotion, the emotions are sort of signaling opportunity. So intuition is is firmly kind of in A game or even like in A plus game. Some some clients, you know, will create a new category of like the zone if they can kind of firmly define it. Most, most traders can't 
distinguish the zone from their A game. Um, they feel like they're in the zone when there's a lot of activity in the market. <laughs> they're not actually in the zone, sort of this faux zone. Anyway, um, intuition is is like kind of firmly at the very, very peak of your own performance. And it, it only shows up when you are in an optimal mental state. Uh, and it's not coming out of the ether, right? You have to have a lot of knowledge and experience in order to be able to access intuition, which is why I said earlier very quickly, if you were a newer trader, you can't generate reliable intuition because you don't have enough knowledge to go on. Uh, on my website, and I know on, on, on yours as well, right, there's access to um, a free ebook on intuition uh, that you can download um, both from my website and from uh, the Trading Psychology Masterclass uh, homepage as well. Yeah, perfect. Um, and there's a really good question from Annette. Uh, what is the plan when we know you're at your C game? Uh, how do you know when to re-engage in the markets? So if you don't have a plan now, the strategy needs to be just take a break and, and give yourself a chance to kind of regain some semblance of a mentality because otherwise you're just going to be kind of paralyzed at. But the that's the short answer. The long answer is you've got to develop a, a real robust strategy, understanding like what are the things that are causing your seeking, right? Is it, you know, you are, are kind of bored and distracted. Is it fear or anger? And that's really where, you know, the mental game of trading and the trading psychology masterclass comes in to be able to help you to build that robust strategy. Because I, I mean, you can tell me you have FOMO and then I could tell you, oh, well, look, when that's happening, just take a couple of deep breaths, calm yourself and relax and, and just stay out of those trades. But what happens, right? You create like a pressure cooker effect, right? I could say, you know, don't succumb to revenge trading, right? When you've lost two trades in a row, take a break and don't let it bother you. But it does. Like, again, you can't ignore the pain in your foot when you when you actually have, you know, just going to continue to walk with a rock in your shoe, right? And so, so many of us are just like looking for these easy bite-sized answers to complicated problems. And I'm not saying that as a criticism. I'm saying that as like, we need to wake up as a society, right? This is not a trading specific problem. Most people in performance, right? Most people in like look for easy answers to more complicated problems, more complicated psychological problems. And so to make things more complicated doesn't mean they're insurmountable or, uh, you know, it's going to take you years to do, right? That, that's what I've done with the book and with the masterclass. It's like really make it very systematic and easy to begin kind of unpacking the causality, right? Rather than just kind of band-aiding and patchworking these, these problems. We want real solutions. So, Right. Your C game's freed up. Your mind is freed up. Intuition can start to be generated. You can, you know, create more in, uh, organic development in your game. Like there's so many benefits when you actually can can remove those problems. Right. Imagine how much freer you feel when you remove the rock from your shoe. Yeah. And you can use your emotions and what you feel as an edge almost to, to, to even gain a get another advantage. Um, yeah. Uh, I believe uh, Tanya, there's a good question from Tanya. She must either have read your book or, or taken the masterclass. Uh, at what point would you decide uh, to, or should you decide to walk away from the screens versus just injecting logic? Uh -huh. Yeah. So injecting logic for those that don't know is kind of my, uh, one of the, one of the, the tactics that we use to kind of inject the correction to those core problems. Right. Uh, it, it's, it's a bit of a, um, a judgment call on your part. So the idea is, if you uh, are unable, like if, if injecting logic is not going to work in the moment, then you staying in front of the screens is gambling, right? Then you're kind of just hoping that you're going to get lucky. Um, and so when you've gone through the mapping process, you're defining kind of where that line is. You, you know in advance when your ability to recover is, is very uh, low in probability, right? You're, and so we want to take kind of high probability scenarios here. So uh, on a scale of one to 10, right, uh, you're dealing with, well, let's say, you know, anger. Uh, if you get to level three, I can still inject logic. I can still kind of battle. But if I get to level four, you know, it, it's it's like kind of hit or miss. Like sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. So then, you know, no, it's got to be at level three. You stop, uh, take a break, inject logic, and then you know, maybe do some writing to try to get more of that emotion out and, and allow you to actually recover. Um, you know, I think the, the, the walking away, like where that line is should come from, um, evidence, 
you've developed a strategy, you've tested that strategy, and you kind of find where those lines are. And if you want to, if you don't have that yet, right, then then you can make a choice, make a judgment call, right? I'm going to invest this actual capital in finding out. And I'm going to give myself more leeway and, and find kind of where it is that I can uh, stop myself uh, with injecting logic. Or you can say, no, you know, <laughs> I like my money. I'm going to play cautious here and, uh, you know, err on the side of like doing it prematurely to kind of build up a strategy. Sometimes I'd say when, when issues are more severe, that is just a smarter way of going about it because it's kind of like physical therapy, right? Go back to the Achilles heel, uh, the Achilles problem, right? I don't want, uh, we don't want to push you too far to kind of risk re-injury. We want to like progressively get you doing, you know, more weight bearing exercises, you know, actually taking on more weight, right? There's a progression that you'll go through in physical therapy. And so mentally, emotionally, it's the same kind of thing, right? The, the, the more intense your emotion emotions are, it's almost like you're, you're carrying more weight, which means, right. It's going to be harder for you. And the risk of re-injury is higher. So, you know, the cautiousness we say here is at the first sign of trouble, right? Inject logic. And then at the second sign of trouble, you take a break. Something like that. Yeah, excellent. And uh, I saw a comment uh, in the chat that uh, this concept of A to C game analysis still feels a little abstract. Um, and you touched on, you know, exercises that you should do, you know, this weekend to map out your A to C game. Uh, do you have any tips for, you know, writing that down, filling out that worksheet? I really like how you broke it down into those six different categories, looking at focus, discipline, all that stuff. Uh, yeah, any tips for, you know, taking the, taking this presentation, the knowledge, and applying it to their trading, you know, this weekend and, and uh, you know, over the next few weeks and months? Yeah, I would say just now start going back into your trade journal, your the past trades that you've taken over the last week, um, you know, or uh, like, let's say up to three months. I think if you go, you go kind of farther than three months, the odds that you are getting kind of accurate data starts to go really go down. Um, so, you know, the, the practicality is st like the still may not come because your memory not be, may not be great. And if that's the case, right, then the subjectivity is going to remain high at the beginning. But the, the data points I've described are already there. It, it's just a question of like, how are you going to find it? How are you going to find these puzzle pieces? Um, and, and if you're still struggling in a subjective way here, I think there's an expectation on your part that you should have objectivity prematurely. You can't have it yet, right? If again, there, there's enough in this presentation. If you don't have objectivity yet, then you're just expecting something that can't happen. But yeah, like I said, the, the, um, uh, you know, just like the reflection on the last week or the last two weeks, uh, you could do that. You could, um, uh, I mean, the, in the the example that I provide uh, on the website, there is a sample, so you could you know use that. Just kind of uh, looking for other ways in which traders experience you know a game, b game, and c game, and use that as a point of reflection for yourself. I mean, and again, that's what we do in the master classes. Like, there's just tons of examples in there. Um, but you know, the uh, you could also, I guess, technically look outside of trading. Um, you know, if you find examples in your own personal life like you know what is it like when you're when you're at your worst maybe just start there and if you can kind of define your worst then everything that's not that is either b game or a game and then over time you can start to more clearly define it but again i think having some um you know i want to say patience in this process but just kind of some understanding that it, it does take time to develop if this is brand new you're you're like incubating an entirely new skill set. So it's okay to be that toddler that's kind of bumbling around and falling down a little bit. The, the, the value and the utility of this tool is high enough that it's worth going through that process and just kind of struggling for a little bit um, and, and just stay in it. You're, you're guaranteed to learn more. It's just, it, just, it just doesn't happen if you keep paying attention. Yeah, perfect. I, I like that um, thought of, you know, looking elsewhere in your life to try to identify the A to, C, A to C game there. You know, soccer is a big part of my life. And, you know, it's clear to me when I'm on and off, you know, your passes are going right where they should be. Or if you're off, you know, your positioning's wrong. You can't play a pass to save your life, all that. So, uh, yeah, I think that I think that's definitely helpful. Um, there's a question uh, about um, what about non-professional traders um, working with uh 
people who are serious about this but trade on the side is there any difference there or how how, how should they kind of apply this process it's just going to take a lot longer um you know i think if you're non-professional and you're trading on the side right, you just have fewer data points um so you can, but you can still kind of retro use all the advice I've given still applies to you. The question is like, how robust will your, your kind of initial draft be? Mm -hmm. it, it may not be that robust, which is fine, right? It's, that's still your starting point. And then over time, just pay really close attention when you turn it on. Now, the trouble is like, do you have the time right, if this is on the side? I think it's a worthwhile kind of carving out of just a couple minutes, right? Either the beginning of the day, end of the day. Uh, you know, soon after you've entered a trade, just before you entered a trade, just to just ask yourself, like, all right, how do I feel right now? Feel pretty good. Cool. Okay. Well, what does that what does that mean? It means, you know, I'm calm, clear headed. I'm thinking deeply. Right? No, actually, I feel pretty off. Like, well, what does that mean? Like, my thoughts are actually quite muddled. I, I can't even make sense of what I'm even trying to think. Well, okay, we'll write that down. And 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 you know, just that 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 like those those points of reflection start to just add up as you are taking those notes down and then you can start to line it up and saying, oh, okay, well, that's an example of BB. Right? And then you have the reliability that proves it over time. Uh, but that time might be six months, you know, but generally speaking, right. When we look at the value of this, it should start to occur as soon as you begin doing it. Right. Because now all of a sudden you are caring more about these data points that are by definition, not, monetary or PL based results. So you're already beginning to train a, this, this mentality just by focusing on it, not having to uh, actually have the A to C analysis completed before you can begin uh, your process orientation training. It's just, it begins just from doing it. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, Jared, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you to everybody watching for your questions and, and comments in the chat. Uh, Jared, any last, uh, you know, words that you'd like to leave everybody with, you know, uh, thoughts on improving your mental game, uh, you know, further resources to look into? Yeah, I think in general, uh, the, the mental game is one of those things that kind of gets neglected because it's not as much fun, right? The fun part is like learning to trade. And, and you know, to me, the mental game is never more important than the technical side of trading. Um, it's, it's just a tool to help you to access it more. And I'm not the purveyor of you know, knowing all, like kind of all of the knowledge for uh, the mental game. There's a lot of good resources out there. If you're a newer trader, you have to read Trading in the Zone. Um, it is, it, it talks about lots of things that I do not and, and helps you to really orient to the nature of trading in a way that um, I think is essential to forming a foundation, both psychologically and technically. Uh, but there are lots of other good, uh, you know, trading psychology books out there um, and all of which data in there can kind of feed into my system, right. right? It's really the kind of the system for trading psychology that makes my work unique, but the inputs that you put into it to develop your own strategy for how you're going to solve the problems that you are facing, uh, that, that is really, um, you know, kind of most important, right? You've got to develop that strategy, how you do it, what gets put into it. I don't care, right? It's, it is whatever works, but you've got to use this system because it uh, relies upon the rules that we all play by. And if you don't know what those rules are, uh, you're at a disadvantage. So um, I yeah, thank everybody for their time today. Great, great questions. Great feedback here in the uh, the survey. And uh, yeah, just kind of keep at it and you'll you'll make progress. There's no way or, no other way to go. Excellent. Well, thanks again, Jared. Uh, thank you so much for, for your time and for the excellent presentation. Uh, if you guys are enjoying it, please go ahead and drop a like on the stream. Uh, you know, uh, also share it on Twitter if you can. Uh, thank you to everybody who's donated. I saw a bunch of donations come through. So thank you so much for that. Um, and we'll be right back in about 15 minutes with uh, Eve uh, to continue on with the presentation. So stick with us and uh, we'll be right back. Take care.
Hey there. Okay. Okay.
All right, sorry about that, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me now. Let me know in the chat if you can. Uh, we're gonna continue things with uh, another excellent presentation from Eve. I'm really looking forward to this one. Uh, she's one of the many authors of The Lifecycle Trade, a fantastic exploration of IPOs and super growth stocks. And she's also one of the excellent educators as a part of the IPO masterclass, which we completed earlier this year. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, if you're enjoying the stream, please go ahead and leave a like down below. Uh, and Eve, thank you so much for being a part of this, and I'm really looking forward to this. Thanks for having me, Richard. I'm very excited. I hear there's a, a big group and we're streaming live, so should be great. Uh, and everyone can participate later for Q&A as well. I'm very excited to be here. And depending, I guess, on where you are in the world, either good morning, I have my coffee, good afternoon, or good evening. I don't know. It might be in the middle of the night, right? For some people. So thanks so much for, for joining us today. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about trading the IPO advanced phase. Uh, as Richard mentioned, uh, we did a lot of research on IPOs and super growth stocks and how they behave. So I'll give you a little bit of background as well, just to bring everyone up to the same um, page in terms of the life cycle trade and what we're going to talk about in the different phases. So we'll do a little bit of a brief overview as well. And uh, really, I'm going to hone in on talking about 
the uh, early life cycle of an IPO when it first starts trading. But before we get started, a little bit of a disclaimer, please read this at your leisure. But basically the content today that I'm presenting is for just informational and educational purposes only. I think everyone understands that um, IPOs, super growth stocks, and the financial markets involve um, a huge amount of risk and it's very possible to lose uh, money. So really seek the advice from a professional, a financial professional prior to implementing any investment program or um, financial plan. Uh, I want to point out that, you know, if you wish to apply any of the concepts that I'm going to be talking about, um, of course, you're doing so at your own risk. I mean, they work for me, but they may not work for everyone for your particular situation. And um, also, I'm going to try to remember to mention if we talk about stocks um, that I have positions in, but keep in mind that some of the names that we're going to talk about today, uh, we may have uh, positions in currently. Okay. And please read through the disclaimer later at your leisure. So let's talk about uh, the agenda for today. I wanted to start out uh, today talking about uh, and honoring um, my mentor, Bill O'Neill, and sharing with you a few lessons that I've learned. Bill um, was an extraordinary person. Um, and a legendary trader. And I was very, very lucky to, to call him my mentor over the years. So um, I'm going to share with you some information there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the current market, just my view. And then, um, as I mentioned, a brief overview of the life cycle advantage, which is the edge that we feel that we gained with the research that we did on IPOs going back to the 80s. And I want to give a shout out to that team, uh, Kathy Donnelly, Eric Kroll, uh, and Kurt Dale um, worked with me on that. We worked as a team and we never would have been able to accomplish uh, what we did without that power of the team. And then I'm going to hone in, as I mentioned, on the early life cycle. Um, I trade uh, both phases, both the early phase of IPOs, as well as the more mature phase and mature stocks. But uh, today we're going to hone in on that fast moving <laughs> IPO advanced phase. I think um, the traders that have shorter time frames are going to, to enjoy this as well. I'm going to share some stats that we haven't shared yet, just some preliminary information about the IPO advance phase for IPOs over the last few years, and then talk about how I get positioned in an IPO during this fast moving phase, and talk about how I manage the expectations for the trade, as well as some of my favorite sell rules and uh, the risk management practices that I use, because these can be very volatile phases. So very important um, is solid risk management. And since we've recently turned, I mean, we've had a bear market for uh, a long time now, and we recently turned and, and have been rallying, there's a favorite screen that I have after a bear market. And uh, it really identifies like anecdotally over the years, I've been running it uh, at major market turns. And it tends to identify, you know, one, two, a couple of the new leaders um, of a rally. So I'm going to share with you the, re the recent results of that screen as well. Okay, and uh, let's jump right in. On the right here, I shared a picture with you. Um, this is a picture of a desk plaque that we made for Bill O'Neill uh, about nine years back. And it says, a master teacher's influence ripples through eternity. Thank you, Bill, for sharing your knowledge. And we shared that with him at a dinner uh, in Santa Monica uh, in, years ago and really just wanted to provide him with a gift that really talked about how much we value his sharing, his education, his knowledge with us, his experience. Um, it's just Phenomenal how he's impacted so many people's lives. I've heard a lot of testimonials, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot more um, coming out as well. Um, I'm going to try not to choke up here. I I wanted to um, 
mention that I also included at the top my favorite quotes from Bill. Um, and some of you may have heard me before talk about this, but the first quote, buy the best companies with great earnings coming out of bases. Um, that was when I first met Bill and I had his book and I was like brave and went up there and introduced myself and we started talking and I, I asked him, you know, could you give me advice for a new trader? And that's what he wrote. So um, what a great sentence that encompasses so much that's important in terms of trading um, growth stocks successfully. And another one of my favorites is your job is to find the next Apple and handle it well. Um, one of the things that Bill was phenomenal at is always finding the next best leader. Like whenever you talk to him and we were in a bull market, you knew that he would have um, the top leader. So some way he would always find a way into those leaders. And Bill was always so positive, encouraging others. Um, he always encouraged me. And, you know, he'd sign my, I always attended seminars like every year uh, and would have a chance to chat with Bill. And he would sign a lot of times my seminar books. You can do it. You know, no matter what the market conditions were, he was always uh, positive. So some of the lessons that I've learned from Bill over the years, just to never give up. I mean, I think everyone's experienced this uh, bear market lately, it can get very frustrating. And we're going to have more in the future. And so it's easy to sometimes get frustrated and feel like this is not for me, I want to give up. Bill would always um, be an optimist and say, you know, this will this will pass and we'll have great opportunities in the future. Bill also had a tremendous uh, work ethic. He worked very, very hard. You'll probably hear stories from people that worked very close with him. And, you know, he they would be talking on Sundays. He would be always studying the past historical leaders, studying his past trades, um, learning from all of that. So even as he became very, very successful, he never dropped that really strong work ethic. So that's one thing that I always try to keep in mind and um, always work hard. And I mentioned regarding the leader, I would go to the seminars every year, as I mentioned before, and uh, I would always ask Bill, you know, I'd be raising my hand, Bill, how do you know which stock that you have is the big leader so that you can handle it well and hold on to that one? Because I, you know, I would always try carefully to pick out the best stocks in the market, um, but it's hard to tell which one is going to be the big leader. So he did share with me a couple of things. Well, we all know, even when we look at all the fundamentals and the technicals, you know, some of the stocks are going to be big leaders in our portfolio. Others are not. Um, he, he really looked, focused on price movement. You know, once you have um, a, a good portfolio with a lot of strong stocks, which stock is the best performing so far from where you bought it? Or maybe like the second best, that pure price power is showing you that's a potential powerful leader. And the other thing that he shared with me is that he liked to actually define ahead of time for those leaders what type of a core position he would like to hold on to. Because he said, once you start selling um, a stock, let's say you're just trimming back, it's pulling back in the moment, you may like oversell and then suddenly you find yourself, you're totally out of that position. So he tried to set that up in advance. And finally, in terms of the charts and technical analysis versus fundamental analysis, um, Bill used both. I would say he was more of a fundamentalist. He liked to really know the company that he was buying. And one of the things that he stressed is we're using the technicals to time the buys and sells of an exceptional company. We're not just buying a chart. So really knowing the company that you're investing in. And finally, staying humble and giving back to others. I try to follow that. Um, Bill was always sharing his um, expertise and experience and knowledge so freely uh, with all of us. So um, I try to do the same. Okay, next let's talk about the, um, the current market. So what I'm sharing with you here is a weekly chart of the NASDAQ. And just what I like to do is just look at the current uh, trend and try to stay with the trend. 
So, you know, we've obviously had a severe uh, bear market in the NASDAQ. Um, for growth stocks, it started even earlier, back in like February of 2021. Um, the NASDAQ later in 2021, there was a significant, and it's been a long bear market, long and drawn out. But right now, we have rallied. So in October, the market tried to bottom. In December, it kind of tried to retest that area. And since around January 6th, there was a follow through on the NASDAQ. For those of you that follow the William O'Neill follow through system, you know, it's a strong price move on a larger volume than the day before. And that started a rally. And so far, that's intact. So um, you can see that, you know, there are a lot of mega cap technology names that have had very strong moves and are doing well. Also, technology as a sector is doing well. So um, in terms of feedback on the portfolio, when I'm buying new positions, they're starting to work. So all of that feedback is, you know, the market's in rally mode. Who knows how long it's going to last? Um, but so far, so good. It's looking, it's looking good. There's a leading um, sector as well. You know, artificial intelligence. We'll talk a little bit about that and the companies that may benefit from that. Um, so um, the one thing I have down here is a quote from our book. And uh, we'll look at the IPO ETF in a second. But very important, especially for um, early cycle names, uh, we want to only trade with the trend and not trade uh, risky, volatile IPO names uh, during a bear market. Um, and I'm sure many of you know how severely these names were hit uh, during this recent bear. So not fighting the trend, very, very important. Okay, this is the IPO Renaissance ETF. It's a weekly chart. I should mention all of the charts that I'm using are WANDA, a William O'Neill and Company charts. And I have, um, I don't think I included a legend, but the main lines here on the weekly that I'm using are the 40 week um, and the 10 weeks. So the 10 weeks in red and the 40 weeks in black. Okay, so uh, you can see that this particular IPO ETF, the Renaissance ETF, uh, corrected and significantly, and it's still 60% off its all-time highs. However, it has been participating in the rally year to date. It's up 24%. Uh, it rallied off the bottom. It's consolidating and it's trying uh, to move out of there. So that's something that I monitor along with, I don't have a chart of it, but I, I watch the uh, the Russell Growth um, ETF as well um, to see how that's performing. One thing I wanted to mention, these stats are pretty interesting. So if you think back, you know, 2021, that's when the bear market started. Well, that year we had a record number of IPOs and SPACs, over a thousand if you count them all up. And um, what's interesting is that that shows frothiness. And usually when you start setting records in terms of a high number of IPOs going public, that could signal a market top. And certainly it did in 2021. Now, if you think about the action since then, um, the number of IPOs going public has really significantly declined. So slow in 2022. And so far this year, if you look at just IPOs, like what Renaissance Capital reports um, on their website, there's like 44 IPOs that have gone public. So still slow. But what's interesting, when you look back at history, a low number of IPOs, typically you see that during bear markets. And um, then you still see that when the market turns, because there's a lag in terms of the rebound in IPO activity, because companies are concerned about going public during bad market conditions. So just something to keep an eye on. Let's see when that turns. But it's important to keep in mind that it does lag the market. Okay, this is a summary of um, the edge that we feel that we gained from studying all of the IPOs back from the 80s. And it's kind of like a nice acronym, LIVES, in terms of just catchy so that you can remember all of the aspects of it. And I'm going to share with you just very briefly the life cycle advantage. 
So first, it's the life cycle phases. Every IPO, nearly every IPO, goes through three distinct phases, and we're going to talk about those. We also discovered when we studied all of these charts, all of these IPOs, we discovered six different patterns. I'm not going to go through those in detail today. We cover all of this material in significant detail in the IPO masterclass that Richard mentioned that we did with the Trader Lion recently. So, um, and it's also uh, in our book. Volume is very important. So what we found is liquidity matters and it makes a difference in terms of the success of an IPO. And we're looking for quite a few IPOs can be disappointments. And I'll show you that pattern as well. Um, people don't like to talk about that, but it's true. So really we wanna be selective and we wanna look for the exceptional companies. We're looking for the disruptors the transformative companies with huge growth drivers for the future. And also, we found that there's different cell rules. We tested out the cell rules. Different cell rules work better in different phases. And we'll talk a little bit about um, which cell rules I like to apply during the fast IPO advance phase. Uh, but again, these are all covered in more detail in the materials that I mentioned. So what is the life cycle trade? It's really understanding where a stock is in its run from the IPO through to the mature stock. And it's using the appropriate rules, as I mentioned, the appropriate sell rules and risk management practices uh, for that particular phase, as well as the pattern. Okay, so what are the phases? Very quickly, you have the IPO advance phase. That's typically when the stock goes public, um, it has, you know, it may form a, a short base pretty quickly and move up for a short period of time. And uh, that's usually short lived and usually reverses. And we're going to go through quite a few examples today that I've put together for you so that we study how those uh, leaders behaved. And then there's an institutional due diligence space typically. This is where the stock is changing hands. If it's a high quality company that institutions wanna accumulate, you're gonna see a transition from shorter traders to institutional investors. And this will take time usually. We notice that um, it can take six months, 18 months, even longer. And this is a phase where this, like a watch phase, and uh, the stock is gonna go sideways to down for this period of time. And what we're watching for is like a first mature base and some accumulation to start coming into the name. Okay, and then the other phase, not every stock has this phase, but for high quality names, they're gonna have an institutional advance phase, we noticed in our research. And this is usually a longer phase where midterm to long-term sell rules could work better in this phase. And so it's, um, it's different in terms of which strategies a trader might want to um, apply here. So like if I'm trading a name that's coming out of a mature base, that's already gone through this institutional due diligence phase, I may have that in mind. This could be early. This is if it's a high quality company. So I may use different rules for that. And we found that in our research, those rules are more effective. Okay, so this is a line chart of Tesla. Just let, let's just go through this very quickly. So here you're, you're seeing that the IPO advance phase of Tesla. So it's pretty short lived. It forms a little um, IPO base and moves out, has a nice run. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of it, you know, that run is given back. That's typical. And then you have this long period of time where uh, the stock is going sideways to down. And that's the due diligence phase that I mentioned. You know, the institutions may be researching the name um, and then starting to nibble if it's a high quality name. Now, typically we'll see resistance at this previous high from the IPO advance phase. So if you see that here um, and take it all the way out, that's this dotted line. We call that the turbulence zone. And you can see when Tesla tried to come out, it did get some turbulence there. Okay, and then for those high quality names, they're gonna have an institutional advance phase typically. And for Tesla, it was obviously a very super powerful move, but that shows the institutional advance phase. 
And um, Tesla is a late bloomer. So that's this first pattern. And a late bloomer typically is a name that takes quite a while to get going in the institutional advance phase, but it does have usually a successful little IPO um, advance phase. Now, pump and dump is, um, I would say the iconic super growth stock example of that is uh, Facebook Meta, you know, where it met a lot of selling when it first went public. Um, and then finally went through the due diligence phase and had its institutional advance. Now, one hit wonders, if you look at the charts of recent growth names, uh, many of them look like this chart. So think of like an upside down B. And the reason for that is the severity of the bear market. So names that try to move, um, went through that huge IPO advance phase, some of them, successfully in like, let's say the 2020 time frame, have given back a lot of that move and then some. So you'll see a lot of those patterns. These patterns at the bottom that we discovered, rocket ship and stair stepper, those are rare patterns. Um, if you think of rocket ship, maybe upstarts initial move um, and uh, back in the late 90s, eBay, those are some of the examples. Stair steppers, very, very rare. This just stair steps along, doesn't really have an institutional due diligence phase. It just kind of starts right away and goes into an institutional advance phase. And a good example of that historically is uh, Google or Alphabet. Now, disappointments, unfortunately, a lot of names fall into this category. And then you just stop hearing about them, right? So a lot of um, IPOs are not successful. So that's why we want to be selective and look for those exceptional companies. Okay. All right, well, let's dive into the early phase trading um, for the IPO advanced phase. And I shared with you on this slide what I look for for the IPO base. Okay, so you could take a second to read through that. So I'm looking, the characteristics that I'm looking for, I'm looking for a base to start forming pretty quickly because that's going to be signaling demand to me. Like so if it can form a short base and then move out pretty quickly for that IPO advance phase, um, people are not really interested in selling the name. So I'm looking for that. Typically the IPO base I'm looking for, it can be pretty short. It can be two weeks or longer. And some, some of the patterns that I like to trade are the U-shaped bases, and I'm going to show you a few examples, um, what, what we've dubbed the hook pattern. And then sometimes they just form short consolidations or possibly even like high tight flags, um, and uh, I, I would trade those as well. I'm looking for strong revenue growth and liquidity. Those are so important because um, the, the stock has to have enough liquidity for me to be able to get in and out of the name. And uh, also, I'm um, being selective. I'm looking for, I'm trying to look for the next leaders. Okay. In terms of technical analysis, I'm going to take note of any tight action. Um, that is rare with an IPO. So when I see it, um, I'm thinking accumulation. And similarly, I'm going to be looking for the price closes to be strong. Um, while the stock may be volatile intraday from a technical perspective, I'm going to focus more on how it closes. And I'm going to pay attention when I'm trading this phase, I'm going to pay more attention to daily charts, just a faster time frame. And the moving averages that I'm going to be using are typically the 21-day EMA, if it's there already. And if it's not present, then the 10-day simple moving average. While a shallow correction is ideal, it's rare, right? Because IPOs are more volatile. But if I see that, um, I, that's going to be a plus. And also, I'm going to consider the market environment. If we were in a bear and the IPO base was forming during a bear, then I'm going to give that more leeway because I'm going to expect a deeper consolidation. I'm going to be watching for liquidity to pick up as well as it tries to come out of the IPO base. And successive days closing up, uh, I would say Google is a perfect example of that. Alphabet back when it first came out, if you want to study that pattern, 
um, you can just see the accumulation on the right side as it tries to come out of its base. And one thing I look for on the technicals, and I look for this in any base, even on mature stocks, is I want to see a faster recovery than a decline. So let's say if the stock's correcting for a couple of weeks, then when it re starts to reverse and come up the right side, I want to see that left side price taken out very quickly, faster than the, right, the left side decline. Not, that's not always present, but when I see it, these are all positives. Okay, so the first example I have for trading the IPO advanced space is uh, Mobileye. Um, I'm not going to go through my trades in detail on any of these examples. Uh, I did go through a lot of detail in the IPO masterclass, but I, what I wanted to focus on today to show you is just how these IPO advanced phases behave. Now, I did trade this name. It's one of my most successful um, trades this year so far, and I, tr I am not currently in the stock. Okay, so I want to show you the hook patterns here. There's an early hook pattern here, and then there's a second hook pattern, okay? And typically, when I'm looking for this U-shaped pattern, it tends to coincide as well with the moving averages. So if you look here, um, the 21-day EMA, the 10-day EMA, those are other moving averages you can use to get positioned. So what I'm trying to do in this phase is I'm trying to get positioned near the turn early because these names are so volatile. Take a look at this. It's very easy to get stopped out. And um, I get stopped out regularly. So when I'm starting to get positioned, this is why I keep my stop losses very tight, tight risk management. When I'm trading these types of names, my expectation is that I may get stopped out once or twice before I get positioned. So that's normal. I wanted to point out here, just because this is still on the watch list, whenever I trade a name that um, was successful in the IPO advance phase, I keep it on a watch list and I'm watching it for later to see if it can come out, go through some type of consolidation, and then move out. So this was very interesting. This was that huge earnings gap, which was terrible, right? But look at the close. So that gets my attention, the fast positive reversal. Let's see what it can do now. I would say it's still in the IPO advanced phase, but I mean, it did have obviously this little aberration, but it had a, a nice strong positive close. So I'm watching it. We don't know what it's gonna do, but it's one for the watch list. Okay, here's another name that I wanted to show you in terms of the IPO advance phase. Very quick. One thing that you can see from all of these examples is they run up quickly and then they correct quickly. So another hook pattern, you know, a trader could use that to start to get positioned and use the moving averages and get a little bit of a lower cost basis to withstand these kind of pullbacks. While they just look like blips on the screen, these are, you know, some of these are pretty wide swings. So uh, that's why during this phase, I want to get positioned with a lower cost basis. And I'm not going to be, I'm going to try not to add to the position. I don't want to raise my cost basis. So you can see how quickly this move occurred, kind of like an island top, right? It never hit that um, price again during this phase, at least for now. And then it gave back the entire move. Again, typical. So that's why these faster rules uh, are more successful in this phase. And you can see all these examples. That's why I put these examples together for you today. Now, whenever uh, I trade an IPO advanced phase, or even if I don't, and I see that it had one and then kind of corrected and is starting to go down to sideways. Now, this is pretty severe, again, because of the uh, bear market. I'm going to be watching this and putting it on a watch list. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking for, you know, first, usually this length of time, I'm being patient. You know, usually it's six months, 18 months, maybe a little longer. And then I'm looking for a constructive first mature base to form. So uh, with a rally before that, 
And um, then you can see with on holdings, uh, it did stage a breakout here from that first mature base. So now I'm watching, I'm not in this name currently. Uh, I did trade it before. So now I'm watching to see what it does here. Is it gonna create another base? Um, no one knows, right? But it's on the watch list. Okay, Airbnb, very similar, trading this IPO advance phase if someone's trading them. Again, the hook pattern could be used here. Look at this volatility. That's why, you know, trying to buy regular breakouts during the IPO advance phase is very difficult. And the odds of being stopped out are even higher than, than um, some of these other entry points. Again, you can see, at least in my experiences anecdotally, okay, you can see that uh, it gives back the entire run and it's pretty fast. Um, negative reversals I'm pointing out, I watch for those. Um, when I'm trading this phase, I'm looking to sell a lot into strength and I'm using the shorter term moving averages. I don't know if I pointed those out. So this light green is a 10 day, the magenta is the 21 day EMA. Um, the red is 50. This wine colored, I I don't really use it that much. I, I put that on there, but that's the 50 e EMA if anyone is interested. Okay, and this gave back the entire uh, move. Again, so now uh, going through an institutional due diligence phase after this advance, if it ever gets up to this spot again, it would get some turbulence there. So I always mark that. And um, now it's you know attempting a first base. We'll see what it does. I included uh, lifetime holdings. Um, because it's now setting up a first mature base, even though this IPO advance phase, it was pretty thin. So this doesn't meet the criteria. Typically we're looking for, you know, 20 million at least average daily. But anyway, you can see that this had a short consolidation, moved out, same pattern, negative reversal, and then gives back uh, that entire quick move. But now um, I have this on a watch list. I'm familiar with the company. That's that's something that I always try to do. Um, I always try to get familiar with the company and experience it firsthand if I can. So I work out at Lifetime Fitness. Um, and so let's see. So you've got this institutional due diligence phase, and now it's attempting a first mature base. I mean, we'll see what happens. No one knows. Um, only the, you know, only in terms of the turbulence zone here is one area to keep a close eye on because if the stock can power through that and hold that level, it's going to be showing some strength. So we don't know what it's going to do yet, but just taking note of this first mature pace. It's a little on the thin side too. Okay, uh, the next example is Palantir. One thing that's unusual about Palantir that I wanted to mention is that it meets the qualifications uh, or met the qualifications for a rare jewel during its IPO advance phase. And we talk about that um, in, in our book in more detail, but basically it's a move that occurs uh, over 100% move within 90 days. And what that does is that puts the stock on a special watch list to watch the institutional due diligence phase. And the reason for that is that we found in our research that these stocks are more likely to increase and have a big, bigger move, but not all of them. So usually it points to maybe one or two leaders. Like if you think back and look back, I think Twilio was on that um, rare jewel way, way, way back when um, and some other names. So some of them will not work, but uh, it does create a good list for the watch list to keep an eye on to see if they can move out. Okay, so you could see here with Palantir, it created this small little base, which almost looks like some type of cup and handle, short little IPO base, um, and then had quite a run. I mean, it did have this negative reversal, so more than likely a trader would get taken out there, and then it does make another high before rolling over. And it's been going through a due diligence phase for some time now, right? More than two years, along with the market. And then it real, tries to rally off the bottom and has this little maybe double bottom kind of 
base that forms and it does break out from that. So I, I do currently uh, have a position in this name. It's on theme for artificial intelligence. And I just wanted to show you um, that uh, volume that came in on the daily and the weekly. A couple of things that catch my attention. Um, first, it's on theme, uh, which uh, is a strong theme, the artificial intelligence. And also it stages a very strong gap on earnings. So on May 9th, um, it had a powerful move over 23% and 562% gain in volume. So typically some institutions are starting to take notice when you see that kind of accumulation. And if you look at the weekly, this is the weekly chart, um, you can see the number of weeks. Of course, here it's extended now. And I'm not sure if you could see this on the weekly. If you look very closely here, there's a line where there are some tight pretty tight closes in there weekly. So that always catches my attention before this kind of um, final shakeout, before the breakout. Now, I included this name, you'll see later, it, it shows up on one of the screens. Um, it's, it's a thinner name, it's a recent IPO, um, it's in the solar industry, which some of the solar names have been doing um, well. The, but the reason I'm showing this chart is you can see how easy it is to get shaken out in this phase. So um, that needs to be the expectation going in. So if anyone was trying to buy here, you know, thinking this was some type of a buy point, you know, you're going to get sh shaken out at least a couple times um, trying to get positioned in a name like this. And even I'm going to show you some lines here from some resistant points. Um, the reason that I try to get a lower cost basis, let's say you're buying in here or here or here. These, as you start getting higher, it's it's easier and easier um, to get stopped out of these names because of the wide intraday swings. So this is just one that's on the watch list for liquidity to pick up because it shows up on um, one of my screens. So this, these are the new stats that I wanna share with you. Now, uh, uh, a lot of caveats. This is a very small sample size. I just looked at IPOs that are liquid IPOs um, back from 2020. Now, remember, our IPO research uh, goes way back to the 80s for the book. This is just something we started to look at to try to put like a time frame and percentage around some of these moves. And the reason I'm showing it today, even though it's very preliminary and a small sample size, is it kind of underscores what those all those examples I've been showing you say, that that IPO advance phase um, is pretty quick. So with those caveats, uh, what we found in IPOs that are liquid over the last few years is that the average number of days for that IPO advance is uh, 90 trading days. And because averages are a little misleading when you have a few names skewing, um, I just threw the median in here too. It's a median of 11 weeks. And uh, we also looked at the percentage gain. So um, this is from first trading day low to peak in the IPO advance phase. So uh, keep in mind that even the best trader would never get this type of movement. You know, maybe they'd catch a percentage of this. And the other thing to keep in mind is that a few big winners skew these numbers higher. So uh, we found the, the move to be 129% and then a median of 72%. But names like Upstart that had just amazing runs um, during the last bull market are skewing these numbers higher. So most of the names are a little bit lower than this. Okay, so just some preliminary data. So when I go into to trade an IPO advanced phase, I have certain expectations. First of all, when I'm trading mature stocks, you know, they're all watched closely, but they don't have to be watched quite as closely as these names. When I'm trading very volatile IPO advanced phases, I know I can't just put a trade on and kind of walk away and just set alerts. It's something that's going to be need to be monitored very, very carefully until there's a big buffer. And even then, um, they move so quickly, they just need to be monitored very, very closely. So that's my expectation going in. And that's why you'll see I don't trade too many of these at a time. It may just be one because they're so volatile and hard to manage, um, and the risk is higher. So two maximum, and that would have to be in a very, very strong, strong market for IPOs, a strong bull market. 
Um, as I mentioned before, my expectation going in is that I'm going to be shaken out a couple times trying to attempt this trade, though the positive returns could be very fast and um, very lucrative if I time it right. So uh, with strong risk management in a strong bull market and a liquid name that looks like it has a good story and strong revenue growth, um, I'm going to potentially try a position, even though I know going in that I'm probably going to get stopped out. So my stops are pretty tight going in. I'm going to keep in mind the average true range when I'm trying to enter a name. If it's too wide, I may just choose to pass on it because I want tight stops. Um, and if there is no logical tight stop on the name, it's so volatile, it has these huge swings all the time. I may just pass on that um, because the risk is just too high. I'm going to also keep in mind always the expiration, the lockup expiration date. So um, what I've noticed just in kind of watching it and trading some of these phases, um, it, you know, typically the lockup expires somewhere around six months in. Um, so it could put pressure on the shares. And I've noticed that it does either ahead of time or during, you know, as, as the lockup expires. Um, one thing to keep note though, if it doesn't, that's an interesting sign on the positive. If the shares don't have pressure at that pe time period, that is an interesting positive. So how do I manage risk? Uh, as I mentioned, I'm only going to trade one, maybe two max at a time in this phase and uh, keep average cost low. Uh, we dub the term boss or buy one since it's still, I try to do that always um, in this phase uh, as much as possible. In terms of risking capital, I mean, I have 1% here. That's a total maximum. Um, that's if I get caught in some kind of gap down, unexpected. I'm really gonna try to keep my risk per trade much lower than that. Um, typically in the 0.3 to 0.5% of capital. Um, and I'm going to be setting my stops in my mind um, with alerts in terms of for every new position, where am I going to stop out of this position? So that's before I enter the position. And as I mentioned, fast sell rules. I'm going to be using faster sell rules um, that we tested in the book. Um, also, as well as selling into strength during this phase to take profits when I have them. Okay, so um, on the left here, I'm showing a part of the graphic um, from our book, The Life Cycle Trade, and it shows you the Everest and Ascender rules kind of at a high level. Um, those were rules that we tested on super growth stocks. And um, we found that these are can be more effective during this faster phase. So again, when I'm trading this phase, I have profits um, and I see maybe a negative reversal or a parabolic move. I'm gonna try to take most, if not all of my profits into strength. I use the 21 day EMA quite a bit. So if I'm still in the name uh, and giving it some room, I'm gonna sell on a close below the 21 day EMA. And uh, maybe for like a high conviction name, uh, I may use the full ascender set of rules and you can see them here. So those are the 21 day, the 50 day, and then trying to hold a small portion of the position for a longer move. Um, if I see a parabolic move um, or a reversal or break of that curve, um, I'm likely gonna be selling there. And one of the things the Everest rule is described here at a high level, but Eric actually shared during the IPO masterclass the specifics of the Everest rule and what it looks for and how it triggers. So, you know, once that triggers, once we see that kind of parabolic move, gaps, huge price moves after already an extended move, um, the Everest rule looks back two days and sells um, below that point. So again, fast, fast rules for that phase. Because we saw in all those examples, and again, that advance is fast, but then most of the time it gives it back just as fast, if not faster. Okay, so in the next section, I wanted to share with you, since we've recently had uh, a turn and a rally off of the, um, the bear market, um, I wanted to share with you what I've found to be 
uh, a way to try to identify leaders pretty early in a new rally. And this is one of my favorite screens. Um, I call it the power screen. And you can run it from different spots. Um, typically, I like to run it either from like the first rally day um, and like this. So that would be the market bottom after you've already seen a turn. You're looking back and you're saying, you know, which names have had the highest price move percentage wise um, from that low point, that first rally day. And then I'm looking only at liquid names. So like I research showed liquidity matters. So 20 million average daily. Um, or better. And I'm going to be running this during a market turn. I'm going to be running this for weekly for, you know, maybe a couple months out. And what I'm looking for is, you know, what are some of the names that are behaving the best? And then I get to research them even further. So, um, and what I found again, anecdotally, that it sometimes identifies, you know, one or two of the new, couple of the new leaders early. So I'm sharing with you, this screen was an actual screen that I ran. Um, the screen was run March 17th. And what I did was I looked back to the first rally day, which was the end of last year. Kind of that was like the bottom for the, the most recent rally. And I started running it, you know, after the, I believe after the January 6th uh, follow through day. And uh, then I just kept running it periodically. So you can see here, there were a few names that I highlighted and these, this is the price move here. And what's interesting is, you know, if you first look at this, let's say you're sitting there looking at this screen on March 17th, you'd say, wow, you know, these names have already run, you know, 60, 76%, 93%. So they've already run quite a bit. Um, so what's interesting is a lot of times these point to names that are going to also continue that run as long as the market environment um, continues. Not all of them, but it may point to a few. So I'm just showing you that it pointed you know, to NVIDIA pretty early on. So let's say a trader uh, picked it up at that time. And since that time, since the time this screen was run, um, NVIDIA is up another 52% and so forth. The other thing I picked up on this um, was that several of the names that show up on this list that had very powerful moves um, have a, a bit of an AI theme to them. So uh, that was another thing from the screen. But just wanted to share that with you. One thing to keep in mind when I run this screen, I'm looking uh, the liquidity filters in there, and also I'm filtering out anything under $15 a share. So I wanted to show you, since we talked a little bit about that um, AI theme, this is the bots or artificial intelligence ETF. And you can see, this is a weekly chart. You can see that it corrected significantly along with the bear market. Um, you know, bottomed out, has been rallying, consolidating, rallying, consolidating, and then recently broke out. What caught my attention is um, this volume here on the weekly. So no one knows how long this will continue, but it's, you know, an area that I've been researching. And so I'm keeping a close, close eye here as well. Now I wanted to share with you a few names um, that are on theme for the AI theme. Um, I do have positions in these names. And the reason I'm sharing them, I don't trade just IPOs, I do trade mature stocks as well. Um, so I do own um, these names. And I, we talked about Palantir. Um, we talked about NVIDIA showing up on the, um, the power screen. And then Tesla has a presence in AI for their autonomous driving. And Snow is one that's um, attempting this space. And we'll see if it can break out of that. It has been um, you know, correcting quite a bit with the bear market. It's had a long institutional due diligence phase. We'll see if it works. I don't know. I have, you know, tight stops on my stocks. And, you know, if for some reason they breach that, you know, I may have it and then have to have to sell it um, next week. So it's just names that I feel are on theme with artificial intelligence um, that I am uh, ha have accumulated in the portfolio. And we'll see, we'll see how they do. 
Okay, and so in terms of liquid IPOs above the first day close, I wanted to share one more screen with you. Now, we had looked at Next Tracker as an example of why it's important to get in earlier um, in the turn during an IPO base because it's so easy to get stopped out. And I had mentioned that you know that's on one of my watch lists just because of this screen. And uh, this screen is something that I run periodically, and it shows me any IPO that is um, liquid, so above 20 million daily, and went IPO'd in the last couple of years. So I'm looking here just from 2021 um, to the present. And what I want to do is just see, you know, which names are actually above their first day close. So this is kind of shocking because these are the only names that are above their first day close. And that's because of the severity of the bear. You know, if we continue railing, uh, we'll start to see more names come onto this list. I think this first one though is a SPAC, but all of these are names that I have on a list um, to research further. And that's because they're showing that they've, at this point, are above their first day close, which is kind of unique um, after this very severe bear market. So just wanted to share that with you. Well, we've talked a little bit about the different phases. And I mentioned the institutional due diligence phase takes some time, right? It's six to 18 months. Um, we looked at a screen that there aren't that many names that are above their, you know, their first day. And the, the stats really bear that out. Um, IPOs can cor do correct significantly, even after they have an IPO advance phase. And a lot of times we'll undercut that entire structure. And what you're seeing here is that they do it pretty quickly. So they may go public and have a short run, but often a majority of the time they're under they're going to undercut that first day low. And as you can see, I'm showing the stats from the book, the time frame of the book that we published in the book, as well as you know, Eric's updated these numbers for more recently. And because of the severity of the bear, we've seen these numbers get, you know, even larger. So as you can see that 93% of IPOs undercut their first day low within um, 39 weeks. So I just wanted to share that. And also there's no rush really as IPOs start trading publicly there's no reason to rush in like the first day. So as you see, I'm always waiting for that first um, IPO base um, and I'm looking for the technical signs. I have time to research it. And then if I am tra trading that phase, um, I'm gonna be using faster rules because I know in studying the IPOs, how quickly they can give up that move. So we started early on with this slide, again, from our research on IPOs. Um, this is the edge that we feel we have in trading IPOs and super growth stocks. So always being aware of like, what phase is this stock in? You know, is it early phase? Um, is it the first mature base, which may have a longer run in the institutional advanced phase? Or is it in this quick phase where fast rules work better? You know, I always try to look at the patterns um, and certain rules have sh are more effective with different patterns. So um, we found that and we share that in the book, the exact numbers, and we looked at all the super growth stocks and which rules were more effective. Uh, but uh, the patterns are important. The phase is important. I'm always looking for liquidity for the exceptional companies and then really trying to apply the appropriate sell rules based on all of those factors, particularly the phase um, and the patterns of the name. So just one super growth stock handled well could turn into a life-changing life cycle trade. I wanna acknowledge again that all of the charts that I've used today are uh, from Wanda. Uh, William O'Neill and company. 
And I mentioned the IPO masterclass. We had so much fun working with the Trader Lion team, working with Richard so closely. And uh, it was it was quite a lot of work. I'm going to be honest, but an amazing process to go through to put all that information together and share it um, with you all. So if you're interested and you didn't catch it before, um, here's some of the information on it. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll turn it over to you, Richard, right? Yeah, perfect. I just want to mention, yeah, it, it was a great community that we built as well with the IPO Masterclass. So I had a ton of fun uh, and learned an immense amount. And it, it doesn't just cover IPOs because each of you kind of shared your individual trading styles, which uh, I thought I thought was really excellent. And I definitely uh, picked up a lot of new things. So uh, thank you so much for giving this presentation, Eve. And we've got a ton of questions to go through um, for Please. anybody watching. Yeah, for anybody watching, uh, this is the time to let me know in the chat what you'd like me to ask Eve. Uh, but to start with, um, would we be able to go back to uh, the AI theme a little bit? Because I know uh, you're super into research and, and looking into individual stocks as well as themes. Um, my question was, once you noticed that AI theme and a few names that were popping up on your radar, showing large uh, volume and other you know promising technical signs, what did you do to look further into the AI theme and investigate, you know, potential ideas as well as, you know, look into, you know, how long this theme could last? Great question. So I, it's, it's a lot of reading. I've been listening to um, a lot of podcasts from experts on the topic. I've been listening to the CEOs of the companies that I feel are leading in the space or trying to learn which ones are leading in the space. Um, I've been monitoring a list. I have a watch list put together, but it's it's difficult at this stage. It's still, I think, pretty early on. So um, right now, a lot of the names on the list are are larger names, like some of the mega cap names. And and one of the things that dawns on me is that, well, in order to invest in AI, like develop an AI platform. That takes huge dollar commitment. So, you know, that's why I think some of these mega cap names are starting to move on that, on the promise of AI. But I feel like we're going to have a lot of other names, like newer names that we've never heard of. And maybe when the IPO market um, starts to heat up, the environment's a little better for IPOs. We'll see some new names go public. So really just a lot of reading, a lot of studying, learning the space, learning uh, from experts in the space, and then um, listening in a lot to the CEOs and what they, you know, what they say about their investment in AI, what's their future view, and um, sharing that too with, I have a network of uh, portfolio managers that I meet with regularly, and we share information so important um, to have that type of a network and develop that because we share information with each other every week. We have a call, but also when we run across something interesting, uh, we share that, you know, a link maybe to a podcast and say, you know, this is worth listening to. Um, and that's a way to have other people helping and contributing to, to that research as well. So I'm still early. I think, I think it's still early in AI. And I, I think, I'm still early in the process as well, trying to understand the potential um, of the space. Yeah, excellent. And are there any kind of go-to resources um, in general that you like to, you know, look into when you you've noticed a new theme, or uh, you mentioned, you know, a few that you listen to podcasts with AI? Any in particular that you would kind of recommend to the audience here? Well, um, I found I just listened to uh, the Palantir CEO um, talk about you know, his edge that he feels he has in this space. Uh, I would recommend that. That was a Bloomberg video a couple of days ago. Um, we use Jeffrey's research. Uh, they just um, released a huge uh, paper on the potential in, um, in the AI space and the names that may stand to benefit. Um, and they put out some uh, really great research. Those are just a couple of the things that pop into my mind uh, right now. Yeah, excellent. And for my next question, I'm sorry, I'm going to have you go back uh, in your slides here. Would you be able to go back to the PLTR daily chart? Um, it was uh, maybe slide 15 or, or so in there. Um, and as you go there, uh, my question is, would you be able to walk through kind of the 
price and volume characteristics that you're watching within that IPO base, because it was a really nice, clean example, if I remember correctly. So PLTR back in the IPO base, not, not oh, this is great too. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. That, that first base, could you kind of walk through what you're noticing in both the price movements as well as the volume clues that signal like uh, this is something you should be watching and how, how you kind of identify that specific buy point? Oh, yes, definitely. So um, right away, what catches my attention is that this action is pretty tight and shallow. So it's unusual for an IPO to have that type of action. And when I see that, that catches my attention. So if you look here in this consolidation, look how low this, this volume is here. And then as it starts to, again, goes tight here, as it starts to move out, you see this volume ramping and and liquidity is coming in. You know, this first day, you always have to kind of just say, you know, knock that out. But when it starts to approach that kind of volume and you see this ramp, that's going to get my attention, the number of days up. Um, so there, and you can look at relative strength here as well as it's moving out. Uh, gave a lot of clues. Now, this is a little lower priced. So, you know, I said before, you know, 15, I try to screen. Sometimes I drop it as low as 10. Um, you know, I don't like to trade low priced stocks um, typically. So this is a little bit, this is a little bit low here in terms of price, but the certainly the accumulation was there, the quiet volume and the consolidation, and then the power on the move out. Yeah, perfect. And now going to that mature base, could you kind of talk through the, the clues you're watching there to, to indicate that, you know, something substantial is going on and we might be starting that turn within the institutional due diligence phase? Okay, yes. Yeah. So first of all, um, it's been over two years. Um, it's not, this, this correction's huge. And if there wasn't a bear market, I wouldn't like this correction, right? I mean, I still don't like it, but it's basically following the market, right? And it's going through a due diligence phase. So that's something that I take note of. What's the market environment while the name is doing this? And then here's, here's the daily and here's the weekly. So let's go to that. Mm -hmm. uh, what gets my attention is it, it shows some power right away. Can't get moving. But as it's consolidating, again, it's going quieter. Um, and then... Um, I talk more about the super gaps in um, the IPO masterclass. And, but one of the things I, I watch for is a huge gap on earnings. So, and what's the catalyst for that? Like, what's, what's the surprise? Uh, what's the news? And then what's the reaction? And here you have a, a super positive reaction to earnings. Um, and you have the volume come in. So that's important. The size of the move and the volume. And then it holds it pretty well right after the gap. So it never breaches the gap day low. It holds the move um, and then starts to follow through. So when I see that follow through, that's a positive. Um, on the weekly, I saw these like tighter weeks in here. Mm -hmm. um, the strong previous rally. And then this kind of like double bottom. It didn't quite shake out here, but it still shook out. It, it went tight. And then the power of the volume on the breakout. And then I also like to look for, um, not that it's just viable at that moment, but if you see five, six, seven weeks up in a row closing and it's early in the process, it doesn't always, but sometimes that signals a, a leader and it may need to consolidate before it starts moving again. But I always take notice of, um, particularly six or more consecutive weeks up in a row. And when I'm looking at daily too, I'm looking for consecutive daily days up. So it just kind of shows the demand. Now, one of the things here, let's go back here. This has a lot of overhead. Now, some of it is older. So uh, that it's less likely to be very smooth sailing, right? Um, but so I, I do keep that in mind. Uh, it's going to be volatile, even if it works, if it can come all the way out of here and move out um, and works beyond what it has already. Um, it's not going to be smooth sailing because you have you have some disgruntled holders in here, right? 
Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And, and that's been the case. Um, it's hard to get positioned in a new rally after a bear market because, um, you know, you see a lot of that. I, I've seen a lot of that where, you know, one day, you know, you're up 10%, the next day you're down, you know, 8%. And the name looks fine when you look back on a weekly. There's going to be a lot of volatility because the bulls and bears are still fighting it out. Yeah, perfect. No, I, I love that breakdown of the price and volume action. Um, and, you know, looking at this chart, it's obviously still in its institutional due diligence phase. Um, right. But now we've kind of got, you know, maybe a potential catalyst with this new theme developing, shaping things up. Um, could you kind of talk about, you know, what's going on behind the scenes in this institutional due diligence phase that kind of develops this basing structure? And uh, I know you, you mentioned you look for increasing revenue growth. Uh, but are you also kind of interested if a stock, you know, first becomes profitable during its institutional due diligence phase and starts, you know, seeing a move up the right hand side? Yes, that's a great point. Yes, because the the numbers that were reported on the earnings call um, were, I believe, the catalyst and then the potential for the for the future. But what I'm looking for um, during this institutional due diligence phase and Really what's happening is at first it's going from, I think, weaker hands, shorter traders. And if it's a high quality name, it's being it's starting to be accumulated by institutions. And I'm looking for signs of that from a technical perspective, you know, a theme perspective, you know, as they report the numbers, I'm looking at the numbers as well. So the more factors I can see confirming that, um, the more conviction I'll have in the, in the name. But again, I'm going to go based on the technical. So if I take a position and I'm wrong, which I'm wrong frequently, um, I'm going to get stopped out. And maybe it was just a bad timing or maybe it's the wrong name. Right. Um, but, you know, it, it can sometimes just be timing and I may need to take another try at it. Um, but what I'm looking for is signs of accumulation. So we went through some of that as well with the volume. So as you know, it time wise, it takes a while. And because it's a bear market, um, I'm going to say, you know, this is not ideal, this this depth of this IDDP. Um, but I'm going to keep in mind that it was during a bear market. And that happens sometimes. But now, based on the la from the last earnings call, it, it's kind of changed character, right? So what I'm looking for is a change of character as well. Are the institutions starting to accumulate? And so far, I'm seeing signs of that in this name uh, based on the volume. I'm also going to look at, you know, what now that's a lagging indicator in terms of what funds are high quality funds starting um, to buy the name. Uh, and what are some of the projections for the particular theme the company is in? And what type of a lead does the company have in their um, in their expertise in their area? And um, as you know, just I'm trying to get a sense for initially how far ahead of the competition in this case is Palantir in the AI space. So all of those factor in to my decisions, and those are some of the things I look for in the face. Yeah, that, that's a really fantastic answer. Uh, there's a good question from your own, uh, which has to do with uh, the IPO advanced phase more. And it might be helpful to go back to, I think, the Mobileye example with the J hooks. Um, okay. And the question is, uh, what is the earliest point at which you'll consider trading an IPO a few days or weeks, or you don't define a specific time range? And it might be kind of Good to go over the the J hooks a little bit and talk about you know how you identify the pivot and what you might look for right before that pivot occurs. Sure, um, I don't have an exact um, minimum number of days, but usually you know it's a couple weeks. Like just anecdotally, um, that's what it, usually if it's forming a short consolidation, I'm looking for at least a, a couple of weeks in there. Mm -hmm. um, though sometimes you can see a high tight flag and I'm sure I have examples where I've traded them a little faster than that because the pattern is so compelling. Um, but usually like two plus uh, weeks in. Um, and here the hook pattern, I share the details of the trades and I don't have them right in front of me in the IPL masterclass. But I did try this early on, and some of this volatility just shook me out. Right. 
Um, Cause you can see like, if you're buying somewhere in this area, it has this huge run and it comes all the way back. Even if you're early, um, you know, that's definitely a, a, a shake, at least it was for me. So I'm expecting that. Um, in terms of the hook pattern, what I'm looking for is the stock's been going down for, you know, maybe a week or two, uh, and then starts to turn and form this U shape. A lot of times it coincides with like the 10 day or the 21 day EMA. And then there's some type of resistance that it needs to get through and it, and it kind of moves through that. Um, so when it coincides with the moving average, it's nice because you can set kind of some logical stops for that. But again, the expectation in this phase is that I'll be stopped out. So then I uh, tried again. I, this was early December. Um, and then this one was a little unusual because it was acting a bit like a stair stepper. So I did add to this, um, sold a majority into strength and then tried to hold the last piece. And you can see what happened to that with a mental capital preservation, which is a line in the sand. You know, once I'm profitable on a trade, I don't want to give it all back. Um, I mean, sometimes I'm willing to round trip um, a portion of a position, but usually I'm setting a, a mental capital preservation or a line in the sand where I want to retain like at least half or maybe 35% of the profit if it's like a small core position. So, um, so I may try to hold on to a piece of it and take profits on the rust uh, into strength. So this one, you know, this is a shakeout, but now one to, to keep an eye on. So hopefully I've answered the question. Did I answer the question, Richard? Yeah, I think you did. And I saw a few uh, questions and comments about, you know, handling volatility during the IPO advance phase. And I think Mobileye, you know, just looking at that chart, there's a lot of wide ranges in there. Yes. Uh, how, how do you handle that with your position sizing, um, your initial stop loss? Like how, how tight do you like to keep it? And also how do you just kind of handle that psychologically, seeing your stock move up and down so much, you know, uh, even over the course of a day or, or over the course of a week? Great question. Okay, so uh, one at a time is, is or two max, because they have to be watched so carefully. Mm -hmm. Smaller position size. You know, so, um, you know, this was still unclear. I know, are we in a bear market? Are we moving into a bull market? Um, so my position sizing was smaller and smaller because I'm trading the IPO advance phase. So I know if I put on a huge position or a normal size position, I'm not going to handle it well, you know, because I won't be able to withstand some of this volatility. So that and selling some into strength. So even if I'm trying to hold on to a piece and I know I've already locked in some profits, um, that get, that helps with my mental capital, the psychology of how I'm handling the tree. I mean, I've tried sometimes in the, you know, if, even if I have huge conviction in the name, I'm going to size it smaller in these phases because I know otherwise I'll mishandle the trade because of the volatility. And also I don't want to have that type of risk because, you know, these are more likely to, you know, they can have at certain points secondaries, you know, huge gap downs, they're more volatile. Some names are not yet in institutional quality hands. They're going to have more volatility. So that's the way I address it. It helps me with the psychology of the trade, smaller position size. In terms of stops, I usually I set my stops pretty tight. Like in the research, we found, um, you know, with IPOs, you want to give it a little bit more room. So what I do is I still set them tightly, but I'm prepared that I might get stopped out a few times and I'm willing to try again. Now, some some people on the team, uh, you know, set their smaller position sizes and set their stops in the 10 percent range. Mine are usually tighter, like 5% on an IPO, somewhere in that range, three to five. I always want to, for each trade, I never want to be, uh, I want to try to average in 0.3 to 0.5 of capital um, losses on my stop losses. Yeah, perfect. I, I, I know there are a bunch of questions about stops, so it's definitely helpful. Um, one last question. Uh, this one is from Greg Morton, uh, an IPO uh, aficionado in his own right. A uh, question for Eve. Uh, do you pay attention to the quiet period expiration at all? 
uh, which is the first 25 days after the IPO in which underwriters can't issue uh, coverage reports? Um, I don't so much. I, I go based on the technical action, but I kind of keep that in mind. You know, sometimes the stock will um, will move quite a bit, either up or down, once all of that information is released and each of the firms take a position on whether to buy, sell, or hold. But I go based on the, the technical action. But I'm not going to take action just based on the fact that that date's coming up. The same thing with, um, I know we're not talking about the lockup, but the same thing with lockup. If I'm aware that the lockup is coming, it won't necessarily make me change how I'm going to how I'm going to handle the trade. I'm just going to be aware of it and I'm going to still uh, follow my rules. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, Eve, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you all for those excellent questions. Uh, I think this is this is really great. Um, Eve, any last kind of thoughts that you'd like to share uh, with everybody watching about IPOs, trading them, or you know, further resources that they can explore? Well, there's just going to be a tremendous amount of opportunities out there, um, especially after a bear market. Right. So what I'm doing right now is just keeping my watch lists um, very, very watching them very closely, the stocks, researching, great time, trying positions as they start to work. I'm I'm adding some more. So it's easy to get frustrated in a bear market. But one of the things um, Bill always was, was very optimistic. I think he said something like, I, I've never met a successful pessimist. So true. Stay optimistic. The opportunities are going to be out there. And uh Good luck. Perfect. Yeah, I think that's a great spot to end it. Uh, Eve, thank you again for, for your time and for that excellent presentation. Uh, to everybody watching, I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, if you did, please go ahead and leave a like down below on the stream. Subscribe if you haven't yet. Um, and uh, consider a donation to St. Jude's as well, a really great cause uh, that we're raising money for. So uh, with that, it's time for uh, a break, lunch break. Uh, we'll be back in around 45 minutes uh, with Matt Petralia. Um, I'll be playing... Uh, basically an interview with David Ryan during the break. So you guys don't get too bored, uh, but I'll be right back with uh, a short message uh, before we get going with that. So stay tuned and uh, we'll be right back starting at 2 p.m. Take care. So. All right. And with that, we'll go ahead and start our lunch break for day one. Uh, once again, here's a preview of the schedule. I hope you guys all enjoyed the presentations from Jared and Eve. Um, and we'll come right back at 2 p.m. to uh, start with Matt Petralia talking about environmental awareness, when to be aggressive versus when to play defense, a very important uh, topic in this day and age. And then we'll end things off with Denise Scholl and the Rethink Group, as well as Jason Shapiro. So we're definitely going to end things off with a bang. So we'll see you guys back at 2 p.m. And during this break, I'll play uh, the Trail Line podcast with David Ryan. So you guys don't get too bored, uh, but we'll restart at 2 p.m. as shown on the schedule. And definitely, if you're finding value in this year's conference, please consider a donation to St. Jude's. As I mentioned before, even $1, $5 is fantastic. And we definitely want to uh, knock last year's uh, tally you know, out of the water. So definitely go ahead and donate if you're able and find value in this conference. And you can go ahead and use the link below in the chat. So with that, I'll go ahead and play that video and uh, grab some food, grab some water. And we'll see you guys right back here at 2 p.m. Thanks. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Train Line Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Moglin. Joining us today is a very special guest, David Ryan. Uh, David is an extremely experienced investor and trader and was profiled in Jack Schwager's Market Wizards, along with his mentor, William O'Neill. Uh, he also won the U.S. Investing Championship for three straight years in 1985, 86, and 87, with triple digit returns each year. Uh, David, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today, and uh, welcome. It's truly an honor. Okay, thank you for, for having me on. My pleasure. Uh, so to start things off, I always think it's really interesting to hear about people's backgrounds and how you first got interested in the stock market and uh, maybe even purchase your first share of a stock. So yeah, could you talk, tell us a little bit about your journey and, and where it all began? Okay, well, it actually really began around the dinner table. Uh, and this is, you know, this dates me, but back in the late, probably mid to late 60s, my dad would come home, he developed real estate and we would sit around the dinner table and he would say, oh, I just bought a new stock for you guys for your college education. And he said, oh, I, I, I bought you a, 
uh, some shares in this new concept in, in food or fast food. And he said, I bought you some Kentucky Fried Chicken. And so that was one of the first fast food uh, stocks. Or he would say, I, I came home and I bought, um, I bought some Disney for you. And at that right. time, all there was was Disneyland. There was no Disney World. And the wonderful world of Disney, which would be on at, I think, seven o'clock on Sunday night. So we would watch that as kids all the time. So things like that. He was actually very good in, in selecting themes. He was extremely early on cable television stocks. I mean, people mm -hmm. don't even talk about cable anymore. Um, and uh, he's just he just reads and he thinks of these themes that he actually gets aboard and he has some nice runs. So, so that's where it first started, but he would bring home the, um, you know, the evening newspaper. That's where you'd only get quotes at the time. And I remember going through and I was looking through the different quotes and I found a stock trading at a dollar. And I asked my dad, I said, look, if I go into my room, open my drawer, get a dollar out of my drawer, can we buy, you know, a share in the stock? said it doesn't work that way. You got to do some research. We got to find some companies that, that are doing well. And a few nights later, he came home with the Wall Street Journal. There was an article on a company called Ward's Foods. They made, mm -hmm. made and you can probably still find these out there, Bit of Honey and Chunky Candy Bars. And um, so I thought, you know, at that time when I was probably, I was in my early teens going to junior high school. And I bought 10 shares of Ward's Foods at 10, I think at 10 and a quarter. I still have the confirm on my wall that, uh, that I bought it. And um, I still remember standing out in front of the student store where kids were lining up to get stuff, snacks between at lunchtime. And I'd said, you gotta buy these two candy bars. It never worked out. The stock went from 12 or to 10 down to two. But I became fascinated of why my stock went down and I saw other stocks that kept on going up. So, I mean, even, I mean, this is a very strange for someone who was in junior high and then high school getting trial subscriptions to, um, to, to actually daily graphs, uh, which is the precursor to markets, market Smith. Right. Um, uh, of, and then also value line. I, if, I haven't seen a value line in a long time, but I know value line, I, I would get trials to that and just fascinated. So that's, that's where it, that's where it all, all started. And, um, and then, but, and then I actually worked, uh, then I graduated UCLA and I had a friend who was on the, the floor of the P coast or the Pacific coast stock exchange. He got me as a, a job as a runner and that was literally, uh, it was actually shaped like a, a circle and there would be specialists making markets and stocks. They would make it, they would do a transaction piece of paper. I'd take the piece of paper and I'd walk it to someone who would teletype it in and that would go across the board. I thought I was gonna be after a few months picked up by one of these specialists and be an assistant and learn how to trade right. through them. And that never, that never happened. And so I started, you know, I was only there for about three months, but then I started thinking, why don't I get a job at the company that I already get products from? And I was getting daily graphs. And so I walked right up the front stairs of William O'Neill and company and went to the receptionist and said, is there anybody I can talk to about a part-time job, an internship, anything, I'll work for free. All I wanna do is learn from this guy, William O'Neill, who I've heard has, has done extremely well. So I, I actually talked to his assistant for about a half an hour right after that. Mm -hmm. And then I had an interview with, uh, with Bill the very next day. Wow. And I don't even remember what I, 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 I hopefully I was wearing a jacket and a tie, but I, no one had ever trained, tested, you know, they were coached me on how to go through an interview, but it turned out that I liked some of the stocks that they were recommending. So I, uh, I uh, he, he offered me a part-time job. I did that for a few months and then it worked into a full-time job and I ended up staying for 17 years. So that's kind of the short, quick story of how I got started. That's awesome. And uh, going back to the, the candy um, company being your, your, your first company that you owned, uh, that's kind of uh, almost the genesis of your idea that you want to look around the world around you to, to find ideas, find companies. I know you've said that in previous interviews. And often it's, it's the products that we use ourselves that are going to go out and be those true market leaders. 
Yeah, and and I I think people they I think people make the market so complicated. It really comes down to two things. One, what are you doing with your life? Mm-hmm. What are you buying? Where are you eating out? Where's your restaurants? What car do you drive? What phone do you use? What are your friends talking about? And then just matching up those concepts right. with some rules. Right. Is the stock in an uptrend? Does it have good earnings? You combine those two things and, and then they also have some sell rules and you should be able to find some very, very good stocks because just think of it, you're going to be trying to find the best product at the best price or the best service at the best price. And millions of other people are probably very similar to you and um, they'll be doing the same thing. So you're going to be you're going to be finding some great names. And as long as as long as the tax structure is uh, rewards innovation and entrepreneurship, these companies are just going to keep on coming. Right. And, and you've called it the treasure hunt. That That's the name of your chapter in Market Wizards, the, yeah, the treasure hunt. Yeah. I mean, it, the whole thing, it's a game. It's like, well, what's going to be the next concept, the next company that's going to do really, really well. And that's, to, to me, that's why it's, it's, it's fun. It's ongoing. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just, just a lot of fun. 100%. And uh, going back to your very early days at William O'Neill and Company, um, tell us about kind of how you built a relationship with Bill O'Neill. What kind of mentor was he? Uh, was he strict with you? Uh, t- tell me a little bit about the, those interpersonal relationships and, and yeah, how you basically learned from him and, and developed your style. Okay. Well, it, it wasn't as you might think it would be where, where I came in and then he would just sit down with me every day. Yeah. No, I mean, I was just a, uh, a peon. I was just, I, I was working in the institutional department, which was right. a great experience because I was around probably 15, 15 men who had been, men and women who had been in the markets and talking to large institutions, Fidelity, right. all these different mutual funds and banks and, 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 um, and I got to ask them questions and, and some of them were good in the market. A lot of them were, were okay, but most of the time I was filing, I was making charts on sales projections or how well, you know, everybody's doing and things like that. It wasn't until, um, until I actually won a U.S. investing championships that I actually started getting attention from William O'Neill and was actually able to go in. They would have a Monday morning sales meeting where they Mm -hmm. would go over their ideas, his ideas for the week and what he wanted to do and things like that. And, you know, as, as a, you know, if I would say of, I mean, that was a good thing, but it is, it was actually a little bit of a fault in terms of hiring people, um, with uh, with O'Neill because he would place so much emphasis on how well you could pick stocks that <laughs> sometimes he would look past uh, you know other things so right. so that's a, you know that was a, a a good thing that I did well in the market but um, so um, yeah so that's then uh, then eventually I started giving him ideas for for their institutional. A product uh, recommendations, and then started working more closely with them uh, as I started doing that. And then I guess, I'm not sure if it was in 87 or 86, uh, I think it was in 87, where he actually gave me some of the company's money to invest and, um, and would be rewarded if I made money in that account. So I was, I guess, the first PM or portfolio manager within the company. And, and I guess they went on to have a lot more after, after I left or so. Absolutely. And uh, going back to, to how you learned, obviously you learned from the, the other people in institutional sales, um, but were there any books that you read, any other top traders that really influenced you and helped you along your path? Yeah. You know, uh, so much of it was, you know, uh, was, I, I don't want to say it was self-taught, but um the institutional salesmen, they didn't, you know, I mean, they just kind of gave me an idea of what was going on out there. Right. But, um, and then the, O'Neill hadn't written the book yet. I mm-hmm. mean, that book was not for at least another three or four years. I still have a copy of like the, uh, the, original. the, the original, which was just a, of pieces of paper with a binding on it and had no cover and things like that. And so 
so and he he rarely gave you know I, I every once in a while he would kind of give an in in house kind of can slim type of talk right um so it really was it was I, I i guess i learned from they had books of their recommendations it's called new stock market ideas and i would go through and i would start i would start looking at see where they would make the recommendation and then where it was taken out um and so i would learn that from that but my biggest learning experience was from studying my own mistakes right because uh I, in 1982, I had an account that was at 30,000. I think I had $30,000. And, and then, you know, the market exploded in August of 82. And I had, you know, I had a great move. Uh, and I doubled the account. Mm -hmm. Well, it was just, I was just part of a huge bull market. It wasn't really all my skill. And I really didn't know what I was doing. And, and so I was already at the company for a year. And then, then we got into a horrible market or it just growth stopped working. Nothing was working. I started getting chopped up completely. And that account went from 16, sorry, 60,000 down to $16,000. So I completely, I mean, that's, that's pretty much blowing up. I finally sat down one weekend and I went through every single stock I bought for the prior year and found out what I was doing wrong. And I just found out that I, there was a pattern that just kept on showing up over and over and over again. It was, I was mm -hmm. buying extended stocks. So when I cut that, when I stopped doing that, I, I finally said, okay, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm only going to buy exactly at the buy point, exactly where the stock was coming out into new highs or above the majority of the base. Right. I'm going to look for the right characteristics. And from that point on, that's, I mean, I think very shortly after that, I got my first great winner and it was a stock called, uh, it was actually called Wards, which is very similar to Wards Foods, but Wards Incorporated, which was an electronic retailer, which then changed its name to Circuit City. There you go. Yeah. And, um, and so had a great win out of that. And then, then just, I was so focused. I wasn't buying pullbacks. I wasn't buying extended stocks. I was buying exactly right. I didn't care what the rest of the market looked like. Um, and so I was buying one setup and one setup only. And that's where I just started hitting one after another, after another. Focusing on one specific setup and just trying right. to master that. Right. I mean, you, you try to do a number of different things. You try to drive, you, you try to buy breakouts and pullbacks and all sorts of different things, or you start mixing styles, that's where you can get into trouble. And you just want to try to simplify the whole thing. Absolutely. And how would you describe your own personal uh, time frame? Like, are, would you classify yourself as a swing trader, position trader? And could you give kind of people a sense of your average gain, average loss, and kind of holding periods for both winners and losers? Um, you know, I haven't calculated it in, 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 in a while, but I, when I buy a stock, I want to stay in that stock as long as I possibly can. I do not mm -hmm. like going in and out, in and out. You have to make so many decisions. Mm -hmm. Whereas I, I find a good stock that has all the characteristics. I want to keep in this thing as long as it keeps on going. And if right. it's, if it's, if it's only three weeks, that's fine. If it's six months, it's, if it's a year, that, that'll, that'll be even better. Because I always found the stocks usually that I held the longest were the ones where I had my biggest gains on them. Um, when I was, um, and so, well, so then, in, so in terms of time frames, I don't know exactly what my average holding, holding period is. A lot of it depends on the market. Right. Depends on what stocks are working in the market. Sometimes, you know, technology can be very volatile. And so those are a little bit faster, but things like retailers that can be a little slower and steady sometimes I can hold those a lot longer. So it, uh, it, it all depends. I've always said that, I, you know, even if you have a number of losers in a year, if you keep those small, but you have one, two, three really nice gains, you should do extremely well right. in the market. Absolutely. And going back to your, uh, us investing championship wins, um, how, how is it different competing in a championship versus your own personal trading? Are, are you are you taking up a different approach or are you, are you still doing the same thing that you would use today to trade your own account? Um, 
Well, I think in, in something like that, you, you want to turn over a little bit faster and always keep the money moving. And I think when I was doing, when I was investing in those, uh, or in those competitions, um, I would be much more, I, I would have fewer positions Mm -hmm. I would probably have three or four positions, maybe four or five positions. And then every starting position would be at least 10%. And then if the stock started doing well, I would quickly get to a 20% position. And then if it had a really nice run, then I would sell that thing down once it looked like it was about to stall. So that was probably shorter term. Right. And I would be just constantly moving the money from one horse to the next horse, to the next horse. And and getting those getting those gains. The interesting thing about that is that though, after three years of doing that, I, I, and I also entered a fourth year in a row. And there, I was so focused on the results that I started, uh, I started getting away for, from what I had done well. I was more focused on the results and not enacting the strategy the way it should be. Right. And so I started, I, you know, I, I, I would be taking too big, uh, big of a position. And so right. I would have too much in any one stock and I wouldn't give it enough room. And so actually the fourth year I was flat. And then the fifth year I actually came in second. So, um, so that's, I, that's just sort of like the end of the story, other than the three times that I won that, that yes, you can get so focused on the results that you don't do what you should be doing. Right. And as somebody who's been doing this for decades, uh, you can answer this question. How, how is it different today trading versus back in the eighties, back in the nineties? Um, well, I think that, you know, the, the prices of stocks, I mean, I remember it well, mo most of the time before the, before probably year 2000 is that there were very few stocks that ever traded over hundred dollars a share. Now you've got all these stocks that are trading at ridiculous prices and they're moving, you know, they're moving 20 points in a day or 50 points. It's just, it's, I wish they would split them. So there would be a, just a, it just, it yeah. just get, it's, it's still hard to get used to stocks making such, uh, such big moves. Um, but in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of how it's really different, you know, I, I, I am a big believer in, well, I mean, if you want to, let me step back one second, mm -hmm. you know, we're talking about investment books and things like that. My, my biggest investment uh, influence is actually, and this would be a shock because no one ever talks about this, is, is the Bible. God's mm -hmm. word. There is more investment advice in there than any book ever written in terms of, in terms of just controlling your emotions, fear and greed and discipline. And, and probably one thing that I base all my, um, uh, almost, you know, all my investment uh, uh, criteria on is is a, is a passage found in, in Ecclesiastes, and it's something that a lot of people have heard before. Ecclesiastes 1.9, it talks about there's nothing new under the sun. What was before it has, has already, you know, it will not, you know, you, you think things are new, but it's already existed before. Right. And right. So, so when you talk about, well, you know, how were things back in the 80s or when you in, in these investing championships, I'm buying the exact same stocks the same characteristics now as I did then. And you can look back at charts from the, I mean, I was looking at a Bethlehem steel chart in uh, 1915. Yeah. Had all the exact same characteristics as, as a lot of these stocks do today. So there's really nothing new. It just repeats over and over again. And the only thing that's different is the name at the top of the chart because they have very, very similar characteristics. And those are the the, the can slim characteristics, yes, great earnings, have, sales. Yeah, exactly. That's you know the the things, the, the things that um, I I you know as I find I find you know everybody's looking for truth these days. Where can I what what is true? Well, God's word to me is true, and it's been true for two thousand years. And I say the same thing about what O'Neill laid down. I think what he's laid down and the characteristics he originally found is really the truth of what as how the market works. 
Mm -hmm. So there's a, so many parallels between the two, what he's discovered and what God laid down is that, is that this is how stocks, they operate. If a company has great earnings or a great product, they're going to have great earnings. People are going to want to own that company right. and stock price is going to go up. I don't know how that's going to, how that's going to change unless there are, you know, unless again, um, tax reasons clamps down on entrepreneurship and we don't have any new products and nothing new is made. So, um, so anyway, that's, I, you know, I find truth in <laughs> really one in terms of the market and how you should act and, and how you should trade in the market and then how you should believe and how you should live your life. Right, right. And um, going back a little bit to your time at O'Neill and, and being the chief market strategist, uh, what are kind of a few key things that O'Neill would kind of repeat? What, what are some keys that he passed on to you about how to trade and, and, and how to manage your emotions and manage positions? Um, you know, I actually, I, I spoke for a, a, a conference of uh, I think it was the last, I don't know what they called it, the, the last or uh, last uh, investment um, seminar that, that uh, William O'Neill and program? company, yeah, yeah. that they yeah. gave, that was a few years ago in, in Santa Monica. And actually I wrote down all these things and I had, um, and so if I could just, I'll just yeah, quickly go just go through what I've, I got. I mean, you know, he's always said he's always uh, was an optimist. He's never never forget that this is the greatest country in the world, and you have just so much opportunity. He would say that all the time. Yeah. He would always stay positive, and he would also stay he would stay humble. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, even against unrealistic odds against going against the Wall Street Journal, uh, you know, he 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 promoted a newspaper and and was fairly successful with that with that newspaper um even up against incredible odds and um and then uh, a few other things he said always know the direction of the economy uh if there's underlying strength to the economy that usually corresponds with a with a good market be flexible to change your market stance uh, is something that he was a master at doing when uh, i just remember there would be bear markets that go on for months and months and months and everybody's in a bad mood or every, yeah. no one can make any money. And all of a sudden he gets his follow through day and he's in there buying stocks while everybody's just sitting around saying, well, it's, it's such a bad market. I can't, you know what? And he's actually getting fully invested and everybody else is sitting on their hands. So, so it's good to be flexible. Details are really important. That's something he'd stressed in the products that we put out at the company. And, uh, and, and the same thing in, in reading a chart and looking at the characteristics of a stock, um, the littlest detail can make a big difference between a stock being just a, an okay stock and something being a gigantic uh, winner. Um, another thing, you never need a manual to the most successful products ever in introduced. Mm -hmm. And you know he, he's, he gave the example of the car, you know, you either push the button now or just turn the key and step on the gas and off you go. You don't need a manual. Right. Uh, and that's the same way when, when I remember in the, the mid to late eight and 90s, we started coming out with online products. And I mm -hmm. was one of the first ones to sit down with a programmer and Bloomberg was, was out at the time and, but we wanted to put everything online. And I just kept on telling the guy, we don't want to have anybody to know keystrokes or any backslash things that, that I think a Bloomberg terminal you need to work with. I said, uh, maybe this is an insult, but I said, develop, <laughs> develop it, it for the uh, village idiot. So anybody can sit down, anybody without any technical know-how and just be able to point and click. Make it and intuitive. Yeah, very easy. You don't need to read the manual and and um, and what's going on. Um, so then, always do things the legal way. Buy the book. Never cut corners because you, especially when you're working for a firm or you're in the business, there's um, there's also compliance that you have to go along with. You never yeah. want to get into trouble with that stuff. Uh, keep it simple. 
Bill only looked at weekly charts. He wouldn't look at daily charts. Not until I think I showed him, started showing him daily charts, but he would always concentrate on the weekly and wouldn't go back and forth. But the weekly actually just takes out a lot of noise mm -hmm. that's going on intraday and interweek in the market. Um, and then always challenge the common wisdom of Wall Street. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, you know, the common, uh, there's uh, just a lot of common fallacies in the market that people keep on repeating over and over again. And he would always challenge that. And then the last thing was work hard and remember what's important. You know, success comes through hard work. Um, and, uh, but I, you know, I, I add on to that is that don't work. I mean, work hard, but there are things that are more important than your performance in the market because I've seen so many tragedies in the markets over 40 years. I've seen people commit suicide. I've seen people have families break up, marriages break up because it becomes so important and so over overriding. It's, yeah. it's not worth it. Um, so keep a perspective of what's really, I, I go faith, family, and friends are the three things that are really important out there. Absolutely, that's well put. Um... And, and being in the industry for 40 years, I, I'm sure you've had uh, your ups and downs and, and dealt with losses. Um, how do you get out of a rut when you're, you're not trading to the best of your ability and, and nothing seems to be going right? What, what kind of steps do you take to kind of uh, try to turn things around and get back to your A game? Uh, I just, if, if I've had a number of stocks and let's say it's three, four, five stocks in a row that I'm buying and they're just not working out. Yeah. Uh, then I just immediately start slowing down. I, mm -hmm. I don't take as big of a positions in the stocks, the stocks that I'm buying, smaller positions, and I just wait until things start working. And then I start increasing my positions because if, if, if things aren't working, either, even, either the market's getting tough and it's about to go into a downtrend or a choppy period, yeah. um, or you're just not picking the right stocks. And, right. and, and so why keep on forcing more money and taking bigger positions and saying, well, I got to make it back. I get it. It's really just taking it one stock at a time and try to get that one winner and then get another one and then start getting that confidence back and increasing the size of the, the positions. Absolutely. And um, do you have any advice for, for mindset or, or uh, risk management for, for younger traders out there who just got started in the, in the past few years? Um, if they're just getting started and, you know, they, they, even if you've had a few years of experience, I mean, I mean, just like I, I think about somebody who just started, um, you know, since uh, March of 2020, and all they've seen is mostly an up market with very few corrections. Um, that that type of market and even the market you know today is to me is not it, it comes along once every 20 years mm -hmm. this happened in 2000 1999 and 2000 and it's happened again in 2020 through 2021 there are i mean a lot of people don't know what a bear market is and they just think it's just one stock after another and we all jump aboard this one and everybody's talking about this one but it's uh, they're going to be bad markets that come along. And if you really don't have that much experience and you've only been in for a few years, I would actually take a majority of your money and put it somewhere else where you can't trade with it uh, because sooner or later, we're going to get into a bad market and you're going to lose back probably a lot of, of what you've made because you, you've had just the experience of it. Everything only goes up and... Yeah you don't really have to sell because you'll get bailed out eventually. Right. So it's, it, to me, it's not really, I mean, yeah, it, again, it, it, sooner or later it's, it's going to happen. It, we just have an a, event of so much liquidity. I mean, the yeah. amount of money that the fed has pushed into the economy has found its way into the market. And until they start tapering or start raising interest rates, this is probably going to go on for a while where we're going to have this rotation, one group, one week, and then the next group, and it just keeps on rotating around. So, but and, I, I would, I'd tell them to go slow and also to, yeah, 
use a smaller portion of their money, learn from your mistakes. You'll learn more about yourself and your own trading by studying what you do right or wrong. And, and diving into that a little bit, what what kind of recommendations do you have for people who want to do post trade analysis? What's kind of your process? Uh, do you pick the the best five winners? You had be, uh, worst five losers. What, how do you kind of go about it? Yeah, you can. I mean, uh, now these days everything's online. Every all your trading is online, and so you can go and see what have been the, your biggest gainers, biggest losers, and then go in and start studying those. And, and the other thing too is it, it's good to do is to uh, screenshot charts of the stocks that you're buying, right. put them in a, into a file and then just go back, go back a, you know, a month later, six months later and just study where you went in and, and why were you buying at that point? It's also good. It's also good. I used to print the charts out because mm -hmm. we couldn't save them to anything and you just print them out and write on them. And then just look at them and, and see, and then print out the chart after you've uh, after the transaction's over to see where you went right or where you, where you went wrong. But that will expose things about yourself that you probably didn't know. It's yeah. it's actually very hard to study your mistakes too. A lot of people they don't want to ex they don't want to admit they've made mistakes. But if you can be humble enough to admit that you're wrong study where you went wrong and then correct that then you'll be you'll you'll do a lot better in the market um so but it 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 takes it takes humility to be able to do that yeah and it's it's almost like a athlete studying game film of the good and the bad games and trying to find their weaknesses and and also what they're doing right as well Right, because yeah, I've had people who've you know written me or 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 asked me. I said, oh, can, you know, can I just sit right next to you and see what you're doing, and right. and or you can see what I'm doing, but I don't know the thoughts in your head. I don't know your your mental makeup. I think there's a certain makeup of uh, of an individual um, who can be successful in the market. They have to be very disciplined. They also have to have a background of being able to take risks. Uh, be able to t admit mistakes and say and take a loss. Um, that's that's so important. Um, you know, that, I've always said you got to when you come into your trading office or room or wherever it is, you have to take your ego and throw it in the trash can and just be able to admit, hey, I'm going to make a mistake. Uh, or I'm probably going to make a number of mistakes, and I just got to learn from them and move on. Absolutely. And uh, you, you've kind of already touched on this a few times, but. Um... How important is lifestyle when, when it comes to trading and investing? You, you've talked about how you don't want to be too active because then you have to make so many decisions. Um, so yeah, how do you take that into account? How, how much time in front of the screens? And uh, yeah, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I almost think it's sometimes it's better not to be sitting in front of the screen the whole time mm -hmm. and, um, and actually get away or, or just even turn and maybe not turn it off, but go to another room and do your reading and do your research on individual companies um, than sitting there and watching every little tick going up and down. I mean, I guess you have to do that if you're a day trader, if you're very, very short term, but, uh, but if you like to take positions and try to stay with them for a long period of time, then it's actually better not to look at the interday swings because yeah. sometimes you know these a 10 minute chart can get you you could start going oh my gosh this thing's getting killed where then you step back and you look at a weekly chart and you go there's nothing wrong here right so you have to i guess decide on what time frame you want to be trading and that's that will dictate how much time you're sitting in in front of the screen absolutely and um, I've done a lot of interviews uh, with uh, some veteran tra veteran traders like like Mark Minervini. Um, and one thing I always like to hear about is their their weekend and also daily routines and how they go about like preparing for the next day to set themselves up for success. So, uh, so would you mind kind of walking us through what you do on a weekend to analyze the market, find stocks to trade for the next week, and and kind of yeah narrow narrow your focus to only the best the best opportunities. Well, I. Um... I spend a lot of time, uh, usually on, on a Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, uh, going through as many stocks as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, 
I look at the, I'm, I'm, I'm ex almost exclusively using MarketSmith charts and I'm going through a bunch of screens. The, I, I go through, they've got a uh, MarketSmith 250, mm -hmm. which is the best stocks based on earnings and relative strength. I go through all of those. Uh, I have my own, I call it my own monitor. I call it data monitor after a product that, that, that uh, O'Neill used to put out where it's, it's just a list of stocks mm -hmm. that I, I constantly add some to. And I take the ones that aren't performing well and I take those out, I go through those. Mm -hmm. and, then, um, and then I'll go through maybe a few different other screens that I have set. Um, and I'm just trying, I, you know, oh, then I go through a lot of group charts I like to look at the top 50. I like to see what's moving to the top 50 groups out of 297 mm -hmm. they have. Um, and so I'm trying to see, is there a group theme that's coming on? Because lots of times when a stock makes a great move, it's along with the group. Um, so if, if I can, I try, I actually try to get through as many hundreds and hundreds of stocks as I possibly can. Um, and that's one, I've always said it's one problem and they're, they're trying to correct it at MarketSmith where uh, most of the time you can only go through one stock at a time on, on your screen. Now on the iPad, you can go through about four at a time. Yeah, yeah. And so that, that helps because I used to go through when... All right, welcome back everybody to our next presenter. Uh, we're really excited to have Matt Petralia of Trading Equilibrium, a very experienced trader of over 20 years. Uh, I really appreciate how he uh, teaches and, and educates about the stock market and trading a very you know even keeled approach. And uh, he said he's gonna talk about the unsexy parts of trading today, but I think they're the most important. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this presentation, Matt. So thanks so much for being a part of this uh, and being a speaker this year. Thanks, Richard, for having me. It's really an honor to be part of this lineup. It's a very impressive crew of people that I admire, um, and I appreciate you uh, offering the invite here, and I'm happy to speak. You know I love talking about trading, so um, happy to be here. Um, and I really want to discuss something, as Richard alluded to, that is you know, doesn't get a lot of airtime. It's not the sexiest um, topic that's out there, but um, to me, probably second only to risk management is understanding the trading environment that you're dealing with. And this you know, it's something that applies to every single strategy. So um, there are different environments that are favorable to different strategies and uh, strategies in different environments that are unfavorable to different strategies. So before I get into the nuts and bolts of uh, how I view the importance of trading environment, and how um, it's how important it is to understand it, um, I need to provide a little bit of background about what I do, right? So the, I'm going to talk a little bit about really broad strokes in terms of what I do, um, how I engage the market, et cetera. And then I'm going to get into uh, the trading environment itself. And by the way, the little uh, thumbnail that you have of me, I think I'm wearing this exact same shirt. I'm not sure, but I promise you it has been laundered. Um, all right. <laughs> so who am I? And I don't mean this in an existential way. Um, who am I in terms of how I interact with the market? What do I do? What is it that I'm looking for in the market? How do I see the market? So I'm a self-taught discretionary swing and position trader with just about 25 years of experience, all of which is trading my own account do not have a Wall Street pedigree. I've never worked for big uh, trading firms, and I've always only traded my own money. And the reason discretionary is uh, all caps here is just because I always like to bring up the idea that I think there's a lot of confusion out there, especially with newer traders, uh, maybe intermediate traders, that the discretionary aspect of trading is incredibly important. And I think it's something to, to absolutely highlight because um, nothing that I do is 100% algorithmic. There is no, I am not trading an algorithmic system, right? And if you're somebody that that wants to have uh, an if X, then Y for every single decision that you make, system trading is your thing. I am a discretionary trader. So I, folk, I have a rigid process 
and a foundation, a basic spine, I call it, of my trading process. But there is a good amount of discretion that comes in, comes into play here. And one of those discretionary things is understanding the trading environment that I'm in. So I believe strength begets strength. Um, I'm not afraid to buy high, sell higher. You know, momentum is something that I definitely look for. I'm always looking for relative strength and strong trends. Those are kind of the key underpinnings of how I trade. I do trade both long and short. And I say that because, you know, there are going to be moments in this, in this video where I'm sure people are going to say, well, if the environment's bad, why don't you just go short? You know, meaning if you're not getting trapped into the long side, why don't you go short? And I'm, but what I'm going to try to explain is sometimes there is a poor environment for both. Um, so it's not the answer just to flip short, right? Uh, but when I do just uh, notably uh, trade to the short side, it's only swings. I'm never taking position traders, position trades to the short side. Um, and that's something I can get into a little bit as well. So overall, I'm a, a top-down analysis kind of person. Um, I like to generally find the strongest sectors, strongest industries, strongest stocks. I know many of you understand this approach very well. Um, and I always try to enter on a consolidation patterns, offering the key to everything, which is asymmetric risk reward opportunities. And that's what I view as the main, the main function of charts for me uh, as a tool is to identify asymmetric risk reward opportunities. It's not to be a crystal ball that predicts what's going to happen or tells me what's going to happen. Um, the charts for me, and I'm a very visual person, I used to be an architect, um, that's why I key on them, is, is a way to identify asymmetric risk-reward opportunities and manage that risk, More, even more importantly. So uh, just, again, broad strokes of, of who I am. And I'm a risk manager first. Those of you that, that follow me on Twitter have probably maybe too many times heard me say this, but it is, it is my firm, firm belief that I'm a risk manager first and a trader only when my duties as a risk manager have been fulfilled. If you are not fulfilling that job uh, for your own trading, no one else will. Um, and I view I view basically everything uh, in, in terms of how I interact with the market through a risk management lens. And it's, it's much more than just where am I putting stops, things like that. It's an entire risk management lens that I view everything through. And I think that risk management has to be um, number one in that hierarchy. Um, and over the years, over those 25 years, um, there sure, sure were five or six of those years that were not pretty. Um, uh, but over the years, I have simplified and simplified and simplified um, to the point where I firmly believe that you will just lose every single argument you have with price, meaning, you know, the Brian Shannon, on, the only price pays, you know, many, many people that, that uh, say focus on price. I firmly, firmly believe that if you are looking at a candlestick or a bar whatever your chosen method of daily charting is, and you're arguing with that candle, um, saying things like, well, this is not supposed to happen. This makes no sense. This should have gone lower. Um, you're going to lose that argument every single time, 100% of the time. So um, as the years have gone by and I've done everything wrong to begin with, I have come down to firmly conclude that following price is my job. Um, I am also, I think it's interesting that I am a CMT who really just about shuns every indicator and oscillator for the most part. I have a very small technical toolbox. I'm about to, about to get into that. But while I believe um, that there is a tremendous value to the technicals, I think really honing in on what works for you is the best, best methodology. And having studied so many of these different indicators, by the way, most of them, almost all of them are just based on price movement. So, you know, sometimes just cut out the middleman and go to the source, which is price. But having studied so many of these things, I really do believe that you can certainly have a system tailored to a certain oscillator, a certain indicator, and people have found a lot of success doing that. But if you start to have eight, nine, 10, 12 of those things, um, it becomes just super, super counterproductive and a tremendous amount of noise. So I am somebody who has studied all this, got the CMT, all of that fun stuff. Um, and I am still, it even more so made me uh, simplify things uh, going through that process, made me, made me even realize the decision to simplify is what works for me. Um, so what am I passionate about? I think this is the question. Um, it's not just in here as fluff. I think it's a question that everybody should really ask themselves. It's engaged in the market. And if your answer, honestly, is just money, um, it's going to be a tough road. Right? That's, a, that's an editorial comment. But I am genuinely fascinated by the market and the process of trading, the, whole, the process of it. Right? The, the gains that make over the years is, is kind of like the icing on the cake. And of course, that's a... Uh, that's a goal, but the process of trading genuinely fascinates me because it's so uniquely personal. And there are so many different ways 
to tweak your process, to tweak your system, to tweak the way you interact with the market, really tweaking your logic um, that, that suits your own personality. I just find it incredibly fascinating. There is no one set rule book, right? Um, and the fact also is that it's very accessible. Granted, we have to be the fortunate people on this earth that have internet access and the funds with which to participate, but it is so extremely accessible at this point um, in time. I don't, it's never been this accessible. All of the, you know, all of Richard's amazing uh, interviews on YouTube, all the stuff that the trader line guys do. I mean, none of this was, was uh, in existence before. It was certainly not when I was beginning trading. Um, so it's, it, there's, there's just a, a plethora of, of opportunities to learn and access the market now, which I think is just incredible. Um, but finally, I think the never ending learning process is what keeps reinvigorating me. So it's, it's, you know, I'm sure we've all been in jobs or, you know, some endeavor that starts to become very, very tedious and boring. Trading just never feels that way to me because it is a constant learning process. It's certainly frustrating, can certainly be frustrating and can wear on your nerves and your confidence, but the constant learning, the constant source of finding something new about yourself and the market reinvigorates me. Um, and secondly, which is the reason why I'm really here and chose this topic is because I'm also really passionate about shedding light on the realities of trading versus the, you know, the bright lights, the kind of slot machine noise that can be um, so frequent, especially on FinTwit. Um, I am actually very passionate about presenting the less se sexy aspects of the business that really lead to longevity, because that's the way I developed. I was never exposed to, you know, some of the aspects of FinTwit when I was 24, 25, um, that were the get rich quick schemes. If to me, um, this was always a long road. And I, and those, that's where I found the best answers um, in, in regards to how I interact with the market is by looking at that very long road. So it's some of these very uh, less than sexy ideas like risk management and talking about the environment are the things that I think are actually the most important things. So I'm always a big fan of reality over fantasy is something that I say quite a bit. Now, just to kind of round out the broad stroke intro here, um, I'm always looking for signal versus noise. This is always something that, um, you know, is part of that simplicity approach. And I'm looking for simplicity, not only in an analysis type of environment, but also in my decision making. So there's a big difference, right? You can look at a chart, a simple chart, but I also want to have a very simple decision making process too. Um, and I strongly believe through experience learning this, that complexity is a killer. I have been the analysis paralysis guy. I have been the conflicting signals guy. Um, I have been the one that cannot make a decision and then tries to go back and look at a chart and say, well, if I could figure out if that fourth oscillator was doing so and so, then I'd crack the code. And, you know, I, I want simplicity in my decision making um, and simplicity in my process. Right. So the technical toolbox that I have is pretty small. And the main one is price above everything else. If you told me, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious, but if you told me I could only have one thing on a chart, it would obviously be price. What else are you going to go on? Right distant second and third. I'm not even close, really, volume and SMAs. And yes, that may rub some people the wrong way. I, I definitely use volume, but it is still a distant second. I would call it for me, price is the arbiter. If price hits a, a, a point in which I want to take action, I am going to take action regardless of volume at the moment. Um, and even more distant than that, I use field position, uh, basically ways of distinguishing field position using RSI which is a largely a momentum indicator and Bollinger bands, which is standard deviations on a given uh, SMA, generally the 20 day SMA. And I'm going to go into a chart in a second, but price is always my signal. Everything else is simply confirming or not confirming price movement. And I try to keep it very, very signal simple. So price is always the uh, signal that I use to enter or exit, participate or not participate, et cetera. So I think we've all seen, a chart like this. And I did blatantly copy this from somebody's site who uh, is, uh, I think he's got a site about uh, Forex trading um, and he labeled this indicator madness. So I think he was going for the exact same thing that I'm going, I'm trying to illustrate because I don't think this was actually somebody's chart, but it does such a good job of it. I just literally Googled cluttered stock charts and this one was the best one. I thought, I think this guy's, this guy on Twitter is at ghost wire trader. So giving credit to to that person. Um, I thought this was just a really good representation of when you lose the signal to the noise, right? Um, like I said, this is an exaggeration. It's kind of hyperbolic, but I think we've all seen charts that come pretty close to this, right? Um, and this is where you can start to put that CMT hat on or your uh, you know, Nostradamus hat on, thinking that you're gonna crack a code 
Um, and in reality, what you're really doing is just smothering any signal that could possibly be trying to make its way into your brain and your decision making process. Um, and what I want to do is peel all of this back. Um, and when I started off, maybe not as bad as this, uh, but pretty close. I mean, you know, you would look at some of the charts I started off with and you would say, what is this guy actually keying on? And the reality is I didn't really know what I was keying on. Right. And that was that was the whole process for a number of years, quite honestly, because um, back then there was not there was there was just not the information out there. So I got my uh, intro into the stock market through technical analysis books, really kind of deep, uh, um, advanced technical analysis books that you really actually become the fundamentals of, of getting your CMT. So you just start you start thinking that there um, is a code there somewhere um, and that you just keep learning about these indicators and it's going to finally click. And you end up with a chart that looks like this. Um, 25 years later, didn't take didn't quite take 25 years, but you know, eventually, several years later, I end up with charts that just look look like this. And I'm I'm not showing you this because of what Google recently did. Um, I'm not talking about you know a pivot or a breakout or anything like that. This is just the way I look at my technical toolbox. Price is first, so you can see I just use candlestick charting. Um, in the distant second is always volume, so I'm always watching volume, and I've got an average 20 day volume. Uh, blue line there as well. And then I have the key SMAs, which for me, I don't even do exponential. Honestly, I just stick with the key simple moving averages. I don't, I actually don't want them to be fast, but that's a whole separate topic. Um, and I've got the nine, the 20, the 50 and the uh, 200 day there. And then even more in the distance. And you can tell by the uh, really kind of transparency of the Bollinger bands in the background there, that's just for field position. So that's keying on that's two standard deviations from that blue uh, simple moving average, which is the 20 day moving average. And that just gives me an idea for, you know, field position in terms of how far a move has has run, you know, how much more you could possibly expect. I generally just find that graphic illustration to be a decent way of understanding maybe how much is left in the tank or not. And then RSI, I will use only for divergences and it's not a signal. I will just use it as a means of, you know, maybe you know, taking my foot off the gas a little bit. If I start to see a big divergence, maybe take some partials, but it's not a signal to go short or long for me. And I bring this up just so that you have an idea of how I trade because understanding the environment um, that you're trading in is completely unique to how you trade. Um, and I'm going to get into that in a minute, but I, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't take a few minutes here to give a very, very broad overview of how I look at the market and how I trade. So I'm always looking for uh, strength, momentum, I'm looking for follow through. I'm looking for trends and I'm using very, very simple technical analysis to enter in asymmetric risk reward opportunities. That's that's probably about as nutshell as I can make uh, my trading style uh, in, a, in a short presentation. Now, so trading environment, why did I even choose this as a topic? Why is it important? And I think it's important because I think it's very neglected. And I think people, um, especially in the beginning, but really I, I've come across traders that have several several years of experience and still are not giving the environment uh, the attention that it should be given in my view. So I think it's a very important thing to understand that the trading environment um, has an enormous impact on your results um, and needs to be monitored and understood more so even than monitored necessarily. So a lot of beginning and interme intermediate traders, I think they focus almost exclusively on setups or possibly indicators. Um, but I think setups are the top of the list for them because I think there is, you know, this this kind of rush to understand, you know, how these setups work. How can I enter? How can I how can I tactically use these setups? And if I can just keep finding these setups over and over again, that's that's obviously going to be what what runs my trading career. And and you know, you definitely need to know some setups, but they do not overpower the trading environment. The, um, you're not trading in a vacuum. And I think that this kind of uh, this kind of instinct to per, to first look at setups uh, more than anything else, um, I would call it label trading. I've heard other people use that. I've heard Gil Morales use that idea. I'm you know I'm not at all claiming that I created the the concept of label trading. I think it's a really good concept though, um, and and that is that you know if somebody identifies a descending wedge, if somebody identifies a high type flag, a, a cup and handle, what have you, I think the instinct for newer traders is to not not understand that they're spotting a low risk entry or a good risk reward entry, but think that this means this will happen. And that's label trading. I, I've, so I have identified this. I have labeled this as a cup and handle. Therefore, this means the stock is going to X, Y, Z level. Um, and I think that gets very dangerous and very confusing. And then people start to get very frustrated when those patterns don't work out that way, which, you know, for the most part, at best, you're going to have patterns that work maybe 60%, 70% of the time. 
Um, so the belief, I think, is that the right answer can be found if you can simply label these patterns or use an indicator, et cetera. Um, and I think even more hazardous is this belief that uh, traders, if you want to call yourself a trader, it means you should be making outsized returns under any conditions. You know, bear market, kill it. You know, choppy market, kill it. Bull market, obviously kill it. You know, I think that's that's something that people really get hung up on. And, and it can take quite a while to uh, understand that that's not the way that, that things work. And it's because the environment is constantly changing. So I think there's an initial assumption that your process actually equals spot setup then execute. And that's basically the nuts and bolts of the process. And you're missing a very, very key ingredient of understanding the environment in which you're operating. Um, and if if that is your kind of basic understanding, I think it really leads to boom and bust trading in that people will just repeatedly take these setups over and over and over and over again and just wonder why, hey, suddenly they're not working. You know, why is this breakout suddenly not working? It was working great in 2022, you know, for, to make the obvious the obvious analogy, bring it back to real life. The things that worked in 2022 have not been working since, or excuse me, 2020 have not been working since 2020. I mean, there could not be a clearer example um, than what we saw happen in 2020 and then completely different environment, basically, basically since February of 2021. And then in 2022, we obviously had what I think we can all agree it was a pretty nasty bear market, long duration bear market. And the environment is going to change the way your setups, uh, the, the outcome of your setups. More than anything that you're doing, the environment is changing that, right? So the boom and bust trading happens when people just think, oh, all I have to do is spot a, a clear horizontal pivot level and the breakouts are going to, you know, I'm going to be fabulously wealthy by doing that. And that may have worked in 2020 and then it no longer works, right? So in the best of circumstances, you're going to get a boom and bust trader. I'm greatly oversimplifying this, obviously, but under the worst of circumstances, it's going to lead to ruin. So understanding the environment, extremely important. Um, and it's also, I think it's, you know, just keying on what I mentioned before. The market is not an ATM. Um, every strategy does not work every single day in every different kind of trading environment. Um, so it, I'm going to talk about uh, account feedback later on. And it's actually one of the most important ideas here but it requires a consistent trading logic. But um, that is one of the best ways in which to identify the optimal environment for your strategy. But a lot of traders are not at the point yet where they have a consistent trading logic. And I'm, again, I'm gonna get to this a little bit later, uh, but you must understand, uh, especially if you're not at the point where your trading has become very, very consistent, then understanding the environment is even more critical because your account feedback is gonna be largely as random as the randomness of the trading that you're undertaking. Um, so employing a, your strategy in an unfavorable environment will lead to some very bad things as a trader, which is not just financial losses, but really a, a major loss of confidence, which I think can be very deleterious to somebody who is trying to actually uh, treat their trading like a business confidence. A confidence gas tank is something we all want to keep pretty full um, and constantly beating your head against the wall in an unfavorable environment is a very, very quick way to uh, deplete that confidence. It's simply using the wrong tool for the job. And I think a lot of people will take it personally and think I am doing something wrong. There is something that I'm missing here. There must be some, some secret thing here to execute this strategy so that it works better. I must be doing something wrong when the truth is you're using the wrong tool for the job. You know? You're know, you throwing a football to first base. You're watering the lawn with a drinking cup. Whatever silly analogy I can possibly come up with, um, you're just simply using the wrong tool for the job when you're trading your strategy in an environment that is not conducive to that strategy. Uh, so what is environmental awareness? It's understanding that the best textbook setups for your strategy will fail more regularly in an environment that's not conducive to your to your strategy. It's simply understanding that environment trumps your setups. You will certainly, in, in 2020, or excuse me, 2022, I'm getting my years maxed up. I just turned uh, 50, so... You know, time is going by. Um, but, you, you know, if you have setups that worked in 2020 and then they do not work, just like I mentioned before, um, and you're asking yourself, why are these not, why are these textbook setups not working? You know, in 2021, we still had some we still have some textbook setups that would have worked in 2020 and they're just simply don't they're not working now. So why is that? Is it because I need to go take a course? Do I need do I need to uh, you know watch 49000 YouTube videos? What's the secret I'm missing? The environment is not right for your setups, right? And that's something that we need to all understand. So instead of myopically focusing on setups as if we're trading in a vacuum and all that matters is the setup, I firmly believe that we need to understand that the environment, 
we need to understand the environment that suits our style best. So for me, why I went through that little blurb in the beginning of how I look at the market, it's going to be different for everybody. And I can understand pretty easily what the characteristics are of a poor environment for my trading, as well as a conducive environment for my trading. And it's going to be different than for a day trader. In fact, sometimes they're the complete opposite characteristics. So you, you may be a day trader, you may be a swing trader, position trader, buy and hold investor. You need to understand what, ask yourself, what are the ingredients that make my strategy successful? Maybe for a day trader, it's really wide range days. You know, maybe they like the volatility, right? For me, that's what I don't like, right? But you have to, I think, whatever your chosen strategy, understand what the ingredients are that make that strategy work. And when they're gone, you have to know that it has changed. So, and, and when I talk about an environment, it's not a label just like with, with uh, setups. I'm not labeling the environment bullish or bearish. You can in fact have a stance that is not bullish or bearish and one that just simply tries to understand if your style is working. And I, I was able to uh, make some gains in 2022 um, on the short side, go figure, it was a uh, bear market. Um, but then there have been some times where I've, I've felt, you know, very challenged with my style because both long and short were not working. And that it has nothing to do with a bull market or a bear market. It has to do with the ingredients I need being missing. And I'm a, I'm going to get into that. So have you ever wondered why you're doing the same things you've done before and getting different results? And there's the famous Einstein quote um, that insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And that is brilliant. Um, but... That also, that also applies, I would argue, to the physical world where there are physical laws. Um, there's yes and no answers. The market is not that. Um, I would argue that in the market, it's insane to do the same thing over and over again and expect the same results because it's not going to happen. The environment matters, the environment changes, and it's going to change our results. We cannot take the same actions day to day, every day, and get the same results. Even those people that do rigorous backtesting um, you know, with with highly developed and tested um, data over over a course of you know decades, actually back testing to find systems that work. Those systems will suddenly stop working uh, because the environment changes and nothing works in every environment. Again, we are not trading in a vacuum. Um, so I also want to mention the illusion of control bias because I think this plays a lot into um, how people uh, are are understanding the environment changing or not understanding the environment changing. So the illusion of a control bias is basically the fact that we tend to think we have much more agency in outcomes than, than we really do. In 2020, everybody was a brilliant trader. Everybody should quit their jobs and make money hand over fist every day. In 2022, everybody doesn't know how to trade. Everybody goes back to work. Nobody knows what they're doing. When the reality is that the environment has simply changed and people were not responding uh, or acknowledging, I should say, that the environment has changed. Therefore, what they were doing before is not working. And it's it's much less due to their agency than the outside force of the environment changing. So when we're making progress, like in a 2020 environment and stringing together gains, it's much less due to our genius than it is due to the market conditions being favorable for our strategy. Yes, some traders are better than others. Yes, some traders have better instincts, uh, better better. Uh, 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 ways of executing things than others. I guess I shouldn't say better ways of executing, but more experience um, and a, a firmer understanding of what they're what they're doing, um, which comes with experience. Um, and when we're getting chopped up, you know, through you know, I, I would I would think most people on this stream right now have had some experience getting chopped up in the past fifteen months, um, and you start to question. Am I actually a trader? Like, what am I doing here? You know, and that is much less due to us being incompetent or not knowing what we're doing than it is due to the market conditions being unfavorable for our strategy. And yes, you can exacerbate all of that by doing some some uh, poor risk management and and the like. But in general, um, you know, the, the the meat of the issue when you're getting chopped up in a poor if you're a consistent trader is the environment has changed. So in that last that last example of getting chopped up, we're really guilty of is not understanding the environment that we're operating. We're not guilty of being incompetent or uh, miserable traders that have, should, never, should never have entered the business. We are uh, not understanding the environment which we're operating and making the necessary changes. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, we need to understand the optimal ingredients re required for our specific style. And that will be different for every style. So I'm just gonna only talk to what I see for my style. And that's why I mentioned this in the beginning. And somebody who has a completely different style will have different ingredients. 
Um, because the market will, will, you know, there's always going to be a style that works. There's always going to be a style that doesn't work in a certain environment, but no single style works in every environment. Um, so you need to, I think I really recommend that everybody do this simple exercise of thinking about what are the ingredients needed? What, you know, what's the recipe needed for your style to flourish? Really think about it instead of thinking about setups and charts and moving averages, really think about what are the ingredients that make swing trading work successfully. And you want to monitor those, if those ingredients are present and if they're changing. So for my style of swing and position trading, um, the key ingredients include some simple, simple, simple things. I need follow through. I need momentum, particularly for swings. If, you know, anytime you're holding a position overnight, you need follow through and momentum. That's it's just a very, the definitional kind of uh, expectancy that you have for a swing trade. If you don't have that, um, you're never going to get swings. You're never going to get um, price to move in the direction that you are anticipating or any kind of overnight follow through whatsoever. And we've seen a ton of that recently where we don't have follow through. We don't have momentum. It's recently started to change. I'm not going to get into all that, but you know, to bring it back down to earth, it has recently started to change. Um, and it's refreshing, I think, especially actually some of the action we saw on Friday. And I may touch on that a little bit, but without follow through, without momentum, um, swing trading doesn't work for me. Right. And then for position trades, it's even more clear, really. I need a trend. If you're going to be in a position trade for months, maybe even more than a year, if you don't have a trend, you are absolutely employing the wrong uh, strategy, right? So you need a clear trend. If those two things are not there, it's going to be a much tougher environment for me to swing trade and position trade. And it can be as simple as that. And like I said, if you're a day trader, what are the ingredients? You know, depending on your style, you want intraday volatility. You want wider ranges. You want some reversals uh, that you can exploit. You want the volatility to ramp up. You don't necessarily care about longer term trends. You know, so I, I just encourage everybody to, to make, literally make a list of what are the ingredients that you need to be successful um, at your strategy or for your strategy to be uh, aided by the environment. So what are the characteristics of a poor trading environment for me? Uh, swing trading and, and position trading. Frequent 1% overnight moves. This doesn't have to be a gap. Um, in both directions, you know, higher, lower, both directions, meaning up 1% or down 1%, again, does not necessarily need to be a gap. Just means the market closes. And I'm going to use the indices as an example, but it applies to individual stocks as well. But, you know, on the SPY in 2022, how many times did we see an overnight move that opened 1% higher or 1% lower? I was calling it the amnesia market uh, because you woke up and nobody cared what happened yesterday. It was just, it was going to open higher or lower. Um, there was no rhyme or reason. There was no follow through, you know, which is that thing that I need, right? High volatility, frequent 1% plus intraday reversals. We had some of those days like CPI days and FOMC days where there were six or seven of those at a time, right? It looked like an EKG chart, but it wasn't just on those days either. We had high volatility, frequent intraday reversals. And I don't just mean on the indices, but on, you know, the underlying too, which obviously gets reflected in the indices. Um, and this, this apply, you know, this, these are things that perhaps are things you want to see as a day trader, but it's not what I want to see. And then I think even more kind of easy to identify is a weak or ambiguous midterm trend structure. And by that, I just mean the simple, simple thing that we can all, uh, graphically see as in higher highs, higher lows, or lower lows and lower highs, right? It's a simple trend structure. As you learned from day one, you know, that we get lack of follow through in both directions as a result. And then finally, a news driven market is sort of it's a little bit like the dog, uh, the tail wagging the dog, because with the news driven market, you're frequently going to get all three of those things above. Um, and all three of those things above are usually going to <laughs> result from the news driven market. So we've had all of that uh, through all of 2022. Um, so it's no surprise. It's no surprise that that is a very tough environment to do swing trading um, and position trading. Um, and I, I put a note here mainly for me to say that you shouldn't gloss over this with just stay out of a bear market because I'm not one of those people that thinks, all right, I'm just going to, I'm just taking off. I mean, I, I, I respect that, um, but there are ways of using your strategy, um, understanding that it's a difficult environment. And I think that, you know, the first step here is identifying what are the ingredients of the strategy that will be, will provide the tailwind what are, what are the ingredients of the environment that will provide the tailwind to your strategy? And then you have to make uh, tactical decisions. Um, and, and I'm going to get into that right now. But it is not simply a case of stay out of a bear market. Um, I'm not saying that because, uh, you know, I could just anticipate people saying, well, go short. 
or just don't do anything, right? And I actually do trade short. So I'm trying to make the point that sometimes the environment is simply um, a major headwind for your strategy, even if you are going both long and short. So just to do a little bit, I know I've been throwing a lot of bullet points at you. This hasn't been the most graphically exciting, especially from somebody that was an architect, but here is a chart. Um, and so what this is just simply illustrating the, la the uh, second to last point I made, weak or ambiguous midterm market structure. Can you see my cursor actually? Yes, okay. So green line, 50 day moving average. I think we could all agree that's pretty much midterm uh, trend indicator. This is, you know, good luck figuring out where that's going, right? This is going sideways. This is an entire period where the S&P 500 was largely going sideways. And this is what I would call weak to ambiguous midterm market structure. You know, we had a low here. We had another high there. Took out the low here. Um, it's it's changing, right? We could certainly obviously make a case that it is or has changed. But in this area, we've got a lot of uh, chop. We've got a tremendous amount of chop. And this is a year's worth of chop, right? So, um, you see the 20-day moving average all over the place, right? So I would define this as just a simple graphic way of trying to illustrate what I'm saying, where you have weak to midterm market structure. You know, it's pretty easy to see in this area that began with 2022, big, strong downtrend, right? It starts to become less clear. And this is why I'm also saying you don't want to just call it bull or bear. This is an environment. This is a trading environment. Who cares? Bull, bear labels, doesn't matter. This is what you're engaging in when you're trading, um, and this is a weak to, to ambiguous midterm market structure, I would call it. Another kind of uh, graphic way to represent this, and again, I, I, I will wrap this up eventually by saying that account feedback is your best tool to understand this, but there are some ways to see what I'm talking about. And this is, this is ATR, average true range, which is a volatility measure. Um, uh, basically, basically, what it's measuring is uh, expanding ranges. Um, you, the look back is usually 14 days, but you can see here um, on the, this is SPY again, we've got this, this general range with climaxes right around, let's say 6.2, 6.3. I don't know exactly what it is on this chart um, of average true range expanding in this firm uptrend. And then we start to see average true range really explode. Um, and that is what I'm talking to talking about in terms of a poor trading environment. For swing trades, this is a way to, you know, a lot of what I'm saying, most of what I'm saying is qualitative, but this is a quantitative way to kind of see what I'm talking about, where the range expansion really happened here. Lots of gaps. This is where lots of those 1% up, 1% down moves were happening. Really difficult, right? And this is also, you know, if you know anything about average true range, if this was a, uh, you know, if this was a $30 stock or something like that, the average true range number would be much lower because it's based on the range that's moving, right? But if you'll note this, price is moving lower while the average true range is moving higher. So uh, it's even making up for that dynamic. Um, and then here, as we finally start to um, make a little bit more of a noticeable structural trend in the midterm uh, timeframe, we see average true range start coming back down. So this is an ingredient that I'm finding actually hopeful recently um, and encouraging because average true range has started to come down. We've had less of those days. I'm sure you've all felt that we've had less of those 1% move days. We've had less of those massive gaps, or we've had less of the amnesia market, I guess is what I would call it. And then you say, well, why don't you just use the VIX? You can just use the VIX, right? But I just think that ACR, it really shows the actual expansion of the range much more. So the VIX just kind of hit its head up against these levels here uh, that were really basically the same as kind of any old textbook pullback in 2020. Uh, in 2020, or early 2021. Um, and then you get the same kind of level spike here, even even during the bear market, which I think a lot of people were confounded that the, the VIX never made this huge spike, right? But I think more informative, uh, at least looking back, is that the range was expanding. And that's the, that's the point I'm trying to make here is that this environment, and I'm not going to call it a bear market, even though obviously we could, I'm going to call it a trading environment that was not conducive to swing and position trading, right? Um, and I would argue through my own personal experience, actually, that earlier on in 2022, when there was a pretty clear, strong downtrend, um, you could participate on the short side relatively successfully. And as time wore on, it became less so from my view, from what I do, um, because this range expansion environment, this high ATR environment, this weak to ambiguous midterm structure environment was the environment I was interacting with. So what's evidence of a poor trading environment? I told Richard this was going to be 45 minutes, and I'm already probably going long. I'm going to, I'm going to go faster. Um, what is the evidence of a poor trading environment? Um, most stocks, not just the uh, SPY and the Qs. And by the way, I could do that ATR example with the Qs as well. Uh, but most stocks become noisy. You know, they're trendless, listless, range-bound. They don't have that follow-through ingredient. 
um, increased intraday volatility with frequent reversals. Um, a lot of individual names start ignoring some key levels that you would expect them to respect. I think we saw a lot of levels uh, absolutely become very volatile levels instead of being respected as support and, and resistance. A lot of pivots with the same type of thing, trend lines, same type of thing. A lot of names moving up and down through MAs like they didn't exist at all. Um, a lot of just noise, a lot of price noise. And I think we saw a lot of that in 2022, especially towards the end of the year. Um, and again, very little follow through either to the upside or the downside, which is what makes a poor swing trading environment. If there's a lot of follow through to the downside, I can get behind that. I can take some swings to the short side. When there's not, when there's equal uh, chop in each direction, very, very difficult. And that's when those people that um, say, well, why don't you just go short? They're missing the concept that sometimes the environment is just not conducive to swing trading in either direction. And you have to be aware of that. So in the in the opposite direction, and it's not all about just playing defense, um, but understanding all of this is what will allow you, I believe, to play offense more effectively. So what are the characteristics of an op uh, optimal trading environment? Just the opposite. The things that you need for swing and position trading, clear, strong st structural trend, higher lows, higher highs, or the inverse. Low volatility, you know, where we have, you know, we saw we just saw the VIX collapse over the past few days, which I find a bit encouraging. I think it's down to 15. You know, it had been trading, it had been in a range of 17 to 21 ish for quite a while, and it did just recently collapse. Um, and you see, saw ATR coming out of the spy. I find those things encouraging. So lower volatility. We will start to have more frequent trend days. You know, where the market opens. Maybe it opens where it actually closed last night. God forbid that should actually happen again, right? And then it actually trends higher um, throughout the day. And that becomes a much, much more conducive environment for me to swing trade and position trade. And in general, you'll see stocks that are supported in pullbacks and higher volume on follow through. And vol volume does become, um, you know, uh, my high uh, my high priority on this, on the uh, as the second indicator that I'm looking at uh, next to price when you start to see higher volume on follow through. So when you start to see these things, when you can understand the poor environment, then you can obviously understand the good environment. And this is when you want to start getting aggressive. So you've got three choices when you're when you finally understand and are paying attention to your environment. And it is by no means something you need to get a PhD in, right? But you need to pay attention to it. But you have three choices when confronted with a poor trading environment. One is change your style, change your strategy, right? I'm going to become a day trader. I'm going to compress my time frame. I'm going to become a day trader. You know, everything is out of whack for swing trading. So I'm just going to day trade. You know, you can go for it. You can do that. Personally, I find that uh, changing lanes like that for me is incredibly unsuccessful. And I find that in general, um, you know, very, very talented traders usually have a specific lane that they excel in. There are definitely people that can excel at day trading, swing trading, position trading, but I think it's very, very difficult, right? So you can do the change your style strategy, strategy drift. I don't encourage it. I do not do it. Um, two, employ defensive tactics uh, that help you adapt to that different environment. And we always hear about adaptation. And for me, adaptation doesn't mean become a day trader. It means change my tactics a bit, right? And I'm going to go into that very quickly. Um, uh, but my main goal is still conserving capital. That's why there's defensive tactics, both mental and financial, until conditions improve. Your third choice, which I don't, I think is a good choice either, is disengage, go away completely. There have been moments, and I did it as well, where two, three weeks, I'm just not taking trades, period, right? And I am fine with that, and there are times to do that, but I'm not going to just disappear for 15, 18 months. Um, I'm going to employ some defensive tactics and still interact with the market and rely on that feedback to tell me when things may start to be changing. But let's be honest, there's really actually four choices. And this is the worst choice, which is keep doing exactly what you're doing, despite the horrendous feedback you've been getting. So keep forcing trades that aren't working. Keep taking those setups that aren't working. Uh, keep sizing, you know, sizing yeah, in your in your wheelhouse, whatever your regular uh, size trade is. Keep sizing up. Ignore the environmental changes completely and just think that it's going to work in the end and this is what I should be doing. And that's the, the trader that's focused on the setups in a vacuum and is not paying attention to what the environment is. And unfortunately, unfortunately, I think this is actually not an uncommon choice. And I think people will do this and start blaming themselves and not understanding that the environment is not conducive to their style. Um, and it really deteriorates people's confidence uh, and really empties that confidence gas tank. And I think you know, these little images are exactly what you're doing here. You're banging your head against the wall um, and, and you're not understanding that the environment is not conducive to your style at the moment. So choice number four, if this has been you, uh, this was definitely me as well. Like I said, I've made every mistake. Every mistake I could come up with, I've made it. So I have been number four guy. Um, and you have to realize 
this is what makes me realize that one of the most important aspects of trading second through risk management is operating in the right environment. So defensive tactics, and I promise I'm going to wrap this up pretty soon, but defensive tactics um, when I am looking to still participate in the market, uh, but not be aggressive. And, and I am expressing the fact that I understand that the environment is not in my favor. Trade less. Number one, trade less. Decrease the frequency of trades. Narrow my focus list. I want to look at one or two or three names. Get involved in one, two or three trades max. For the entirety of 2022 into 2024, I never had more than fade four trades on at a time. And that only happened twice. And I was profitable in 2022, by the way, by grinding just like this, but understanding that the environment um, had changed. I size smaller. My usual size is 50 basis points. Um, that's the way I size a trade is the risk between entry and exit uh, as, a, as a percentage of my total account. I would size smaller, 25 basis points of risk, and I would take one or two trades. I would have 25 basis points in my account open at any given time. Um, I would cut losers mercilessly. And this goes into a question that I get pretty frequently. And this is a means of helping my underlying trading math. And the underlying trading math for every trader, most traders are somewhere in the 30% to 60% batting average range. Sure, you can have higher. Some Well, you're not really going to have lower because if you get too much lower than that, you're out of business. Um, but most traders are going to be in the 30 to 60% uh, batting average range. So your, your trading, simple trading math is pretty obvious. You have to have larger average winners than your average losers. And the only thing you can control, particularly when the environment is not conducive to your style, is the size of your losers. So during 2022, one thing I did was I noticed through looking at my, uh, you know, uh, previous trades through a trading journal, hey, instead of reaching an average of 3R, 4R, 5R, I'm I'm hitting one and a half R, two R maybe on the, you know, on, on these trades. They're not running, right? So that's not the math I need if I'm going to be a 50% trader or lower in a, in a poor market. That's not the math I want. What can I control? I can control my losses. So I cut my losers quickly. That means getting stopped out more. Batting average goes down, but the that ratio between winners and losers is what kept me profitable in 2022. Um, another thing I do is aggressively protect break even. I don't care um, that it's choking the trade. I'm out of break even. That's what it's a, it's a tactic. It's a decision that I make. I'm going to raise stops to break even quickly. It would be absolutely choking off a trade in an optimal environment where you want to give a give a trade breathing room. But in a very choppy uh, environment that is providing a headwind to me, not a tailwind, I'm protecting break even very aggressively. And finally, I'm taking larger partials and I'll take them sooner. So usually I take the first partial between one and one and a half R. I'll take it at one R or even sooner and I'll take larger. Usually, usually my first partial in a good market is uh, a quarter of the position. I'll take a third or even half in a defensive mode. So this is the these are the defensive tactics that I employ. And I encourage everybody to have a list of how do you get defensive tactically when you're in the wrong environment for your strategy. This is how I do it for mine. Um, and keep going. The, the common question that I get that I just wanted to bring up here uh, and what I just listened was, listened was, how do I know when to cut a trade short? And this goes to kind of a perceptual understanding of what you're doing. And for me, it's not it's not a sign. I'm not looking for a sign. It's the decision itself that I made before I entered the trade. The decision itself was that I'm going to cut this trade short. It's not, hey, there's something on the one minute chart going on or I know this is just going to go lower. Or I, you know, I know this isn't going to bounce when I cut it because you never know that. Nobody ever knows what a trade is going to do when you exit. Ever, period. No, no matter what, right? So stop trying to know and beating yourself up for not knowing. You can only control your own actions. So my decision here is a tactical decision. I'm going to cut trades short to keep that math intact. What I mentioned before, keep my losers smaller than my winners. So it's a decision I make before I enter the trade. I, I'm not even remotely going to try to pretend like if I, I, I know the stock is going to hit my stop. If it starts moving against me, particularly right away, I cut it. I have been cutting uh, through all of 2022. I cut trades at around uh, minus two, minus, or excuse me, minus 0.2, minus 0.3 R. So quickly. Um, and that has been stopping me out more, no doubt about it. And some of them reverse, some of them go lower. And I don't know which is going to happen. Um, but it is a, a methodical decision that I make beforehand. It's not based on a one minute chart. Um, and you know, the bullet point is just kind of emphatically saying that, how do I cut trades short by cutting them short? That is the decision I've already made. The decision has been made ahead of time. All right. So finally, aggressive tactics, which is what, you know, most people want, right? We want to be aggressive in the right environment. And all of this stuff that I've just mentioned, um, is how to be defensive, how to, how to, uh, 
identify a poor environment for my strategy, at least the way that I do it. Um, but then, you know, being aggressive is exactly what you want to do when you can identify that those ingredients are lining up so that you have a tailwind. So I'm going to expand my number of open trades. I'm not going to go crazy because I'm not the kind of trader that has 20 trades on at one time, but I will have five, six, seven, even trades on open at one time. I will size up if I'm really gaining traction, 75 basis points, maybe even hundred basis points. And I will use options as a tool. And this is a whole separate talk that I could go into, but it's a way of using leverage in the right environment. So I'm not the kind of trader that is purely an options trader that, you know, that's my be all or end all. I use options. I will use them in the right environment uh, to, to be aggressive. That's how I will, will use them. Um, also as a way of defining risk. And there, that's a whole separate topic. Um, and I will start avoiding that strangling a trade um, thing that I was doing with protecting break even start, uh, start disengaging from those defensive tactics. And really honest, if I'm being completely honest, I need to start doing more of that now, I think, you know, based on the feedback that we've started getting, I've started getting some good feedback. Am I going to pretend like I was 400% long in NVIDIA and uh, AMD and SMCI? And, you know, I knew, I knew, uh, you know, all those moves were about to happen. No, but I did take some good swing trades in some of those names and, you know, actually managed to get my position sizing back up to 50 basis points. And I think that I'm going to start being less defensive, particularly since we saw that Breath, breath expansion on Friday, saw the smalls and mid caps participating, et cetera. Um, and I will start avoiding strangling some trades a little bit more because I have been, you know, like the Boston Strangler on these things. And I want to give them a little bit more breathing room and let them breathe and behave a little bit better um, when things are starting to work. And I will, I have already started taking smaller partials um, and, and less aggressively. So I have on recent trades actually st taken partials at one, uh, 1.5 R and have to be a quarter of the of the position so these are all things to get aggressive i have not started sizing up to 75 basis points or using options yet or really ramping up my number of open trades but i'm starting to get to that level where i'm going to feel more comfortable doing that so you can understand what i'm trying to present here is that i'm employing the same trading style i didn't become a day trader i did not become a mean reversion trader i you know there's a lot of things i did not suddenly become but i'm using very different tactics based on how i'm seeing the environment behaving and how I see I'm seeing the environment either providing a tailwind or a headwind and then progressive exposure obviously is a big part of this and should always be a big part of everything honestly um, establish a baseline trading size for me that's 50 basis points and this is how you will react defensively or aggressively right so this is this is something probably everybody knows but I think it fits in here with this idea of understanding environment so when trades are finally gaining traction and the environment is conducive um, size up right just like what I said when feedback is poor size smaller um, and one thing that I do, which I think tons of traders do, which I think is, is very uh, helpful, is that when I'm hit with multiple stops, and that's going to happen, especially when I'm doing the defensive tactics, like I said, I just take a break, take a break, step back, slow down, and then maybe even size smaller in the next trade. So if you're a 50-50 trader, I think a lot of people don't even understand this, this simple math. If you're a 50-50 trader, if you have a string, think of it as like flipping a coin. If you have a string of 50 trades, you are absolutely guaranteed to have four or five uh, in a row that stop you out, that are losing trades. You're just guaranteed. It's just, it's mathematically the way that it is. Um, it's like if you are a 50-50 trader, those odds will be even worse for you if you are a 30% trader. You may have seven or eight, nine losses in a row pretty frequently, and it can happen, right? The key is keep them very small. And that's why I was talking about when I'm, when I'm being defensive and I'm having that lower batting average, I'm cutting trades very, very, very quick. So I think this is very important to, to uh, understand that if you're taking that defensive approach, you're going to have more multiple stop losses in a row hit. Keep them small. Keep them small. That's what I've been doing. And then finally, which really, to me, honestly, is like the entire talk here is account feedback, which but the caveat here is to make your account feedback meaningful. You have to have reached a point where you are consistent. You, you have a, a logical consistency in your trading, meaning you don't wake up on Tuesday as a day trader. You don't wake up on, on uh, Wednesday as a mean reversion trader and then Thursday as a position trader and Friday as a breakout trader. You have to be consistent. You have to have established a logical consistency in your trading because if you are that person who is a different trader from Tuesday to Friday, your feedback from your account is meaningless because you're taking random trades. You're employing random strategies. It doesn't make any sense. If I am a rigorous uh, trader with rigorous logic and discipline, um, with a certain style, then that feedback makes a ton of sense and is very important to you because it's it's literally telling you the environment is not working. You know, assuming you're not making 
silly mechanical mistakes or simple trading mistakes that you know are simple mistakes, right? And I know Jared Trendler was talking about things like that. As long as, long as you're not making those types of silly mistakes that, and you are a consistent trader, then this account feedback is absolutely paramount. Um, and you are your own best indicator, honestly, in terms of environment. And you may not even be noticing that the environment has changed, but your account is telling you it has changed. So I think it's incredibly important. Are your last three or four trades working? I think a lot of people think of this in terms of simply progressive exposure, um, which it which it leads to. Like if you have the last three or four trades working, size up if you haven't whatsoever. But really what it's telling you is the environment is changing, right? It's not, it's not just about, you know, the randomness of your trades working. The environment is changing. So very, very, very important. If you're not making execution errors, like I said, and gaining and not gaining traction, it's a great sign. Your account feedback is the best sign, I think, that uh, the environment has changed or is simply a poor environment in general. Um, and then in summary, which I, I'm coming in at 53 minutes, um, environment is more important than setup. It, you cannot have it the other way around. The setup does not trump the environment. You're going against the odds. Yes. Did NVIDIA run like crazy in a poor environment? Yes. <laughs> Did most stocks not? Yes, the environment is is going to uh, make your odds decrease if you are trying to fight it by by uh, taking setups in a vacuum, right? So environment is super important, and I would put it in the hierarchy, definitely above setups, uh, because every single setup has a lower chance of success in an unsuitable environment. And this is an this is a probabilities based endeavor. I want to stack the odds in my favor. So I am not going to participate um, ag aggressively in an environment where I know the setups that are my bread and butter setups have a lower chance of success. It just doesn't make any logical sense, right? So you, you have to understand first how important the environment is. Then I think it's great for everybody, no matter what your style is, especially if you're a newer trader. Honestly, make a list. What are the key ingredients that you think are necessary for your style to thrive? What are the key environmental ingredients? No, that doesn't mean I'm not talking about, I need price to, I need range contraction below a pivot line. That's not an environmental ingredient. What is the environment that you need? Do you need big range days? Do you need lower volatility? Do you need follow through? What do you need? Uh, I would I would strongly suggest identifying that and then being vigilant and really consciously aware of when some of those key ingredients are missing. Right. So that's something that you can keep an eye on, particularly if you're not at the point where you really trust your account feedback. Be vigilant about when those ingredients are missing and act accordingly, meaning have a defensive plan, have an aggressive plan. Don't be option number four person where you're banging your head against the wall every day. Have a defensive tactical plan and an aggressive tactical plan. I also don't recommend style drift being the, the choice number one. Um, and then, you know, I'm just going to end it with rely on your account feedback. If you have reached the level where you trust your account feedback, and I'm sure many of you have, that is the most important indicator, I believe, um, that will give you insight into the environment you're trading and whether or not that environment is conducive to your uh, style. But it does require a consistent trading logic. So thank you. I hope that this, uh, the uh, least sexy, one of the least sexy topics out there um, shed some light on some of the ways I think about the market and um, I really do strongly believe that everyone would benefit from making a simple list and, and firmly understanding what kind of environment suits your style best. So thank you for having me. Pat, thank you so much. Um, I already saw some comments in the chat saying that this this presentation really helped them out and kind of changed how they how they think about things. So thank you so much for putting that together. Um, as, as I'm asking these first few questions, if anybody watching has questions for Matt, uh, please drop them down below in the live chat. I'll get to those in just a second. Uh, to start things off, uh, Matt, I think it'd be good to you know, talk about you know, how you developed this awareness or need to, to analyze what the environment is like. Where did that kind of start in your personal trading journey and how did that kind of change uh, how you operated as well as your performance and, and trading overall? Yeah, it started too late. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't say that because I've recovered. I'm a recovering non-environmental awareness trader, right? So, but yeah, early on, I was not paying attention to things like this. I'm, and the reason I'm, the reason I don't feel badly talking about, you know, those people that, uh, you know, are label traders and focus on setups only in their processes, set up, execute is because I was that person, right? So I'm not trying to be derogatory in any way. I was that person, right? Um, and then, uh, you know, it, it's things start to click in different ways for different people. 
But I, I think it's when I started to embrace the, the real idea, and it seems patently obvious, but when I started to embrace the real idea that this is a probabilities-based endeavor, right? right? And I want to stack probabilities in my favor. And it became extraordinarily clear to me suddenly, hey, one of the probabilities that needs to be in my favor is the overall market environment. What am I, am I trying to accomplish something here that is simply not going to work in this environment? You know, am I playing baseball in the rain? Simple things like that. Um, and I think once I realized that it took me several years to, it definitely took, I was, this was not on my radar when I was starting trading, right? It took several years. I always kind of exaggerate saying that everything took me forever. It did take a while though. It did, took a while for this to click, you know, to register in my brain that this is a very, very important way to stack the odds in my favor. So several years it took me to focus on this. Um, and it has been something that is a major priority, you know, risk management first, I would say environmental awareness second, honestly. And then there's a whole host of things that go beyond that. But without without the risk management, you're not gonna you're not gonna last. Without the environmental awareness, you really run the risk of uh, eroding your confidence and your and your uh, financial uh, capital uh, much quicker than you want to, even if you have good risk management. Yeah, perfect. And I, I like how you pointed out that um, the the characteristics that you look for are suiting your style, what you look for in the market. While, you know, some there's some amazing traders out there that are more mean reversion focused, that's their strategy. They're going to look for a different set of circumstances than you are because that's the optimal environment for them. Same as, as you mentioned, intraday traders want that volatility. That's the death for, uh, you know, uh, momentum guys who like follow through. So it's really about, as you, as you said, identifying the environment that you operate the best in where the probabilities are stacked in your favor and you know, knowing what those characteristics look like. So I, I think that's a really important point. Um, I want to ask you, uh, what are your specific routines, whether it's on the weekend or every day uh, that you do to stay on top of the environment and start to look for those characteristics, uh, either, you know, that the market's improving and getting more towards your optimal environment or degrading a little bit and uh, you're starting to see more of those negative characteristics. Yeah, so it's a mix of certain things, and I'm I'm not one of those people that that really thinks you should not be paying attention to indexes. I definitely am. Um, I am paying attention to them every day um, and every week, and doing simple technical analysis on the indexes. So if there is a weak trend, um, I'm usually feeling it as I'm trading. So it's a mix for me between that account feedback, which you know, after doing this for a long time, I am confident in in my account feedback that when something is you know when things are just not working. I know it's not suddenly, I just don't know how to do anything. I know that it's, there's been a change here. There's been a change, you know, and that alerts me to start looking for what's going on. Or conversely, I start to notice in the environment that something is going on and inevitably my feedback will go, go south, right? But it's that mixture of things. I rely heavily on my account feedback, but I am always looking at the indices. I am always looking at the simple, simple, simple trend structure. Um, and I do look at ATR, right? So when things start to get really, really volatile, I, I like using ATR over VIX, honestly, because um, because of the reasons I showed you, right? But when things start to get really, really volatile in both directions, um, that is a really good clue that it's time for me to either step back uh, for a little while entirely or or employ the defensive tactics um, for uh, until that improves, right? And for a very long period here, we've been in that very high volatility environment. What's been encouraging to me recently, you know, aside from the fact that we've seen those shot out of a cannon moves in the uh, like white hot AI names and and semis so, and mega caps. Uh, but what's been encouraging recently is that we have had that ATR start to come down. I have start to see individual stocks actually respecting, you know, moving averages and pivots a little bit better um, and showing some follow through, you know, granted recently it's been those shot out of a counter names that suddenly showed follow through like that Google chart I put up in the beginning. That is not your typical 2023 look, right? That is, that, that actually took off from a horizontal pivot and did not look back and is now consolidating. That is, that's more of like a 2020 look, right? Um, so that's telling me things may be starting to change as well, although in a very narrow section of the market. And what really encouraged me on Friday, just to make it applicable, is that we had that massive breadth expansion um, and seeing small caps and mid caps start moving. Um, that actually genuinely got me a little bit excited, even though I'm a very even keel person. But that is that is what you want to see without having... Without having follow through and rotation, um, you know, none of this, none of this is going to suit my style, right? So I think, you know, it was a very long winded answer, but I'm definitely looking at account feedback and I'm looking at very basic structural trends. Yeah, perfect. And 
one other thing that I completely agree on, on your points, account feedback, as well as the indexes, analyzing all of that. Uh, one other thing that I personally do, which people watching might find helpful, is I kind of keep a running list of, you know, the strongest stocks in the market, the leaders, uh, stocks that are trending above moving averages, performing well, showing momentum, breaking out. Uh, if that list is, you know, healthy, they're acting well, they continue to trend and, and perform uh, nicely. Um, you know, that, that's a sign that the environment is pretty decent, but if those stocks start, you know, breaking down, I have to take them off the list, that list starts shrinking. Uh, there's more volatility in there. There's a lot of gap downs on volume. That's feedback that, you know, for my style, the stock that I'm focused on those high momentum names that are trending and, and op offering opportunities. If the, if that list is getting smaller of potential trades, I know it's time to take a step back a little bit and, and, uh, use more of the defensive tactics. So that's one more thing, uh, one more, one more tactic that people can employ. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I yeah, think breadth is something, I think breadth is something that definitely fits in here, but yeah. I would also just, you know, I want I just would go back to, I don't want to label it bull or bear. I just want it to be the, the right environment. Right. And we, you can actually have poor breadth and still have a reasonably decent trading environment, depending on what your strategy is. Right. right. Um, but certainly having breadth expand is going to make it much more likely that at least you're going to start trending to the upside. There's no doubt about it. So um, the recent breadth expansion is, is encouraging. And we've all been looking at the charts. I mean, I don't even include any of them because they're just if you've been on Twitter for the past, I don't know, three months, you've seen seven billion breadth charts. Right. We all know the divergence in the spy, you know. Uh, forty percent of stocks were, you know, below or above their two hundred day moving averages, while the spy was actually um, making higher highs in price. So we've all seen that divergence, but it's, it's really the volatility is still coming down even with that divergence, which is what I find interesting. For sure. And you mentioned journaling a little bit, and obviously keeping track of your your recent performers, past three or four trades. Uh, do you what, what kind of metrics do you keep track of? Like, for instance, do you keep track of like? what your average gain has been over the past 20 trades over, over the past two months to get a sense of, you know, how on average things are working from your entry points or what, what in general would be your recommendations for people to start journaling if they don't, they don't do so already. Yeah. I mean, if you're not doing some certain, uh, some basic following some certain basic metrics, then I think you're really, you're, you're flying blind in terms of understanding your trading engine. And those would be average R for winners and average R for losers, mm -hmm. because that average R multiple has to be bigger for winners than losers, unless you have a 90% batting average, right? Which I would argue that very, 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 I don't want to say nobody, because somebody will come on here and be like, look at this. And here's my audited trading returns. I have a 90% batting average, right? Um, and somebody, somebody I'm sure does, right? But most human beings that are traders... 50%, 60%, right? So you have to have that average R bigger on the winners than on the average on your average loser. And if you're not paying attention to that, you're simply not understanding what you're doing. You're not understanding, you know, and, and that leads to expectancy, which is percent winners um, and percent losers using that average R, that, that average gain. Um, and it, it needs to be positive, right? That the average winner needs to be above the average loser. Uh, but I'm not tracking like past 20 days or anything like that. I said, I certainly look at my journal to see, um, you know, uh, I, I first of all key on trailing twelve months. Actually, I think year to date is useless until it's you know, until it's uh, December thirty first. You know, then then it makes sense. But I look at trailing twelve months, and I will start to I will try to see where have where have I had spots where things have been working, and then I honestly will try to correlate it to uh, an index chart and see was I pushing it here in a crappy environment or what was I doing right? And I'll right. dig into that. So that's one way I relate the journaling back to this is I will if I if I see historically a, a, a tough period. Was I doing something here? Or was was I pushing in a crappy environment? And I'll I'll look back on that. But I, really, I honestly I think in terms of journaling, average R winners, average R losers is like the absolute thing you have to do. And I will, I mean, you know, then filter it with swing and position trades, of course, because I want to see which type of style is, is performing better or, or worse. You can obviously put six million bells and whistles on it, but if you don't have those, you are flying blind in terms of uh, understanding your trading engine. Yeah, excellent. Uh, I think that's a great framework to, to, for people to get started with. Uh, there's a good question. Let me find it here. Um, let's see. Yeah, it's from Juan Ramirez. Um, what do you have to see to bail out a, out on a trade and maybe to take it a little bit, you know, a step further? What, how, how in general do you like to keep losses small? What, what tactics do you employ to make sure, you know, a loser isn't going to get out of control? So that is, I think that is going back to what I was talking about, which was one of the frequent questions that I get, which is 
you know, I'm interpreting how do you bail out on a trade, meaning cut a loser short. That's how I'm interpreting it because yeah. otherwise it will simply hit my stop and I'm out. There is no, I do not trade in a world where I don't play stops, right? I, I, my One of my mantras is never, ever, never, ever, never, ever, not ever cancel a stop. And then on Twitter, somebody will be like, but what if? No, not ever, never, never. Um, so there's never a world where I need to, I guess, bail out. So I'm interpreting that as cutting it early. Um, and that goes back to exactly what I was saying, which is, um, the decision is made beforehand. So what I need to see is the trade moving against me. It's as simple as that. The trade is moving against me and my strategy is defensive in nature. And what I'm going to do is keep my losses very tight. All I need to do is see it move against me and I'll cut it. Um, and then for me, it's around 0.2, 0.3 R. So when it starts to get a third of the way down to my stop loss, I'm done. And that that's very defensive, right? That is very defensive. That will absolutely lower your batting average um, and you will take more of those smaller hits. But it will keep my uh, losses uh, in uh, from hitting the one the R level. So if I have in 2022, this is exactly how I was profitable was by doing that. Um, and I also went short a decent amount of time, which which worked in 2022. But it was being very defensive like this. Um, so the decision is made beforehand. I'm not looking for anything other than price to reverse on me. And then I'm out. Um, and like I said, if I take three or four of those in a row, I'm done. And that equals that would equal one stop out at one R, right? So that's, this is a way to keep it all, uh, keep the math in gear and, and cut my losers short. And people sometimes ask me, so then why don't you just size the trade so that your stop is much closer? Because then the answer is you're going to take that full one R many, many, many times, right? So I'm, I'm sizing the trade to a normal stop level, but I'm cutting it if it's, if it doesn't behave the way I want it to very quickly. And it's, it's certainly not a style I like trading, but it has has improved that uh, trading engine math for me through 2022. Um, and now I'm honestly looking to get out of that uh, gradually. Yeah, excellent. Uh, there's a question. Let me find it here from Kip. Uh, considering the stock market environment analysis, uh, does Matt also take into account uh, the economic environment uh, and how much does that impact how he trades? I, I might know the answer to this, but uh, I think it's a good good thing to bring up. Um, it doesn't. I mean, look, I'm not going to pretend like I don't know. I'm not seeing what's going on out there. I mean, as like an informed human being, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I have an opinion like everybody else does. Um, and, but that opinion, I keep in a separate compartment in my brain, right? I'm, I'm reacting to price. Um, and frequently, this is something that I say frequently too. Frequently, if you are a price action trader, you are going to take trades that go against that inner Nostradamus voice that you have, you know, why were home builders suddenly running a couple? Well, what the hell was that about? You know, like, but if you're a price action trader, you're following it. You're not arguing with it and saying, well, right. but obviously the real estate industry is going to collapse and all this. So the answer is it's noise. It's noise for me. I'm not a macro guy. Um, intellectually, if you want to sit there and, and, and deal with it, I think it's, it can be intellectually stimulating to talk in macro world, but that's not how I trade. Um, I, that is, that is not my signal whatsoever. Um, yeah, I'm a price action trader. Yeah, excellent. Uh, and I think this is an interesting uh, question here from Joey, and it's kind of having to do with uh, individual setups. Uh, do you scientifically, in quotes, uh, measure performance of individual setups, both taken and passed on to track environment? Or is it just a general feel slash observation of your watch list? Um, so meaning, do I come up with like some sort of rigorous back testing and have like percentages, like, like 38% of descending wedges failed or anything like that? No, I do I, not. I think it might be more in real time. So, you know, you notice, um, downward trend line breaks working. So you keep track of that versus another type of setup. Like, oh, yes, 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 absolutely. So that's, that's one way to adapt right within the same strategy, because for me, I'm not a one setup trader. I know some people are. But I, you know, I have multiple setups that I'll use. Um, and in certain environments, you're going to go to different setups, right? I mean, I think we would all plainly agree that uh, since basically February of 2021, those basic base horizontal pivot trades are, are not not getting results, right? That Google was like, you know, a rarity right there, right? So yes, I will move towards much more towards the uh, like downtrend line setups and things like that, 100%. Uh, but it's all still within like the lexicon of my style. It's not like I'm, oh, I have to suddenly do this thing I've really never done before to adjust. I mean, there's, oh, I will just start taking more pullback plays if those start working better. You know, I think everybody does that to a certain extent, unless you are literally a one setup trader, in which case you've got one option and you better really listen to the feedback of that. But I think that's part of the adapting. Um, you know, I, I didn't enumerate that actually in the slide. So that's a good, that's a good point to bring up as part of adapting to this. 
Yeah, I think that's something I've noticed more and more. You know, there's kind of a, a, a technical theme that happens sometimes where a lot of the similar setups work together. Uh, a few weeks ago and maybe a month or so ago, uh, those earning gaps were just going and, and that was opportunity yep. for people like to trade those. So um, that's that's something I keep an eye on as well. So and, and Joey uh, clarified, yes, like real time performance of setups you're monitoring. Yeah, awesome. Uh, yep. Yeah, perfect. Uh, let's see from Scott. This is a good question. Um, since you mentioned that you will be very defensive and get stopped out uh, quite a bit, uh, would you please walk through your process for re-entering a trade after you have been stopped out? Yeah, if it sets up again, I'll get in it. If I've taken a small loss, I have no problem getting in it. That's another reason why cutting it short actually helps because if you take three one-hour losses in a trade, I mean, you're digging yourself a hole, right? So if I take some really, or if some really uh, quick, small paper cut losses, I'm happy to get right back into a trade. Um, so um, it, I have no problem doing that. And I think that that's something that, you know, a lot of people that, you know, I hate to say that a lot of people that are new um, struggle with, but I think that there are a lot of people that are new that struggle with it. Like it's either going to work or it's not, you know, in their, in, in their mind. Right. Especially if you are, if you really want to try to have like an algorithmic response to everything um, you're thinking, you're thinking in black and white. And sometimes it takes a, two or three tries to get into a, a stock, you know, and sometimes you're just not going to get in. <laughs> Right. So, um, but I, I have no problem if, if, especially if I know I'm already employing this kind of hyper defensive tactic, um, that's going to choke a trade off. I have no problem getting, getting back in if it sets up again and, and is, is in, in the same spot that, you know, I wanted to take it in the first place, as long as the setup has not changed. So, um, I think the answer here is just that I'm, I'm happy to revisit a proper asymmetric risk reward setup. As long as I've taken a small loss along the way, if, if I'm taking two or three one R losses, something's, something's not working right there. Right. So I, I think I'm actually more apt to re-enter a trade more when I have this defensive tactic going on. Yeah. And I saw a few questions about uh, your BPS terminology and how that compares to a percentage of equity. So maybe you could kind of clarify for that, you know, how, how that translates. Sure. It's, it's silly talk, right? <laughs> um, but it comes from the world of uh, we love our acronyms. It, right. It comes from the world of like Fed rate hikes and things like that. I mean, yeah. usually when you're talking about interest rate hikes, you're talking about in basis points, right? So 100 basis points is 1%, really. It's just as simple as that. 25 basis points is 0.25%. So if I say I'm taking a 100 basis point trade, it means I'm risking 1% of my total account value. So it's just, it's just silly talk, honestly, but it's something that I've just gotten very used to, but it is just a percentage, uh, a, a, a way of expressing percentages. Yeah, excellent. And um, a question I want to ask, just just because I think it's a, it's an interesting topic. Do you typically set your stops based on a technical level or just kind of a standard, um, you know, percentage drop from from your entry point? Yeah, I am definitely the technical level guy. So I do I do not do those flat like seven percent stops or eight percent stops. I want there to be a reason there. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, I am super visual. I'm chart oriented. Um, and if I, you know, I'm, I'm taking a trade for a reason, right? It's, a, it's that asymmetric risk reward. And there's a point where I'm wrong. There's, or at least there's a point where the setup that I'm trying to take is invalidated. It's wrong, right? I, I'm just, I was wrong either today in terms of timing or just wrong in general. Um, and that's where I want to be out. So usually it's like a day's low, previous day's low, sometimes moving average, key pivot level, et cetera. But there's a, it's a technical, a, definitely a technical uh, reason. But usually, um, especially when I'm swing trading, I will try to keep them tight. So I'm trying to find really tight uh, ways to enter because that, that's the, I think that's the best risk reward opportunity, right? So if I'm finding a, a trade that aligns with a technical level and that I can place a stop within two to 4%, then that's, that's definitely my sweet spot. And I saw you tweeted something that um, Ross Haber has, has nailed into you about something similar to that, where it's not a setup. If you don't have this tight kind of risk reward, I definitely, definitely, definitely resonate with that. I mean, that is definitely the way I operate. So technical level, but I am always looking for that technical level to line up with a pretty tight stop, um, based on the entry and, and stop. Yeah. He, he, the way he phrases it is he wants it to be tight and logical. So it's yeah, not perfect. It's, it's not just that you have a, a stop within a few percent it has to make sense for the setup in play. And if you're not able to align both those things, both tight and logical, it's likely not a setup, right? So yes, yeah. I love that. I love yeah. that because you don't just sit there and say, oh, I'm going to put a stop at 2%. That's to me, that's as useless as saying, I'm going to put a stop at 8%, right? It has to actually line up at the technical level, but I want to see it get pretty tight. Um, so yes, I love the way he says that. 
And uh, I'm sure uh, a few people will be wondering this. Uh, do you set your stop, you know, right at that level just below? And how do you deal with those algos who, who stop you out all the time? Um, see, I'm not a person that believes that like anybody's paying attention yeah. to what the hell I'm doing, even computers. Um, I'm not running $60 billion. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I, I mean, I would challenge somebody to figure out what I'm doing and like see what, see what my order flow is. But I do not, I'm not somebody that subscribes to that. I'm putting stops at a technical level. And if they get taken out, they get taken out. And that's that's the way it goes. I'm not trying to outsmart myself with stops. Yeah, perfect. And just a few more questions here. Um, oh, I, I wanted to ask this one. Uh, how quickly will you move your stop to break even to protect uh, your entry point? Uh, you may have touched on that uh, already, but uh, it'd be good to go over it again. I think. Yeah. So in in defensive posture, if I'm making if I'm making progress, even if I don't, my usual standard is I'll take a first partial at one to one point five R, and at that point I'll move my stop up. There can be exceptions to that, obviously, because I, I, the market doesn't care where the hell your break-even level is, and it, it's not always going to align with a good technical level. Um, so, in a, in a when I'm not being uh, defensive, I will give it a little bit more breathing room. But generally, on that first partial, when I take a take a partial at one to one point five R, more towards the one point five R range, uh, in the defensive posture. I don't care that I'm going to get chopped out. I'm not taking a loss. Like so, once I start making making progress, even if I'm up to 0.7 R, 0.8 R, stop goes to break even. If you want to cut me out, cut me out. Fine, I'll re-enter if I want to re-enter. But the idea is to not take a lot of losses and keep them very small. Um, and then so people will say, especially if you're cutting losses short, they'll be like, they'll say, well, well, you then you're taking a hundred small losses. The thing is, I'm not because if I have that rule where if I take a few in a row. I'm taking a break. I'm taking a break, right? So I'm I'm never going to get to the point where I'm taking like 30 small losses in a row because I'm just going to I'm just going to chill out. Yeah, excellent. I think that that'll be helpful for people. Uh, there's a few uh, questions in response to uh, how you set stops, um, asking if you take an ATR into account at all, uh, since sometimes a stock will have you know a one ATR of higher than 50 uh, BPS, uh, where just normal fluctuations might be might stop you out. Right. So I usually do not. Um, I usually do not. What I'm trying to do, honestly, um, especially, especially actually it's, it's weird. Cause when you get to the extremes of trying to be aggressive and the extremes of trying to be defensive, they, they start to actually mirror each other a little bit. Cause what I'm actually looking for in those moments is the stock to just move. I just want go. it to just move and yeah. I want to catch that. Right. And if that doesn't happen, then it's just, it's just, I consider it not happening. Right. But those are kind of like the extreme levels. So no, I don't use ATR because um, it, it frequently, if you use ATR with very volatile stocks, your stop, stop is going to be extremely wide. Um, and that's not what I'm doing. So um, if I'm playing like like something like AI, for instance, which I have not I have not participated in ever since it made one of these 33 percent up, 33 percent down moves in consecutive days. Um, but like you're never going to be able to do that. You're never going to be able to participate in a stock like that if you're doing that. I mean, that's an extreme example. Um, but what I'm trying to find is these inflection points where. You know, the stock is going to move. It's just going to move, you know, and the best trades that you I think the best trades, I think most traders would agree that the best trades they ever have are the ones that just move right out of the gate. So when I'm being particularly defensive or particularly aggressive, that's actually what I'm looking for. Um, and if it doesn't, I want to be out. Right. And then under let's call them more average circumstances, I will have a wider stop, but it's not based on ATR. It's always based on a technical level. Yeah, perfect. Uh, let's see if there are any other questions, questions coming in. Um, let's see, we'll just take one more, I think. All right, so this is a pretty good one here. Um, how have your trading metrics you have tracked changed over time? Have you simplified and reduced drastically over the years? So I think similar to your indicator, the, the maybe the journaling metrics is what he's referring to. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I'll do, uh, like, you know, like the performance of them or... I think uh, just the think? number of metrics and complexity. Gotcha, I think. gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Yeah. So yes, yeah, simplified. Um, so I do use trading software. Um, I used Excel for, I don't know, 20 years. And I'm I'm getting away from it. Um, and I have this this pretty robust Excel journal built out. And I still do. Um, but And and what what I liked about that was I would track partials. So I'm, I'm tracking the partials and, and seeing where I'm taking partials and things like that. But I have really simplified it to just what I was saying. Like, uh, like at the top of my trading journal is just that average R for winners, average R for losers. And it, and I know very quickly if that's trending in the wrong direction or not. And that is the that is the entire bottom line of of my business. You know, um, so that's really what I focus on. But I do find it helpful to filter based on different ways that you're trading. I mean, 
this, the position trading versus swing trading, I definitely filter on that because those are those are two different ways of trading. Um, and I absolutely filter um, option trading versus equity trading because those are two very different ways of trading. So I, you know, I want to key on those differences in terms of being able to filter through them. But other than that, it's really basic. I don't I don't use all the bells and whistles of some of the you know some of the trading software programs. They're awesome, but I definitely don't use all of that, especially the ones that actually forecast. I don't even think I. I don't think I'm even on board with that necessarily, but um, my point is, I I think my answer is that just about everything I do with trading becomes really simple. Um, and there's a difference between simple and simplistic, right? Simplistic means you're you're ignoring the complexity of the issue and making something just overly simple. But simple, I'm trying to capture what I really think is important with some simple some simple things. Yeah, perfect. And uh, one last question having to do with stops. Uh, do you typically set them using? Uh, daily levels, or do you sometimes go intraday just to keep it a little bit tighter? What, what, what do you like to do? Um, I, I will do intraday levels, um, but I'm also, uh, you know, I, it's like a, if you've got a candlestick, um, I use candlesticks. It's like if you're, if you were thinking of entering on the day's low, but that day's low is a wick, maybe I'll enter before the, the body of that candle, you know? Right. Um, so things like that. So I'm not, I'm not digging into like a five minute chart necessarily. Uh, but I'm looking at ways to enter a candle. For instance, like if there's a if there's a uh, you know big high range candle or something like that. Well, I usually wouldn't enter in a high range candle. But if there's a candle that has a, that's like all body and no wick, I might decide, hey, if this reverts it reverses back through that candle halfway, I'm out. You know, so I'll put a stop halfway through that candle. So it's not really going into a five minute chart, but it's using you know that daily candle um, and thinking of ways to kind of parse it, if that makes sense. Yeah, 100. Um... percent yeah, perfect. Uh, Matt, this has been really great. I, I think uh, it's helped a lot of people watching uh, clarify some parts of their system. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, where can people learn more from you? And uh, do you have any other recommended resources um, or any last words for people watching? Um, to learn more about me, these these things up here on this last slide uh, on Twitter, I'm on um, at the equilibrium. Um, so I'm, I'm usually spouting off about risk management and things like that on there. Um, also I did an interview with you, um, that I, <laughs> a lot of people have watched this on your website. If you want to hear more about that, there's an interview with me on Richard's YouTube website. Um, and you can check out my site, which is trading equilibrium. Um, that says a little bit more about me, but it is also where my uh, service and course live. Um, and those are ways to learn more about me as well. Yeah, fantastic. Well, Matt, thanks again uh, so much for taking the time for putting this together. I, I think it will help a lot of people. Uh, to everybody watching, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please go ahead and leave a like down below if you're enjoying uh, the conference and stream so far. We would really appreciate it. And of course, subscribe if you haven't yet. And definitely go ahead and check, check out uh, Matt's links right there. So with that, uh, we'll be back in just a few minutes uh, with Denise Scholl and the Rethink Group uh, coming back to the topic of training psychology definitely going to be a really helpful presentation and fireside chat. So we'll be back in just a few minutes. Take care.
All right, welcome back everybody. It's great to see you guys here once again uh, for our next event presentation. We're really excited to be shaking things up a little bit and uh, hosting a fireside chat on training psychology and performance uh, with members of the Rethink Group. Uh, we're really excited to have them, uh, Denise Scholl, uh, John Burns, and Evan Marks. And uh, if you're not familiar with the Rethink Group, they work with institutional traders, uh, professional athletes, as well as other high performers uh, to work on uh, decision making as well as improve results. So thank you guys all for being here and I'm excited for this. Thanks so much for being a part well. of this. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Happy to be here. Great, great. And to start things up, uh, start things off, Denise, I know you wanted to cover this. I think it's a great place uh, to kind of open things up. Um, how has your understanding of trading slash risk perception changed over time? <laughs> um, Big question. Yeah, well, back when I first started trading, whatever year that was, 1994, I mean, I unexpectedly fell in love with it. I didn't realize how psychological it was. You know, I was like sort of searching for like the system. I worked in a shop that was kind of mean reverting, buy a value stock, expect it to go to like its resistance, you know. That didn't actually really make sense to me watching markets because I would notice that groups would move together. So I spent all kinds of time reading, you know, all the psychology books back then. I, I used to laugh at myself. I was single and 30 and I would go home and read trading psychology books on Friday night instead of going out. But there was something about it that never, like, I was like, is it me? Like, that just didn't completely jive. Well, it's a long story that I won't go into, but randomly I ended up being in a position to find out that the latest research, and by this time it's 2003 or so, had shown we cannot make decisions without emotion. And I was like, well, damn, every single paragraph I read that said take the emotion out of it was actually technically wrong because number one, you can, and number two, if you could, you couldn't decide. So fast forward, 20 years. Now it's not just that we don't decide on our analysis. We decide on how we feel about our analysis. We really decide on how we're going to expect to feel as our predictions play out. So what that means in broad terms, you're looking at a trade, you're thinking, you know, it matches your criteria. You should take it. What you're really doing is saying, I think I will feel safe and be happy and be pleased in the future. Mm -hmm. Once you start to understand that about, that is human perception and judgment. I expect to feel safe or unsafe, good or bad, and then all sorts of obviously more nuanced feelings in the future. You start to be able to do amazing things with human beings because you're actually working with the system the way it actually works. And forgive me for this grandiose comment, but I've made it a million times and I'll make it again. I feel like it's as big a change as when most people thought the earth was flat and figured out it was round and that they could sail around it. So therefore they could like find places and ultimately get back home. It's that level of change. Mm -hmm. We think, perceive and judge in a completely different way than we've been told for right. at least 400 years and probably more like 4,000 years. Yeah, very cool. And on that note. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, that's excellent. And um, John and Evan, I want to bring you guys both uh, into the mix and and talk about, you know, your guys' journey to, to understanding and working with training psychology. I understand that you're both professional traders and former and currently working as consultants. Uh, how did you guys get involved with this and and how, how has it kind of changed your perception about trading? And uh, John, we'll start with you. Yeah. Okay, great. So, um... I started looking at mental skills, uh, really to help my golf game initially. And so I read a lot of stuff about mental skills and um, more, the person that worked with uh, Evan Arkiev and, you know, Bob Rotella, uh, with a, he's a golf guy. And I read all sorts of books about mental performance. And that kind of brought me into the realm of looking at trading mental performance. And that's how I found Denise. And so I started listening to webinars back when Denise did webinars and then work with Denise um, in a one-on-one -on -one setting for a while and some groups as well, way back when. And it started to become obvious to me that I was really good at using my anger on the trading floor. And when I started to 
kind of transition off the trading floor and actually in golf as well, it turns out it doesn't work as well um, because there's this idea that, you know, if, if you slam your club and say profanity uh, on the golf course, people look at you a little bit differently on the trading floor. It was like, you kind of look like, yeah. all right, what's wrong with this guy? Yeah. Let's move on. Um, and so that, that judgment guilt that I felt helped, made me less able to use this idea of letting feelings flow through me. And so as I started to understand that my trading started to develop and change, I started to notice patterns of thoughts and behavior. Um, I started to understand that I had this intuitive side that Denise helped me cultivate and actually pointed out to me over time. And so again, I, I, I love this stuff. I could talk about this stuff forever. Um, but I'll, I'll kind of wrap it up there. Yeah, that's great. Um, I was a division one athlete. And so, you know, the mental side of sports was huge, right? If you were scared weakness, if you were nervous, it would show on the field, all these incredible things, but that's how we trained. You know, I started in Wall Street, ironically, in 94. And I was, I was blessed with having some great coaches. One of them at that time was Ari Kiev, right? And obviously, what Denise does, what didn't exist really. So, you know, we had a philosophy of do the work, get bigger and get paid. That was it. The more you worked, the more money you ran, the better you do. So that was it. You know, that was the philosophy back then. Everybody, you know, from Steve Cohen used them to then we used them and everybody did it. So obviously it's going to work. But what happened over, you know, I, I spent about managing money for about 25 plus years on Wall Street. Even though my performance was pretty good, there was something missing. Like I would repeat the same mistakes. I'm like, where's that coming from? And so finally, obviously, I was in some sort of pickle. I said, I, I, need, I have to go down a different route. So somebody recommended Denise Scholl. And she, the first question she asked me, and obviously I was in a hole. She goes, well, how are you feeling? What kind of feelings does that mean? Like, what does it bring up? I go, What? <laughs> I said, I don't have time for this. we got to start rocking and rolling immediately. And then as we started to, you know, discuss things, you know, when I, when I played sports in college, I blew up my knees twice and I couldn't perform like I used to. And I had an identical twin brother who became captain. And I'm like, hey, whatever, it happens. Or the way I was raised, I didn't really think about it because I didn't think it really mattered, but it did. So as we started discussing things, I was obviously extremely uncomfortable talking about this. And then all of a sudden, like, I'm like, maybe this makes sense. Maybe this path is the path. And I obviously got out of the hole. So I became a huge believer. And but I realized, though, as things were, were, were getting better and I was my progress was there, I realized I had to double up on this, that this wasn't a one off. This actually meant something. So Denise and I worked for a long time and I, you know, I was on trading for on my whole career. And then I, you know, I remember being with my brother in Italy and I'm saying, Steve, I'm done. He said, what do you mean done? I'm done with trading. He goes, what are you talking about? You're doing well. I said, uh, uh I said, I'm telling you, this Denise Show lady is onto something. And I, and I, this is my next stage in life. So I sold my fun in 26, 2017 and I started coaching. I've never been more afraid of my life. Failure. And Denise's like, what's well, it right to be feel failure, you know, to feel nervous and scared. I go, that's right. It is. And so now, now I think it's been five years. Obviously, it's an incredible journey of mine, and, and I've enjoyed it, and I enjoy it tremendously. But what happens is when we use the Shul method, and 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 what obviously Denise has taught us, and we've gone back to school and we've done this, and people's eyes in the beginning are like, like everybody's skeptical, but when it starts to Click. connect. It's such a different thing where people could be honest with themselves and actually say how they feel. And what happens is the behavior starts to change, right? Behavior starts changes before feelings, and then it starts to click. Even if you're 30, 40, 50, it's a new way to look at things. And it is, I mean, obviously I'm going to say it's incredible because I love what I do, but it really was just this shift. And when I would deal with clients around the world, and like you said, athletes and CEOs and Wall Street, the common denominator is, is feelings. Like these guys all make high risk decisions. 
in all these different industries and obviously sports. And when it does connect, I mean, it's incredible, right? And that's and that's what we do. So it's, it's it is it is pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, perfect. And I obviously love it. <laughs> yeah. yeah <for> sure. <laughs> and you mentioned there, you know, first coming to Denise and and starting to to learn and ask those questions. What does a new client experience kind of look like? What are the first uh, questions that you ask them to try to dive deeper and, and get into their feelings and help them understand it? And what are the first maybe few exercises that you have them go through to try to dive deeper and understand how they're feeling and, and try to, you know, start the process of learning to, to experience that? And, and uh, we, we can start with anybody, but if anybody wants to jump in, uh, you can go ahead. I'll start. I, yeah, I, I literally had a new client two hours ago. Now, this is a person in a firm that I've worked with for four years. But um, I said, hey, I hate to do this to you because it's not an interview, but I'm going to ask you that, like, tell me about yourself question. Now, some people, you know, tell you they started this job six months ago and before they were at Citadel. You know? <laughs> and that's all. The, and I live in New York City. This person like started with when I was five. Um, mm -hmm. So that was actually super interesting. Um, and then in this case, I said, not knowing if they knew what they were getting into because most people call us. So they've heard us speak. So they've heard us talk about like, you know, you're going to talk about your emotions. You know, we're going to try to make your unconscious conscious. But someone like this, who it was assigned to, I started to talk about like, you don't make decisions on the analysis. You make decisions on how you feel about the analysis. And this was a long short equity person. So they use conviction. Conviction is a feeling. I'm like, how do you think about conviction? What is it? Um, so they couldn't answer that question, which is so funny. I find that so often, like a word that is constantly used, people who use it can't really define it or describe it. So, you know, I went through the, you're predicting a future feeling. And, and so then they said, it all makes sense to me intuitively, but like, I can't figure out how to apply it. And I said, well, tell me a stock you're thinking about. So we just went through this stock that they are very, um, convinced on on a long-term fundamental basis, but like it actually is a very recession or not recession oriented stock. So while they're typically long short equity and not thinking about the global macro environment, in this case, they need to make this decision on the global macro environment. Is the US going into recession or not? What are interest rates doing in the US? So then we started to work through there. Like I said, well, I think that sounds like you're worried. You know, so I put the feeling word, I gave them the feeling word. Mm -hmm. And so then I asked, like, was that, are you just doubtful? Or I don't think you're panicked, but like I tried to offer up possible emotions to see if, and they were like, yeah, that's exactly right. I said, so on one hand, you're confident, convicted. And on the other hand, you're worried. And the trick is you have to decide which one you're going to act on or gain the ability to just tolerate both and wait. And so then when we hung up, they were like, yeah, yeah, this makes complete sense. And they could see that like they had this confidence, but they don't have the confidence in the recession data to actually make the decision. And the irony of them seeing that they were afraid and conflicted is they're more comfortable waiting. Where before it was like one day I should do it, next day I should, you know, you're back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and you're not really sure because you're trying to analyze the data. You're not looking at what your feelings are telling you. So that I left them with the homework of write down all the emotions they can think of of trading and investing, which is a piece of homework I often give. Um, yeah, I, I was going to ask. It seems like it's really important to give them the vocabulary to under to the, the worry versus confident. And yeah, how important is it to to give them that language to be able to express how they're feeling? It, it seems like that that's pretty essential. Well, I'll let John and Evan jump in in a moment, yeah. but let me just say, like, the overall skill is called emotion differentiation and emotion granularity. Differentiation means you can tell the difference between like fear and frustration. Granularity is you can tell the difference between doubtful and panicked, you know, in the category of fear or annoyed or enraged, you know. There's all kinds of research showing that the greater your ability to differentiate emotions and to be granular improves your decision-making, particularly in markets. Like people find that shocking. But I tell my professional portfolio managers all the time, because I end up quoting this, the more a portfolio manager can differentiate amongst their negative emotions, the higher their returns. That's a quote from, an, from a study. 
So they're like, wow, you know, it really the exact opposite they've been taught, right? Set all that side aside. So I'm John and Evan, I don't know, you know, John and Evan, while they work the Shell method and, and work for Rethink, you know, everybody's got their own style. So they don't necessarily start out with a client exactly like I do. I, I generally do. I, I ask about their history because again, they come to us understanding that emotions and history are part of what we do. And same thing, some people <laughs> tell you a lot, some people tell you a little, but to us, it's information about, okay, this is really interesting. And the other thing that we do is, is you know, the feelings and thoughts that come up when a client is explaining things to us is, again, more information for us to kind of develop questions from. And so what, what I, the, the frame I kind of think about it generally in is that I'm listening for patterns of thoughts and behavior to kind of have areas to focus on. And then once we find those areas, ask questions to try to get the kind of granularity and differentiation in the language in there. Some people are really ready for it. Some people are not ready for it. So the people who aren't ready for it, we talk about thoughts a lot. And eventually the feelings start to seep their way in naturally when they're ready. Um, I found in my experience that if I push on that, like sometimes I get super excited when somebody's explaining stuff and they're really doing a good job and I lean into it, that um, that sometimes isn't the right approach. And so again, it's, it's about the back and forth with the client, trying to help them clarify what they think about the market based on their beliefs, perceptions from the past and the present and understanding that those are components of the prediction for the future. And so um, again, some of the homework, I, I like the homework of cultivating the intuition. And so one of the things that I ask my clients to do is, hey, those random thoughts, collect those. Because I believe over time, a pattern emerges if we collect them and like intuition, a random thought, which I think is kind of an intuitive thing, kind of dissipates. It's like a breeze, it kind of goes away. If we grab onto it, we can get it. It's almost like a dream for those of us who have dreams. We all have dreams, but I don't very, remember them very well. So, you know, that dream that you have and you just, it's on the tip of your tongue, but you can't really get it. But if you think about it right when you wake up and write it down, it's yours. I believe these random thoughts have the same effect. And so that's why I like to, to assign one of the, that's one of the homeworks I assign. And just a follow up question uh, before Evan, sorry. Um, so these random thoughts, is that when you're looking through charts and trying to find trades and, and analyzing stuff you've done? When would you collect the, those random thoughts? Typically when you're brushing your teeth, taking a shower, walking the dog, you know. Anytime. I, yeah, yes, but any, usually anytime when you're away. The thoughts that come up at the chart, you know, when you're very accomplished, like those of us here are, there's information in that. I think initially a lot of that's the grind of the impulse intuition battle. And so I think it's initially it's less helpful when you're looking at a chart, those rant, those feelings that come up, but a way when you, for example, Denise, I had this experience with Denise. I was taking the train home and I said, you know, I had this idea about the British pound and I didn't trade the British pound that day. I traded the British pound fairly frequently, but I didn't that day or the previous weeks. And Denise said, you know, maybe that means something. And so I thought about it. I thought, this is crazy. It's just guessing. And she said, well, maybe just track it. And sure enough, now, again, I wasn't in the trade, so I don't know about stops and everything, but I'm pretty realistic when I think about that stuff. So I went and looked and said, if I would have done X, I know what my risk level is. It would have been okay. Now, when do you get out? But my point is she helped me realize that that random thought meant something. And so right. then I started to say, huh, I'm having a thought about X. Maybe that means something as well. And again, it's this testing, 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 testing. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and Evan, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. How, how do you kind of start off with clients and are there any well, exercises well, that you'd like to do? Mm -hmm. You know, to start, Richard, you know, when people come to us, they think it's about one leaf on the tree and it's never about the leaf. They think it's about something. It's never about that. Right. So, you know, it's our job to explore actually what are the roots 
you know, because we, you know, we repeat different, ex we repeat experience and we think they're different, but they're the same experience. Maybe they look different, but they're not. So usually my first question is why now? Why are you coming to coaching now? And it's a, it's a beautiful open-ended question because they get to think and, and it starts a conversation. Right. You know, a lot of the times, you know, I think our Nick, you know, we're not in a positive psychology camp. You know, we're in the camp that negative emotions have intensity and power. So when we say, I don't want to feel angry, I don't want to have rage, I don't want to feel nervous. My question, why not? What's wrong with those? Do what do you mean? I don't, I don't want to feel this way. I don't want to feel ashamed. Why not? I said, those are good feelings. And usually people are like, what are you talking about? You remember, like when we have anger and rage and nervousness and doubt, when I speak to them, those are phenomenal feelings. The question is, how do we use them? Right? We all have felt ashamed, embarrassed, angry, or whatever. Why are they negative? So once we understand that and give clients permission to feel any way they want, remember, we all, what we do is everybody builds their own personal dictionary. You know, Rich, what nervous means to me may be different to you, mm -hmm. right? When I traded, nervousness was my key. And I, I love that feeling. It was, it was how I focused. So, you know, over the course of a coaching, you know, as we coach clients, giving people permission and not judging and let them explain themselves is a very freeing feeling. You know, we were modern psychoanalysis meets neuroscience. But when people feel heard and listened to, it develops that incredible relationship and trust with the coach. So through that talking through things, we realize, you know, often a lot of people know what to do, right? They've been successful. The question is, what's holding me back? And oftentimes they have no clue. And that's through questions and exploring that. And when that connects, obviously, it's a very crucial point, which is very, which is very positive. You know, research has shown that you know, it's, I think it's, I think it's a Harvard piece that a lot of people come to us, they ask, when am I going to see results? And I say, I have no clue. It must drive them nuts. Because when we're outcome focused, result driven, it significantly diminishes our skill set, i.e. process. And I think once people start to understand that, and 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 believe it and you know like i said progress is elusive but once they're able to do it it's, it's really incredible so you know a couple of things i do which is a little unorthodox is most of my clients take cold showers in the morning i've been doing it for 15 years so people are like what's got to do with trading i don't want to take a cold shower what it does is it, it it's doing something you don't want to do because it's uncomfortable but what it is is it's changing your behavior to do it and we all know the neurological benefits and all these gorgeous things. And that's important. And the second exercise I have them do is pause. You're like, what do you mean I got to pause? Like Denise said earlier, our goal is to make the unconscious conscious. And oftentimes we have a trigger, the triggers are unconscious, and we immediately go to reaction and action. But in that middle is behavior decision making. You can call it freedom, present, whatever you want. But if you're able to pause, which, which is something that's conscious, and then able to decide for what's better for Evan, John, Richard, Denise, usually that outcome and that behavior is a choice that is for today, not from the past. And being able to train that, obviously the first thing is remembering to do it, and then pause, just pause. That's an incredible skill set to build. So I often start with those sort of things because it's not, they haven't done it and it's very uncomfortable. And I love being uncomfortable, even as cliche as that sounds, but it starts to build something. Mm -hmm. And it, and and that's kind of where I begin. Obviously I want to know who my guys are and my I want to know my clients, guys and girls. And that's extremely important and where they're starting from. So that's how I start these things. And th those pauses, Again, is that something that you'd recommend them do just kind of throughout the day? Or is that also during the trading day, you know, right before the open, right before they're going to have to make decisions, just kind of recenter themselves and, again, the right frame of mind? But, you know, like, you know, everything we do is connected, mm -hmm. right? How you speak to your partner, how you react to your children. It all plays a role. It's not inconsequential. So when, when if somebody 
comes at you or affects you emotionally to pause and then make that decision. When you're trading, something that's coming to a level and you're scared, like I'm scared, let me pause for a second. Right, that's invaluable. Because it makes you, you know, like we talk about, you know, you're always, you know, traders, you know, that's why I like people standing up, always in fight or flight, right? So we make decisions like that. Now, obviously fight or flight's important when obviously saber tooth tigers and it's life or death, but to move your sympathetic to your parasympathetic, just to pause for a second is a place to make incredible decisions that are advantageous to you. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. But yeah. It, Pause all the time is his answer. All the time, all the time. is his actually. All the time. Mm -hmm. Pausing is yeah. awesome. <laughs> right? If you think about it, you know, Richard, you know, any situation, if you're able to pause and not be a slave to your feelings and emotions, but actually, control, you know, because we can't control feelings. We're going to feel the way we feel. But we sure as hell can control our behavior. And that's extremely important and extremely empowering. And that takes a lot of repetition. That's okay. actually the whole yeah. thing in like all of trading psychology is control your emotions, control your emotions, control your emotions. It's it's literally, aside from all the other things that are wrong with it, it's a logical fallacy. Mm -hmm. And when I was first trading on a trading desk in Chicago, upstairs from the options exchange, I was reading all this control your emotions, control your emotions. I was in this trading program, control your emotions, control your emotions, make these analytical probabilistic mm -hmm. decisions. And there was a guy in the office who had been covered in Forbes or Fortune during the 87 financial crisis and he was day trading upstairs with me and that guy would jump up and down <laughs> screaming you know every four letter word you can hear of all of the time and he printed money mm -hmm. there was a guy in front of me that made money scalping at that time eight but he didn't make anywhere near as much money as steve and i was like steve is like maybe the most most emotional guy i've ever seen so like how does this fit together the logic, you literally only have to control your actions. It didn't matter that Steve had all these passionate reactions every which way from Sunday. Like he was making the choice that made him money most of the time. So it was, it, it, his actions were controlled enough to make him a lot of money. He was wildly, he still may be one of the most emotional people I've ever met. So there's this, this fundamental logical fallacy that's not true. You have to control your behavior to help you get what you want. Now it's neuroscientifically shown that if you could take the emotion out of it, you would not be able to make a decision. So like, what's the point? <laughs> right, feelings have never lost your money, behavior has, right. as we like to say. Pretty and interesting. And, and, and I believe everybody has a set level of arousal, a range at least. And so for me, I'm a little bit more excitable, even though I, try to control my emotions and be more stoic. And so I realize that my go-to when I start to get nervous is either to be super intense, screaming and yelling, or super reserved. And so uh, for me, neither one works. I need to find a, a level where I like, like Evan said, I like being nervous. I like being my hand shaking a little bit, my voice fluttering a little bit, my ears are red. Like I know all of my physiological reactions for that kind of state where I'm ready to go to battle. And some people are more reserved and calm and, and they have, you know, a level set. If I'm, if I'm a seven to nine on the one to 10 scale, some people are two to four and that's okay. We just need to understand that's individual fingerprint of, kind of arousal and and like what was said by both Denise and Evan that you know it's not the emotion the the reaction to the emotion it's letting the emotion flow through us give us the information that it needs to give us right. and try to make the best decision with that pause that Evan was talking about so yeah right and feelings of data right it's it's you know yeah. like John said earlier you know we're in the emotional recognition game not the not the technical pattern game so these words mean something. So don't shelve them. I mean, these are this this is data. Let's use it. What I'm always saying to my clients is answer the question, what am I feeling and why am I feeling it? Now, it's an easy question for me to say, and it's an easy question for you to basically comprehend, then try to do it. <laughs> it gets really hard to 
at, to answer and then get the feeling that the answer is correct. Like the what, you know, is it frustration or disappointment? I spend a lot of time with professional hedge fund managers literally sorting through, well, no, it's like regret. Well, but no, I'm just kind of embarrassed. Well, no, I'm afraid that like, you know, and like getting the what right. And then the why, which is usually, you think it's one thing and it's like two or three layers below it, really. And that two or three layers below is going to be some prediction about your future safety. And I use that word to encompass a lot of feelings like embarrassment, regret, proud of what you do, able to, you know, but it's a real skill. Like that's what I ask people to do. That's my pause, if you will. It's a skill to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's like a playing golf skill. Like it's that sort of fine motor, like aware of where the club head is, what your hips are doing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, and it takes, you just got to work it. But I will tell you this, like, because you're then working with the way the human brain really does work, it's easier than it, it's hard, but it's also easier than it sounds. Like if you're willing to change your opinion of your emotions and you're willing to find the accurate answers to those questions, in your pause, like you will move forward because you've now are sailing around a world that curves, like, and the curve's gonna be there to support you. Like the way the brain works is gonna be there to support you. So what you're gonna find is you can tolerate anxiety in a trade way better than you could before. Mm -hmm. You can tolerate the combination of confidence and worry way better than you could before. So you're sure this is gonna work. You're worried you're missing something. You think you should be bigger. You're always having trouble getting as big as you plan to get. You can just do it. You find that you can do it because you can lean on the confidence and tolerate the anxiety. When you understand that's what it is and you have to John's point, a bigger understanding of what your patterns are, like what tends to make you nervous maybe where that comes from, which is usually someone's personal history. I mean, there's always things in the moment, but it always tracks back to your self-image. And at the end of the day, you're making decisions on your feelings about the market versus your feelings about yourself. Because you know which feelings you have, where they're coming from. You've paused, you've done the work to talk about them and think about them outside of the market. You've gathered some ability to realize, wait, my intuition is information by tracking it over time. Just and I think, Denise, what you said is so important. The, 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 the skill of asking questions, right? How am I feeling? Why am I feeling nervous? Why am I trading? What am I trying to accomplish here? And that, you know, when we said pause, that's, that's, it's, that's the pause also. Asking yourself a question stops the unconscious quickly. And it's just a question you ask yourself. And the skill set is asking, you know, my question could be different than John's and these could be different than yours, Richard, whatever resonates with you. But asking that question, and I still do it, even though I'm not managing money actively, I manage my own, but I still do it. I still speak out loud. My kids probably think I'm schizophrenic, but it is what it is. But I still ask these questions. Mm -hmm. And it's important to do that. Well, it's an introspective mindset. That's right. really what we're talking about. Exactly. That it's like, I mean, for me, it's my default. Anything happens to me and I'm like, okay, <laughs> what exactly am I feeling? Why am I feeling it? Like, and sometimes I struggle to actually figure it out. Um, but it's like a mindset. I mean, to me, it's my meditative mindset where my default is to pause and try to understand what the feelings are and where they're coming from before I make a decision or before I take a choice. choose. Markets are not markets. Um, by the way, the flip side of this, the better you get at it, the more you know intuition or unconscious pattern recognition just like that. You like look at some set of data in the markets that you know, that you're familiar with, and you can have those moments where you go, you know what, I know that's that, I'm putting the trade on. It might look impulsive to the outside person, but you've done all this work, you know, so it's akin to take the, you know, the basketball player taking the shot when they see they have the shot, mm -hmm. like maybe earlier than you would think they need it, you know, or earlier you would think that you need it because you're able over time 
to calm down the irrelevant feelings about yourself and hold them. And that leaves you with more feelings of expertise. Takes you, time. It takes time. Long but time. also, by on the other hand, a lot of the professionals, so they've you know, they've been successful enough in the market that they've been given a hedge fund to manage. When they say, if I ask them why now to Evan's question, they'd say, Well, I want to hone my intuition. You know, hedge fund manager after hedge fund manager after hedge fund manager from all the places you've heard of call up and say, I want to hone my intuition. Why? Like, why should a professional at that look? Because they know. I mean, Stanley Druckermiller is a famous investor. A week or two ago, he said, if I have intuition, I put the trade on and then I do the work. Like, Druckermiller is famous for, you know, his success. Mm -hmm. But you got to know what true intuition feels like. And you can only do that if you practice with the data set in some sort of organized way. But I think what's also important, you know, for people just starting out, you know, trading and intuition it is experience, right? Recognizing things. But I think we all know impulsivity well. You know, sometimes early impulsivity is a much stronger feeling than intuition. You know, people are chasing intuition, but you better know what impulsivity feels like. You know, knowing what not to do, kind of let intuition will start to come a little bit. Exactly. Right? Because, you know, what is it? It's a addition by subtraction. Impulsivity is a strong feeling. So being able, you know, like Denise says, if we get um, get rid of 25% of those trades that didn't work, obviously, quantitative, I mean, quali you know, quantitatively, it works better. But impulsivity, you know, is a, is a beautiful thing if you can pick up on it and just step back for a second. Because we all have it. Right. And then I think through the experience, intuition comes. But sometimes the first thing people who start out doing this have to understand what impulsivity feels like of when not to make decisions. And that is my experience. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead, John. No, just to, to, to belabor this point a little bit more. <laughs> um, I think that uh, there's a paradox in this moment of discovering intuition and comparing it to impulse. And the paradox is that once we start to develop that impulse initial, or excuse me, the intuit intuitive feelings initially, uh, I think of it in sound, like the sound and the feeling of the intuition increases to almost a similar level as the impulsive sound. It feels different, but it sounds the same. And so there's that paradox that I experienced of, what is it? What is it? What is it? And after I was wrong for a lot of times, I started to understand of, oh, okay, if I just back to the pausing, if I just wait a second, the impulse will continue to nag me. I had this process where I would cycle through my charts, I would get an intuitive feel, and I would cycle through again, remember what market that was. And if the intuitive feel came back, I looked into it. And so it it initially for traders with not a lot of experience, this 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 paradox is is loud and 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 could be dangerous. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. I always put that caveat out there for this because mm -hmm. we all want that. We all want to be Stanley Druckenmiller, but most of us aren't, and so we have to be careful. <laughs> well, a lot more of us are than realize, though. Like right. this, yeah. just the statistics on trading are as bad as they are because people have the wrong mm -hmm. model of the brain. True. So like impulses, sis, that word, impulses come from the fact that you're trying to do everything cognitively, where your brain is trying to use your feelings. So true. And so you try to use your brain to control those feelings and your psyche is going to win. So then you do the thing you said you wouldn't do. Mm. You add to the loser, you hold on to the loser because you're acting out this feeling that you think you're not supposed to have, that you don't know you have, that you're trying to control so like literally the easiest way to start to control your impulsivity is to just listen to all your feelings. Because if you listen to them and put them into words, just the chances, if you know nothing else, the chances that you need to act out a feeling in an impulsive trade go down. And so then you don't take that, you know, you might've taken four impulsive trades in a day and now you only take one. Well, what do you do with the space and time of the three that you didn't take? 
you can see the market better. You're not working through the frustration of losing the money or being mad at yourself. Like you're literally increasing your productivity just by putting the feeling into words instead of automatically doing it while you were trying to control it. And you preserve mental capital. Right. And we'll build it even, you know, oh, and then you start to be able to have more build, trust. Build. Yeah. But it's a skill. I mean, generally intuition is like, there's this sense of recognition. And impulsivity is this sense that you must do something. In broad strokes, you know, impulsivity has some urgency. I got to do, do, do. And intuition is more like, oh, gee, I just know what's going on there. I may do or not do, but I do know what's going on. Right. And yeah, this, this is really great. And getting back to, you know, the important thing is recognizing the emotions you're feeling and going back of what John said a while ago um, about the, the physical manifestations of what he's feeling, noticing, you know, he's, he's, he's like, uh, his leg is going up and down, you know, he, he's sweating a little bit. What, uh, just as examples, what exercises can help people find the physical manifestations of the levels of emotions they're feeling and be able to to represent it on a granular enough level that you're able to you know segment out frustration versus anger all those different different things deciding to pay attention for one mm -hmm. like just be have the courage to be honest with yourself you know when i get nervous my hands get sweaty being okay with I'm, it yeah, yeah being okay with it I tweeted yesterday that like one of the secrets to transformation is to not judge your feelings. That wasn't exactly how I put it, but I, lots of times my tweets are a reaction to a, a client session. So this is a client I've been working with for just a couple of months and they're getting the idea, just put my feelings into words, think about my, you just have my feelings. And so they were telling me about a situation where they had presented a stock to an investment company or investment committee. And then they were asked questions and they felt like they didn't ask, answer the questions very well. And they were really, really beating themselves up. And they're like, they couldn't stop thinking about it. But when they described it, they're like, I put all the feelings into words, you know, like I was mad at myself. I was embarrassed. Like I was afraid they would think I was stupid, blah, 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 blah. But what they said was, and I was telling myself, that's ridiculous. They don't really care. Like they were giving themselves all these reasons why they shouldn't have the feeling. They were using their cognition to denigrate, judge, dismiss the feeling. I'm like, that's where you went wrong. It went on way longer than it needed to because you didn't just accept the feeling. Like, and try to learn, like, maybe what you could have done differently. John? No, sorry. I, I was just going to say, I have a sophomore example of this that I had when I, I was going to play golf with some friends and, and some people I didn't know and, and, we were at a place that I love. And so I was excited to play the golf course with this guy who is an agent for some athletes. I was excited to play with him and my hands were shaking. Literally they were shaking on the putting green. And I said, Hey guys, look at this. My hands are shaking rather than, rather than try to hide it and say, this is a meaningless round, which it was, but for whatever reason, my body was telling me I was nervous. And so my mind quite didn't quite get it. And so I just said, Hey, look at me. I'm shaking. I don't know. This is kind of crazy. I'm, I'm really excited. And, and the, the, the agent guy said, yeah, every, before every baseball game I played and he played through the minors, I was nervous before every game. And to me, that was like, I'm ready rather than, Oh shit, something's not right. Mm -hmm. And to take so it's notice, it's be willing to notice, Richard, to answer your original question, what's the exercise? Yeah. Yeah. Be willing to notice, have the courage to admit you're nervous, you know, your your heart's pounding, or your hands are sweating, or like your neck is getting tense. Like it's okay. And remember also, like, you know, great traders can feel their heart rates. But often that, you know, that somatic visceral happens a little before those feelings, right? Because we go into fight or flight or whatever it may be. To be able to pick up on that, like I do this a lot. When I, it, it just happens immediately. And I think I'm doing it now sometimes. But that that meant something to me. Like, ooh, what's going on here? I, I, think it's my, I get sweaty. I'm a little sweaty now, but before I walked on here. 
But to pick up on that, and once again, it's the skill, right? Doesn't happen because we learned it on Wednesday. Doesn't happen on Thursday. And don't you get frustrated. It, yeah. But you're allowed to be frustrated because it's your feelings. But stick with it. You know, it, it is just that somatic mental awareness. And obviously, like, like Richard, you said it, you could use it a lot of different places. You know, it's not necessarily just trading. Everything is connected. There's right? this. Trading is the biggest self-development game in the world, right? Definitely. All right, Dave. There's this cultural perception that our feelings and emotions are like left over from when we needed them, you know, on the savanna or the saber toothed tiger or whatever. And like, we don't actually really need them in the modern world, but we're stuck with them. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> they literally are our source of power, our source of information. And the problem is that they have just been misunderstood for millennia. Like that's the, if, if everyone had been taught properly, we'd have an entirely different world. Like, Richard, but now in the meantime, talk about this forever. <laughs> in the meantime, <laughs> it's in the meantime. So what does that mean? It it's a, an available edge mm -hmm. to people who are willing to tackle it, mm -hmm. and it's actually easier. And way less annoying than the, you know, do these 19 things. But if you didn't do these 19 things, like, you know, blah, 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 blah. There are plenty of people who do the 19 things and then blow their account up one day, you know, and then come back and are okay for some period of time. And then one day blow their account up. Like in some ways, I mean, besides my own trading development, the guy that got me into trading was a phenomenal trader but he had that pattern. He blew himself up once in the eighties, took him off the floor. He got back, you know, went on and on and on. And I remember saying, I mean, this was 1993 or something. You lost $432,000 in an hour. Like I couldn't even comprehend, you know, but I always had this other interest. Was that like, how did that happen? Like, how mm. can he be that good? and then do that one afternoon well he was acting out you know severe frustration for reasons of proving himself but i did i mean i guess i kind of knew that then because i already had a master's degree in neuropsychoanalysis but i still didn't get why like why why like his discipline would completely fail hmm. right it's because discipline's not the answer i mean it's it's not irrelevant but it's not the answer it's purported to be. Why did he keep repeating it, right? Which is interesting. Yeah, the, the pattern that I see oftentimes is that the next time they come back, there's rather than 21 rules, there are 24 rules. And then if they get to some point where the blow up starts to happen when there are no rules. And it's just, it's interesting, this, this kind of cycle, I think of it as a cycle of confidence where you know, initially we're kind of trepidatious, nervous, scared. So we take most of the trades that our system says or style says, but we're really picky. And then the confidence starts to go. Then we're taking all of them. And then things are really starting to roll. And then there's this feeling of, well, you know, that's close enough. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to move my stop this time. And then the cycle starts to slump. And then we reevaluate, come back down to the bottom of, all right, I just need more rules. And then more sticky you, notes on the computer. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, there you go. Evan, Evan and I have both been there. And I know Denise has too, but yeah. Take them all off, you know, put really new ones cool. on. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, it's, what am it's, I feeling and why is a much more efficient system? And then you only need one sticky note. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. It, um, it, it ends up answering all sorts of, yes. leading to the solution to all sorts of problems that we try to address through cognition and discipline and rules and sticky notes. For sure. And when when I pull people to, to ask what, what to talk about with you guys, um, I think 50% almost of the, the replies back mentioned confidence, whether it's uh, overconfidence or lack of confidence. Um, 
can you guys talk about you know where the feeling emotion of confidence comes from and and how traders can can work to improve it and and you know just over, overcome their difficulties with that emotion and, and how it affects them yeah let me start and then of course let john and evan with their more practical like at first it's do you actually believe you have a lens like glasses that tells you something about the market oftentimes people don't really believe that you know they've learned from you or from someone but they have in their mind like is this really the best way to do it right. so they try to do what they may have learned from you but they're not they don't actually they're not actually sure that that's the way they should be doing it and so that conflict comes into play mm -hmm. so there's like Get confidence in the way you see the market. Understand there's a million ways to see it. You just need to figure out what yours is right. and stick with it. And then work it little by little, like you would a sport. So like now that I live in a ski town, my example is always like the steeper, harder, you know, black to double black to, you know, off piece slopes. It's like I do a little bit of the harder slope. I'm terrified, you know, but it doesn't go so badly. And then what? I feel like I can do it better the next time. You know, like deliberate practice, in other words, taking your method, deciding, do you really believe in it? And then like, what do you need to do to affect it? And then being having different strategies for the fear anxiety in the moment, because it's not going to go away. It's just you're going to act on the confidence about the trade based on your work developing the trade, your work analyzing, do you believe even in the trading, you know, in that lens of the market? I won't, I'll let John and Evan jump in. <laughs> well, I, yeah, so for me, I, I think of obviously what Denise says is fantastic and, and I agree with that the thought that was coming into my mind is this idea of, you know, the, having a system or style that is aligned with your beliefs. And so when I was trans going from on the floor to off the floor, it struck me that there is an infinite, there are infinite number of ways to make money. I was really having trouble finding the one for me. And so over time I was able to kind of say, all right, these are the types like right now, this type of market I hate. So I've learned over time that, all right, I still need to take some spots in this type of market, but I need to be very choosy, very. And so for me, the confidence of understanding my personality and how I trade markets, my beliefs in how I trade markets, what markets are better for me than other markets, and being able to have that gives me confidence. Now, I think Evan or somebody said earlier about results. If your confidence are based on results, we're going to have problems because, you know, uh, you know, I, I was, I had a system that was 70% winners, but I had losers that were big. And so even in a system where you're making profitable trades in that number, the confidence of having three losers in a row, if it's just based on results, you have those three losers in a row, confidence goes down. So for me, it's more about aligning my beliefs with the markets and the process. I think Evan said process before uh, and that it's hard to do. It takes time to get there. But I think that's where professionals in any endeavor get their confidence. Yeah. You know, sorry, John. Yeah, go, go. Confidence is, is repetition, right? And, and, and confidence doesn't mean you have to be in drive all the time. You know, when, when you start, confidence is a choice, it's a behavior, right? It is that repetition. You know, I tell my clients, you can go into neutral and gain confidence because it was a choice. Like, we don't always have to be in drive. But the confidence comes from that. I could downshift into neutral because I know how to go back into drive, right? And, and understanding that, and it is repetition, you know, overconfidence is dangerous, right? Because overconfidence could be euphoria. Like I'm better than this, and that's that's a dangerous place to make decisions. But confidence is experience and 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 repetition and consistency. You know, when do people get confident? No clue. But I tell you, you have to go slow to speed up. And that's an important thing. You know, chasing confidence is difficult because that's a result. 
but embodying it and going through repetition and repetition, it builds. And the but gives you the feeling that you can do something, that you can handle exactly. something. And I mean, in short, because I know we're getting short on time, like if you come up with better strategies for the opposite of confidence, it's like you've neutralized the conflict and it's easier for the confidence to come through. If you have better ways to handle your fear, basically, mm -hmm. more brain-based ways, like fear in its pure form is trying to help you. Okay, let me sort it out or at least let me hold it if it's just you know, about I'm going to lose money. It allows your confidence from that deliberate experience, from that repetition to come through. Like you can't expect to just have it go away. It's what's a better strategy for dealing with fear, which then allows the confidence to be there. And it goes full circle. When we started, you know, confidence could be also that I, I could feel my feelings and understand them, but I get to pick my own behavior. Yeah. You know, that's a very confident feeling. You know, a lot of these discussions, you know, always go full circle. And that's the beauty of it. But that's a big part of it. You know, and, and you know, it's interesting. That's how we opened up. Yeah, perfect. And just one last main question. Um, a lot of the, uh, there, there's probably a wide range of styles as well as experience levels watching this uh, from very new traders to maybe more experienced ones. Um, how should they combine developing their system and finding one that John, I think, as you said, works for them and their style and their 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 process, as well as working on the mental side of things and and uh, try to develop that edge of ex of knowing what emotions they're experiencing. How should they combine and maybe even know what the issues are, whether they're with the mental side of trading versus their actual system that that they've chosen to to work with? They got to start by being honest with themselves, like. Can you describe a trade that works on a Saturday afternoon, like, you know, now that it's summertime in the U.S., you know, sitting with your feet up on a picnic table, having a beer? Can you explain, like, this, this, and this comes together, and then the price moves in this way, like, outside of staring at the chart? And then can you say, do I really believe that's, like, the way it works? Like, for me, that was momentum versus mean reversion or, right. you know, short-term momentum. Like, I'm sorry, these stocks move together like that. It happens like that. Um, makes sense to me. Um, or things that are extended. So you got to start there. And then by definition, if you're doing that, you're working with your feelings. So you're working with psychology. Like I will tell my clients, what do I really think? How much do I believe it? Are their first two questions. So you got to do that about your lens for the market. What do I really think? And by the way, what do I really think allows you to hear that, you know, uh, you want this to happen, but mm. it's not really happening. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. um, and then the, do I believe it is the same question, but not really like you're separating desire from, from pattern recognition. And also don't be a strategy junkie, jumping around from strategy to strategy. You're going to, you're going to bring the same luggage into every strategy. If you don't understand your mental game and how you feel and how you operate, it doesn't matter what strategy. And the good thing is, is that once you do understand, picking a strategy becomes clearer, not easy, but clearer, but you're jumping from strategy to strategy. You're getting no data from how you feel, right? Stay with one for a little bit, but work on your mental game because the answer, you know, like when people read self-help books, on the 90th self help book, I'm sure the first one said the exact same thing, right? But you have to do it. And that's the important part. You have to pick up on this data. And it's tough when you keep switching and switching and switching because there is no holy grail, right? You know, the most important part, obviously, when people say 95% of traders lose money because the markets are hard, come on, because they don't understand themselves, right? Markets are always uncertain. Right. So the 95 percent, I'm, I'm willing to say, I don't know if I can quantify it, but the, the, the mental performance has got to be 85, 90 percent of it. And like to, to dovetail on both of those statements is that when we un, when we can explain our system or style, our confluence of events for a trade. Away from the screen succinctly, I think then we really understand it and as simple as possible, right? What is it, Occam's razor? 
as simple as possible is better. We all want to feel, well, I should say, only speak for myself. I like feeling smart. So I like a chart that has 5,000 things on it because it makes me feel really smart. But I know that the important things are probably two or three. And then um, kind of to Evan's point, the idea of um, Van Tharp had this idea that you needed to be able to trade a system 90% of the time according to your rules. And to Evan's point, like if you're jumping around all the time, it's not the system. It's because there's something about the system or trading in general that is tough to take on a feeling emotional level. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to kind of move the next thing to alleviate that. Oh, I just need to, for me, I just need to eat more protein. I just need to eat more uh, vegetables. I just need to eat less hours during the day. All of those are probably true, but why, Ed, why do I keep switching? And so that's the important question. People switch to assuage anxiety as opposed to dealing directly with the anxiety. Yes. Exactly. Perfect. Yeah, th this has been fantastic. I don't know if I quite feel smart enough for this conversation, but I know I've took, taken away some really great things. Um, I, I think a great way to, to kind of wrap things up is uh, for each of you, would you be able to kind of uh, give your, your maybe one or two key takeaways that you hope people um, got out of this conversation and maybe a recommendation for how to progress uh, their mental game. And uh, we'll, we'll start the reverse orders uh, with, with Evan this time. I go to my number with one thing is pause. And remember, you know, slow and steady wins the race, which I can't stand that line. I would say burn it. But you have to go slow to speed up. You know, in order to progress, you know, if you can go slow, the progression's quicker. But remember that. And, and at the same thing, at the end of the day, just be kind to yourself. Just be compassionate to yourself because trading obviously doesn't get easier, but it gets rewarding and there could be harmony in it. You know, I used to tell science there's, there's no peace in trading, which is total crap. Like if you could find that harmony, it is very rewarding. So that there is, there it could be harmony in this. And there is, it just takes a lot of effort and awareness. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so know your feelings, um, understand your biases, understand your patterns, and kind of to Evan's point, it's okay to be you. The research shows that the best traders are reading other people. Reading other people is a skill every human being has. You have to have it. The statistics are so bad because people have this flat earth view of perception and judgment. So if you understand that you already have a skill that will help you trade naturally, it's called theory of mind, and that your feelings and emotions are meant to help you, at least in their pure form, and you decide you're going to take them on in a different way than basically everybody else is going to tell you to, the chances that you succeed at this are going to improve. Excellent. Well, again, this has really been fantastic um, for the, the the viewers out there who want to learn more from you guys and and uh, learn more about uh, the Shoal Method. Uh, where can they reach out to you guys and and uh, get get that additional education? Yeah. So the uh, the website is therethinkgroup.net. We obviously have a contact us. Um, that's the simplest way to get in touch with us. We do have an e-learning program that lays all this out at a relatively inexpensive cost that you also get access to us live once a month. Um, and then, you know, through the website, people talk to my partner and husband, Bill, about picking which coach might work best for them. Um, yeah, sign up for the newsletter, but we're kind of not so great about getting them out on any regular basis. Perfect. Well, thank you all. Once again, Denise, John, Evan, thank you very much. I, I learned a lot from this. Uh, to everybody watching, I hope you enjoyed. I, I'm sure you did. Uh, if you did, please go ahead and leave a like down below and make sure to subscribe uh, as well to our channel. Uh, and with, with that, we'll move on uh, to the rest of the program. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. All right. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.
All right, welcome back, everybody. Our next guest is Jason Shapiro, who's featured in the most recent Market Wizards book from Jack Schwager. Uh, he's a fantastic trader and educator, and I've learned an immense amount from him. Uh, he's got a very different process than uh, most of the presenters here at this conference, so it's great to hear some kind of outside perspectives um, where you can add a lot uh, to your own personal uh, trading game. So he's gone ahead and recorded uh, his presentation in advance. Uh, just so he doesn't forget anything or miss miss anything, uh, but we'll be back after his recording uh, for a live Q and A. So make sure you guys have your questions ready, uh, your notes ready, and uh, we'll go ahead and play the recording. And we'll see you guys right back here after his presentation for a Q and A. So make sure you guys stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Jason Shapiro. Welcome to my little presentation here. Just to give you a little background, I am a futures trader. I own a CTA called JS Trading, for which I manage uh, some institutional accounts. And I also am part of a website called crowdedmarketreport.com, where I produce a newsletter every week. And we have a Discord page where our members get on there and, and talk about the markets and various trading processes and risk management and all kinds of things like that. Just to go back into sort of how I started, how I got into trading the markets, I think my story is pretty similar to many people. I started trading when I was 22. I'm 55 now. And I started trading because I was working at a job at the time I lived in Hong Kong. And I worked at a job that I was kind of bored at. And there was a bull market going on in the Hong Kong stock market. And uh, it seemed like a pretty good place to try and make some extra money. So I started to buy and the market was going up and I was making some money. And I slowly came or quickly came to the conclusion of, hey, if I put $100 in something and it goes up 10% and I make $10, well, then why don't I put $200 into it and make $20? So I started to sort of utilize leverage that way and ride the bull market up. And it was a bull market. And as a young person with very little experience, this leverage idea seemed like a great idea because <laughs> it was working. But of course, in the end, I had no way of knowing when this bull market was going to end. And when it did end, I didn't know it. <clears throat> and uh, the market started going down and I was buying the dip and you know, it was sort of like, let's double up to make up. And all that did was lose me more money. And in the end, I ended up back right where I started and had lost all the money that I had made during the bull market. And then at some point, I learned about this other great thing, which was uh, shorting the market. If it was going down, then why not get short and make money on the way down? And this ultimately was even more enjoyable in a way than making money on the upside because you're making money while the market's going down. Everybody else is losing money and you're making money and it feels like you're a genius. So I did that for a while. And of course, I had the same issue, which was that I had no idea of knowing when the market was going to bottom and start going up again. And certainly when it started to go up at first, it wasn't because of any fundamentals. The market, there was nothing any better than there was before, but the market started going up and I was shorting it. And again, in the end, I ended up in the same place uh, I started, which is that the money that I had made on the short side. I had then given back uh, and lost. So this was probably five years into trading now, and I'm basically at the same place where I started. So I decided that I was going to educate myself about everything that I could about trading and markets. And I went into, you know, fundamental analysis and I went into technical analysis and, you know, Fibonacci retracements and breakouts and head and shoulders and all these different things as well. And did a lot of study into that. And from there, I, I kind of started trading both sides based on all that type of stuff. And I did that for about five years. And the results were a little different. I was making and losing and making and losing. But in the end, really, I pretty much ended up in the same place that I started after a bunch of false starts and give backs and false starts and give backs. So now I'm sort of 10 years into this. And I decided th th the good point was as part of my reading of trading books and psychology books and all that stuff was the idea of keeping a trade journal and keeping a history to be able to study. So I had done a very good job of that. So at that point, I went back and I, I really went through my trade journal. And what I tried to do was figure out which trades actually made money over time, which kind of process, which kind of idea made money over time rather than just made money one time and lost money over time, and which ones didn't. And obviously, I tried to eliminate the stuff that wasn't working over time and focus on the stuff that was working over time and really just stay disciplined to those trades over time. And I started to develop a process of what works and over time and, and what doesn't work. 
And that was really the basis of what I do now, you know, 20 something years later. And I'll say that since I did that, my trading has been pretty successful. I'm going on my 21st year here without a down year, which is not easy to do. And it's not like I'm making hundreds of percent a year. You know, I'm an institutional money manager. I, you know, I try to put about 15% a year without ever drawing down 5%. So that's kind of where I'm at now. I'm running the same process that I've been running for 20 years and being very disciplined about doing that. So now I'd like to get into sort of what my process is and how I developed it. And really it starts with the fact that I have witnessed that over time, the majority of people who are trading lose money. It's a very high number. It's in the high 90% of people lose money over time trying to trade the markets. So my thought becomes, well, if 90 something percent of people lose, if I can do opposite of those 90 something percent of people, then I can capture and gains what they are getting in losses. It's a pretty simple concept, a little harder to do, but that's at the very base of it, what I'm trying to do. And notice, I'm not trying to be necessarily smart, okay? I'm not trying to outthink the market, which I think is a dangerous thing to do over time. I'm not trying to let the market do what I think it's supposed to do. All I'm trying to do is make money. And to me, the simplest way to make money is to go opposite people that are losing money. So how do I do that? It starts with the idea of what my basic premise is for markets, which is what is the discounting mechanism, right? And I think most people and most books and whatnot will talk about price of an asset as its discounting mechanism, right? So in other words, this is pricing in all this good news because the price has gone up or this is pricing and all this bad news because the price has gone down. I don't look at it like that. I think that the discounting mechanism in the market is positioning. So in other words, it's not this thing has gone up a lot, so it's priced in all the good news. It's everybody is long this thing, so it's priced in all the good news. Or everybody is short this thing, so there's a good chance that it's priced in most or all of the bad news, right? Because the market is pushed around, obviously, by money going in and money going out. So if you take a very extreme example, which could never happen, but just to make the point, if everyone in the world had all of their money invested in one asset, then there's no way it could go up anymore because there'd be no more money to go into it, no matter what the news was. The thing could, whatever, take over the world at that point. It doesn't matter because there's no money left to go in it. So that's kind of an extreme example of what I'm trying to do. So how do I figure out or measure when people are super long or super short? And as a futures trader, the data that I like to use a lot is the commitment of traders data, because this is released every week and it shows where people are positioned in the futures markets, right? So I use that extensively. And what I do is I take the commitments of traders data and I turn it into an oscillator and it becomes obviously an overbought or oversold oscillator. So if it's like 95 or above on my oscillator, it's indicating to me that people are way too long. And if it's five or below, it's indicating to me that people are way too short. So when it hits those levels, I am looking to, you know, buy it when they're too short or, or, or sell it when they're too long. And clearly the commitment to traders data is not perfect. Just like any data set is not perfect. It doesn't work all the time. Just like anything doesn't work all the time. So we have to add another layer on top of that. It's not like, oh, everyone's long short it. Everyone's short long it. We need to add another layer of top of that. And what I like to do as my first layer on top of that is I need the market to confirm what I want to do first, right? And I think that's important, by the way, for any way that you trade, right? I don't care what it is. The market should confirm what you're thinking first, right? You might be a value investor. I think this stock is super cheap. I'm going to buy it. Okay. Let the market confirm it first. I think this stock is super expensive. I'm going to sell it. Okay. Let the market confirm it first. Market confirmation is extremely important in all processes, including mine. So what do I mean by market confirmation? Well, for me, I'm picking turns. Okay. So everybody, the market's been going down, 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 down. Everyone's gotten super short. I'm looking to pick the turn. So what is market confirmation down there? For me, what it is, is I, I like they refer to it as a news failure event. So let's say the market's going down. The easiest one to pick because everyone sort of follows it is the stock market last year was going down. And we kind of know why it was going down. The Fed was raising rates because inflation was too high. 
CPI kept coming out high. PPI, all these data sets kept coming out too high, and it meant the Fed needed to keep raising rates and drain liquidity, and drain liquidity is bearish the stock market. And so the stock market was going down for those reasons, so we're told. So when the market actually did bottom, which was in early October, what we saw was a CPI came out, and it was actually higher than was expected and was the highest number of the year. And so that was very bearish. And what happened was the stock market went down that day and actually closed up on the day. And there it is. That's market confirmation to me. That's news failure to me. The market is now no longer going down on what is seen as the most bearish news there is. That's market confirmation. And that's when I buy. Okay, and same thing on the upside. You know, market's been going up for all these bullish reasons. Suddenly you get more of that bullish reason and the market does not go up on it. It probably has a reversal day. Most days it'll do one of these candles, you know, where it, it goes up and closes on the low reversal day candle type of thing. Not always that, but a lot of times that. And so I sell it there. So that's sort of my first buffer towards the COT is not perfect, right? It keeps me out of trouble. And then the second buffer, of course, is risk management, both on an individual trade basis and on a portfolio basis. So individual trade. So let's take that S&P, for example. If I were to, if everybody were short and we get this CPI number that comes out worse than expected and the market goes down and rebounds and closes up on the day, I will be getting long on the close of that day. I'm picking the turn. So by definition, if it goes and makes a new low, then I didn't pick the turn. So that's where I'm stopped. So I know where my stop is, right? The low of that day. I know where my entry is, which was the close of that day. I know how much I want to risk per trade, which for me is 70 basis points per trade. But for you, it could be something else. You know, everybody's something different. Um, I pick 70 basis points because historically that's what gets me to a volatility of my portfolio of 7 to 8%, which is what I'm targeting. But basically it's 70 basis points. So I know my entry. I know my exit. I know how much I want to risk on that trade. Or I should say I know my entry. I know my stop. I know how much I'm willing to lose on a trade, which is 70 basis points. So therefore, that's how my trade gets sized. All right. It's pretty simple. So that's sort of buffer number two for being wrong, right, which is a stop. And it's not just some random stop. It's a stop that actually makes sense, A, on the chart because it's a new low, and B, according to my process. I'm picking a turn. The market makes a new low. It's not a turn. So I'm out. And I think that that's an important thing, no matter, again, how you trade, right? Whatever it is, you, you're long something because you believe that this means you should be long. Well, at what point does the market say that this is not happening anymore? Because that's when you should stop out or get out, right? And it doesn't matter what it is, but you have to be disciplined to that process, you know? And just as an example, like my trades historically are profitable less than 40% of the time which means that I'm wrong over 60% of the time, all right? But I lose one unit when I'm wrong, and I make somewhere around three and a half, somewhere between three and a half to four units when I'm right. So if I can lose one, make three and a half, lose one, lose one, make three and a half, lose one, lose one, make three and a half, then over time, my account grows. And I think that's a very important concept. People are looking to be right a lot. I'm looking at risk reward, right? And I believe that that's what this positioning does. It doesn't necessarily give me an advantage as to whether the market is going to go up or down at any given time. But I think it gives me an advantage as to the risk reward of whether it's going to go up or down. The up or down is probably still 50-50, but the up becomes four and the down becomes one. So I want to be long. And that's really the most important thing of my process along with the risk management. And as I was saying, the next level is on a portfolio basis. So I have a trade on and I have another trade on and I get another trade and another trade. And suddenly I'm looking at the portfolio and I say I'm risking 70 basis points of trade. But what happens if, for example, I get long S&P, Dow, NASDAQ and Russell and I'm risking 70 basis points on each one? That's clearly not really 70 basis points of trade, right? Because those are very correlated markets, although not this year, but in general, they're very correlated markets. So therefore, I'm not going to put the full size on. And that's an exaggerated example. Because suddenly I have a dollar trade on or I have a commodity trade on and a stock trade on and a fixed income trade on. And so I'm kind of looking at my portfolio, looking at the correlations between the things. And it comes down to sort of usually the simple risk on risk off type of idea. And I will adjust the size of my ultimate positions based on the correlations across the various positions that I have on. And sometimes the correlations break, but 
you know, and I'm watching that, you know, I don't run like value at risk stuff because it's so delayed with the correlation breaks. So really what I spend most of my day doing when I'm watching the markets is really watching these correlations and seeing how they're keeping steady or if they're not keeping steady and therefore my portfolio should be adjusted or not adjusted based on that. So that's really basically what my process is. And then getting out, again, my getting out has to fit into what my process is as well. So if my process is people are super short, so I'm getting long, well, then people are, are no longer super short. My edge is gone. So that's when I get out, right? So I buy it. They're super short. We get one of these news failure market confirmations event. I buy it. Now I'm watching the, the data. And when it goes back to neutral on my oscillator, 50, I take my profit because that was my job, right? It's not to say it's not going to keep going up until they get super long. Um, and in fact, when I have tested this data, what it's told me is I would make more profit if I just hold the thing all the way up until they get super long, get out and get short. But what happens after the halfway point, after the neutral point, is my returns start to get a hell of a lot more volatile relative to the extra return I'm getting. And I don't really want that, first of all. I want to maximize my sharp or I want to maximize my return to draw down, first of all. And second of all, as a money manager that is offering a service to, to clients, uh, that's the service that I offer. You know, most of my clients are diversified sort of hedge fund clients. They either a fund of fund and have a bunch of hedge funds in there or a fund of CTAs that have a bunch of trend followers in there. And my job is to kind of catch those turns. And once it sort of gets past neutral and the market continues to go up, that's really more the trend follower job. Um, so they do that. I do my job. They do their job. My client's happy because they have a portfolio of negative correlated return streams. So that's how I get out. And that's my process right there. It's really pretty much that simple. And what I would say is you shouldn't look to be whether well, you believe what I'm saying or not, or you believe in what I'm saying or not. The idea here is not trade like me. Okay. Hey, I've got good returns and I've got this and I've got that. So you should trade like me. You can't do that. Just like I can't trade like you, right? You have to trade like you. But I think the idea is some of this data that I'm talking about and some of these thought processes that I'm talking about can help you to improve your trading as you do it, right? I, I've seen a, many, many times, especially now that I have this Discord page where there are people who try to just put on the same trades that I do. But like I say, over 60% of my trades lose. So you, the chances of losing three or four in a row is pretty high. Um, so you lose three, four in a row and all of a sudden you think, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm not going to do his trades anymore. And then of course the next two work great. And they make four times what we would have lost, you know, and then you chase the next one and that one ends up being a loser. And suddenly the whole thing just becomes a mess until you believe very much in what you're doing, or unless you believe very much in what you're doing, you're not going to be able to be disciplined to stick to doing it. And, and that's an important thing. If you have a process that works over time, you have to be able to keep doing it even when it's having a drawdown and, and nothing works all the time. Everything has drawdowns. So you have to believe so much in what you're doing that you're going to be disciplined enough to stick to it. So that's why I encourage, that's one of the reasons why I encourage people not to just take my trade ideas, right? Use some of these concepts to improve upon your trading is the best thing that can be done with this. So the next thing I thought I would get into uh, since I've talked about um, about what kind of has worked for me and what continues to work for me and, and what I focus on now is to take a look at things in the past that haven't worked for me because um, I think that's an important thing to understand um, and as you eliminate things that don't work. Um, and really the number one thing on a more broad basis that hasn't worked for me over time is when I think I'm going to be smarter than the market, right? And I'm trying to be contrarian. The market's going up, so I'm trying to go short, or the market's going down, and I'm trying to get long because it's oversold or overbought or all those type of things. And there's many examples of this that I can unfortunately cite. But I'll, I'll go to two that I like to talk about a lot. There was a period, and this is all before I started using this process and looking at the commitments of traders data. This is the S&P um, right about here, 97. In 1997, the S&P was here, and I was trying to short it. I thought it was too high. I thought it was going up too fast and all this kind of thing. And I was fighting the tape, and I was shorting it because I wanted to be the hero. And it was just wrong all the time, and I was getting stopped out on a consistent basis. And um, at one point in here, I believe it was this right here. It might have been this little move down here, but 
Um, I remember that Alan Greenspan, who was the chairman of the Federal Reserve, came out and made a comment about there might be some irrational exuberance in the stock market. And the market gapped down that day. And I was short. And I was thinking about what a hero I am, about how only me and Alan Greenspan are the only ones that really understand what's going on. And this is the big one. And I'm going to catch this and all that. And by the end of that day, the stock market actually closed up after gapping down on that Greenspan comment. And it continued to go up. It was like right around here and it just continued to go up and up and up and up. And the lesson there was, you know, don't fight the tape, right? The tape is telling you it's even when Alan Greenspan is giving you bad news, the market's closing up, right? Don't fight the tape. Don't think you're smarter than the market. Okay. Be patient and wait for the market to confirm whatever it is you're believing. Don't just get in front of it because you can get run over. There's the saying, and there's a saying for a reason, the market can be irrational a lot longer than you can stay solvent. And that's a fact, right? And another great example of that was the the NASDAQ in late 1999. Now, in late 1999, what we had was the internet bubble 1.0. And it was obvious to anyone paying any attention that this was a bubble. And that the valuations on these stocks were completely unjustifiable, completely ridiculous, right? And there was the classic thing going on where the shoe shine boy was literally giving stock tips, right? That was the world we were living in in 1999. So me, trying to be Mr. Contrarian again, I'm saying, well, let's get short the stock market. Well, you know what? It was pretty obvious around, I'm going to look at this NASDAQ chart into the beginning of 99, right, which is really when it was getting ridiculous, the NASDAQ was trading somewhere around 4,000, and it was ridiculous, okay, I'm telling you, the valuations are ridiculous, the psychology and the momentum and this whole thing was ridiculous, well, you know what, the NASDAQ went all the way up to 8,100, it doubled that year, okay, in less than a year, because it was irrational longer than I could stay liquid, right, and this gets to, and ultimately the NASDAQ topped in February of 2000 around 8,100. And this is when I actually, the, the, the commitments of traders came to me, right? This is when I started looking at that because I was like, how can I find a way that will stop me from shorting this thing way too early based on things that maybe the market doesn't care about, right? And this is the commitments of traders for the NASDAQ futures. And you can see the speculators, which are the blue lines, never really got super long, okay, until the middle of December, right? And the market ended up topping in February, but this would have kept me from shorting the NASDAQ to, for that whole year, right? I wouldn't have started shorting it until here, right? And even then, I would have been waiting for a market confirmation, but it would have kept me. And that had a very strong effect on me where I was like, okay, maybe I need to start looking at, at, at this type of data, this positioning data, rather than just me saying the market's gone up too much and therefore it has to go down because that was causing me nothing but trouble, right? So those are two examples, I think, of what not to do right? Just because it's gone up a lot doesn't mean it's a short. Just because it's gone down a lot doesn't mean it's a buy. Just because it's overvalued doesn't mean it's a short. Just because it's undervalued doesn't mean it's a buy. Don't fight the tape, right? Wait for the tape to confirm what you're thinking before you do anything, all right? I think it's a very, very important concept, all right? So um, here are some examples uh, as to the trades that I am talking about using the commitments of traders and using this market confirmation type of thing. And I'll, I'll get, try to give some recent examples just so we can keep it current and, and even the trades that I currently have on. But this is the 10-year notes. And if you look, again, this is the Commitments of Traders report. The red shows the commercial traders. The yellow shows what they call small speculators. And the blue shows large speculators. And I am looking to be at the market turns when large and small speculators are super short and therefore commercials are super long. I'm looking to get long. So we came into sort of February, March, late February, finding that the, that the speculators were super short. I'm looking to get long starting in late February, and I'm looking for this market confirmation type of thing. And what we had, I believe it was this day right here on the 10-year chart, right, which was March 9th, so about two weeks after we really started seeing this massive um, short positioning by speculators. We had a news failure event. You can see the reversal day on the chart on March 9th right here. And it was some kind of economic news that, uh, or, or inflationary news that was stronger than expected. And the 10 years went down and they closed up on the day. So I'm getting long on the close that day with my stop at the low. 
And lo and behold, 10 years went from about 111 to the 116 area in a very short period of time. And this was during the beginning of the latest banking crisis thing. But And, you know, I get comments a lot like, well, you couldn't have known that banking crisis was going to happen. And I think that's an important point because it's true. I couldn't have known that that banking crisis was going to happen, uh, nor could just about anybody know. But what I did know was people were super short and that the risk reward was to be long, right? And maybe if the bank crisis didn't happen, maybe the 10 years would have gone down, taken out the loss, and I would have taken a loss. I don't know. But what I do know is the risk reward w- w- was in my favor. And so I made a very quick, you know, almost six points on a 10 year trade in. in um, in just a few weeks. And then, and then the, the COT went neutral and, and, and I got out. And the reason I say COT went neutral is really because the small speculators here, you know, ended up getting long. You can see the large specs are even shorter now than they were there, but the small speculators are long. So I need all three to line up for me to, to put on a trade. So therefore I'm not buying fixed income now. Even the two-year notes, by the way, right now, which are ridiculous, right? You look at this, the large specs are mega short, record ever short, but the small specs are still long. So this is keeping me from getting long two years here. But anyway, that's sort of one example of a trade. Some of the other examples, like the trades that I have on now, um, or that I've been doing this year, this year I was getting long the NASDAQ earlier in the year. And you can see In this area, beginning of the year, this is sort of mid-January, speculators started to get very short. So I was, you know, of course, getting long on a news failure event. And we rode the NASDAQ long until it went neutral. You could see it was going neutral around this level, April. But lo and behold, as they were getting out of their shorts in the NASDAQ, they were getting short the S&P. So I was looking to get long S&P. And there was a day in there somewhere where there were, again, some bad news came out and and the market closed up and and I got long the S&P, which is what I I currently am. And another one that I have on right now, for example, is this euro. You can see speculators were getting massively long euros starting um, in February. Came off a little bit in March, but starting April started to get massively long again. And I was looking to get short starting uh, early April was when I really started to start looking at it. And then we had an event, you know, out of Europe, Lagarde spoke or it was a Euro uh, central bank meeting or whatever. And that was more hawkish than expected, which I believe was this day right here. All right. Which is March 4th, if I'm not mistaken. And again, the Euro went up, closed down. I got short against that high. It took a little bit of a while, but now it, it started to work, and, and right now it's working. It's not to say it won't go out and get stopped out. I don't know, but I will stay with this short until I either get stopped out or the commitments of traders goes back to neutral, all right? So that's kind of an example of these trades, and clearly I could give you a whole bunch of examples where they didn't work, where I got short up here, and it ended up going through the highs and stopping out, or going through the lows and stopping out, and that happens a lot. Like I say, more than 60% of the time, that happens. But even if it were this Euro trade, I was risking maybe a half a point on this, and I am already three points in the money. So, I mean, that's a five, six to one, you know, return to risk um, from when I put the trade on. So, that's kind of examples of, of how this, these type of trades work. And I want to point out again, because I think it's so important. And I said it when this happened, you don't have to trade like I trade in order to make this stuff work for you. Trend following. I'm almost an anti-trend follower in a way, right? Not totally because I'm not picking a term because of the trend, the price, but a lot of times it ends up being anti-trend following, but trend following works over time. It has proven to put up positive returns over time, right? But if you were a trend follower, then there was a good chance that you were short the fixed income markets this year. And if you were watching the commitments of traders starting in February, you could see two years, five years, they're getting very short, 10 years, they're getting very short. And if you're looking at that, you know, you might be able to say to yourself, well, yes, I am short the fixed income markets because that's where the trend is, but it's starting to get very crowded. So maybe I should watch this or maybe I should reduce my position size or get out or, or something, right? Because the risk is that there can be an event here. And if there is an event, then, because we can't predict the events, right? But if there is an event, there could be a massive move because the market is so short here. And that's really what happened. A lot of these trend following firms had a very, very tough period during that fixed income move um, after the banking crisis. And this maybe can help you as a trend follower, 
to think about your portfolio and maybe where you need to reduce stuff. I would certainly want to be short if two markets were moving exactly the same down, let's say, in parallel, and one everybody was short and one nobody was short, I would certainly want to be larger in the one that nobody was short versus the one that everyone was short, okay, by definition, because as I spoke about in the beginning, over time, the masses lose money, so I don't want to be positioned on the masses side, right? But trends do work, so let's be in trends where everybody is not participating. Those are the better trends to be in, and this kind of data and this kind of analysis helps you to find that type of stuff. So the last thing I wanted to talk about today is what I think is really the most important things about how to make money over time. And let's start with what I think is actually the least important thing, which is the ability to pick an asset that is going up or down. And I know that sounds strange because we're either getting long an asset that we think is going up or we're getting short an asset that we think is going down. But the ability to predict the future like that is something that really nobody has, okay? And I always uh, quote Stanley Druckenmiller, who has had an immense amount of success as a trader, and he has a great quote where he says, you know, I am wrong way too often to count on being right or wrong as a way to make money. And I think that's the point, right? What's important is risk management and discipline, right? You take it to an extreme example. Your system could be, I'm going to flip a coin, and if it's heads, I'm going to get long, and if it's tails, I'm going to get short, okay? Then if that's your process, then when it's heads, get long. When it's tails, get short, okay? Don't be second guessing, right? Because the time you second guess is a good chance is a time that you wish it you didn't, right? But more important is the risk management of that. Okay, I'm going to get long, but where am I going to stop? And if that is where I'm going to put a stop, then put that stop and execute that stop. And stops are a very difficult thing because... I feel like over time, 80% of the time that you get stopped out of something you wish you didn't because the mark goes right back the way that you wanted it to go after you get stopped. And, and that's horrible. But you have to keep in mind and remember and plant it in your mind. The other 20% of the time, the stops will keep you from going out of business, right? And I like to say over the long term, the main point in this is you have to stay alive long enough to get lucky. All right. If you're not alive because you've blown out, you're not going to be around to make money later. So you have to have the discipline to focus on the risk management. Right. Those are the most important things when it comes to trading. And that's what you have to really, really be disciplined about and really, really be focused on. I mean, yes, spend time trying to figure out when is the market going to go up and when is the market going to go down according to your thought process and do an honest job of analyzing if your thought process is working or not. And if it is, then go with it. And if it's not, then try to figure out a different thing. But even within that, risk management is the, is the key to it all. And my returns and my process, I feel like are proof positive to that. Because like I say, less than 40% of my trades make money. So I am right, right less than 40% of the time, yet I haven't had a down year in over 20 years, okay? Because my risk return is good and because my discipline of getting out of losing trades is good, right? That's where I feel like my major edge is and that's what you have to focus on. And on that note, just to do a little bit of plug, I have a, a webpage called crowdedmarketreport.com and this was started a couple of years ago. I was um, introduced to a very various bunch of coincidences to Jack Schwager. And I met him a few times and I had sent him my stuff and my returns and all that. And he decided he wanted to put me into his latest book, Unknown Market Wizards. I went in that book mostly because his first books had such an effect on me, such a positive effect on me. I thought it would kind of be cool to be a part of that. But when the book came out, I started getting a lot of requests from people through various sources like LinkedIn and whatnot, asking me if I could help them learn how to trade or if I could mentor them. And I did want to do that. I'm entering the very final stages of my career here, quite frankly. My last child is about to graduate college. And once that happens, I feel like I'm going to um, reduce what I'm doing. Uh, somewhat in the markets. And I have made money in the markets over time. And, and that's great because it puts food on my family's table. It allows my children to go to college and all that. But ultimately, as you get older, you know, as a young person, that's all you're thinking about. I just want to make money. I want to pay. I want to get a house. I want to get a car. I want to have money, all that. But once you get older, 
you start to realize that there's more to life than that, right? And sure, I've made money by picking off some of the weakest traders in the world, right? <laughs> um, and I don't apologize for that. That's my job. But as a more broader kind of legacy thing, right, I've gotten to a point where I would very much like to give back to other people. And so people were asking me if I could do this, and I wanted to, but I found it was going to be impossible for me to sort of mentor or help, you know, a few hundred people at the same time. You know, I have a job, I have a family, I have somewhat of a life outside of the markets that I want to spend time on when I can. So how was I going to do that? I didn't really know. And that's what I kept telling these people. And one of those people said to me, well, what about if I start a web page and you can centralize this whole thing and people can join? And I had this newsletter that I have been writing for myself for over 20 years every weekend just to get my thoughts in order as to what I wanted to be doing. And that had been distributed when I was at a hedge fund to some of the portfolio managers there. And then when I ran a hedge fund for a while, some of my clients were some hedge fund managers themselves and I was managing their personal money and I was distributing it to them and those people always seemed to like very much what I was what I was saying if for no other reason that it was a little different than what most people are looking at and uh, smart people who care about making money understand that looking at something different can help so we decided we would start this web page and I would distribute this this newsletter and that was kind of the idea and then the guy who started it who's my partner added a Discord page, which I didn't know what that was at the time, being an old man. But uh, that has actually added a lot of benefits as well because people get on there and they, they talk about, A, the stuff that I'm talking about and B, stuff that they're looking at as well. And we have a lot of different eyeballs on the markets and a lot of different thought processes on the markets. And, and it's really been, I think, a, a great thing. It, it's helped me become a better trader, quite frankly. Here's some things I didn't think about before. Here's some, you know, we're looking for these news failure events on different markets. Well, now we've got, instead of just my eyeballs on it, we've got hundreds of eyeballs looking for that type of stuff. So that's kind of what CrowdedMarketReport.com does. And what I will say is one of the things that really makes me angry is the amount of sort of scammers that are out there that we get the ads on the internet all the time from these people. And, oh, look, 90% of my trades make money. And here's a guy that made $20,000 in a week listening to me and all this. And it's all shrill, Okay. There is no guru out there that's going to tell you how to make money. And there is nobody out there that's going to teach you how to turn $10,000 into a million dollars in a year. It doesn't exist. Okay. I'm sorry to say it doesn't exist, but it doesn't exist. And I don't, on Crowded Market Report, I don't present myself as a trade picker. Okay. Or as a tipster. While I do every week talk about the trades that are set up for me to do. And I show the trades that I actually am doing. And when we're, it then flows to the daily Discord page where we're talking live time about, hey, this trade was set up. Am I doing it? Am I not doing it? I do do that stuff, okay? And you can see what I am doing. But I continue to push the idea of that is not what you want to do. That's what I do. You have to do you. But this stuff can help you, A, the data that I look at, B, the different way that I sort of approach markets, looking at participation rather than price, C, all the people that are on there. This stuff can help you do what you do better, which is really what it is there for. So if you are interested or at the point in your trading journey where you think that that type of stuff would help you, then we would be more than happy to have you join us um, on Crowded Market Report. We've kept the price extremely affordable. The idea of this thing is not for me to make a bunch of money. It, it, it does cost some money, but it costs money to run the site properly. And you'll see that we run it very tight. There's not only my newsletter every week and, and the Discord page, but there's also the commitments of traded uh, charts that I know you can get somewhat for free on the internet in some places, but not the charts that we have on there. We have very interactive charts. We cover more markets than anybody else covers. You can change time periods. You can do all kinds of stuff on there. So you get that as well. So if you're interested in, in that type of thing, then we would love to see you on Uncrowded Market Report. And if not, that's understandable as well. I, I do videos on YouTube, which is free, once a week talking about these type of things. I'm on Twitter. I, I put some ideas on Twitter. So Anyway, that would be the last thing I have to say. I, I hope that what I've done here has helped people a, a, a little bit. And I am, as always, looking forward to sort of the questions and, and answers and, and all that type of stuff. So thanks for being here. Thanks for listening to me ramble for a little while. And I hope that uh, 
everybody uh, continues to pursue this journey of uh, trading success. All right, thanks a lot. Jason Shapiro, signing out. All right, welcome back, everybody. Let me go ahead and unmute that. Uh, welcome to the live Q&A portion of Jason's presentation. I hope you guys all really enjoyed that. I know I got a lot out of it. It reinforced a lot of the concepts that uh, other presenters have talked about today. Uh, risk management is incredibly important. Um, to start things off, uh, Jason, I just have a few of my own personal questions that uh, I wanna ask before we move on to the audience. Uh, but while I'm doing that, please, anybody who's watching who has any questions for Jason, uh, let us know down below in the live chat. Uh, to start with, let's go ahead and I love to ask you, um, first of all, when it comes to uh, discipline and, and following your process, which, which you mentioned at the end there, uh, I'd love to hear kind of your thoughts on, uh, I know you, you watched a few of the previous presentations on trade psychology. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to add on that subject uh, about, you know, becoming more confident, becoming more disciplined? I mean, one guy that I worked for one time used to say all the time, trading is discipline. So that's what this is. If you want to be a trader and you want to be a profitable trader, Discipline is what you need to be thinking about. Process, discipline, risk management. That's what you need to be thinking about. People are trying to spend a lot of their time, obviously, trying to figure out if the market's going to go up or down. And clearly, that's somewhat necessary. But the other things I can tell you are 100 times more important. So, yes, the only thing I can say about discipline is, and I'm speaking to myself too, by the way, Get better at it. Mm -hmm. Spend time getting better at discipline. Because that's 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 the game. And with the on the kind of confidence side of things, how did you kind of develop confidence in your process uh, and in your personal strategy? Just over time, you know, I mean, first of all, my process fits my personality. Mm -hmm. So it kind of and clearly over time, as it started to work, you know, you, you, you develop confidence in it. I still, every day, I'm waiting for this whole thing to blow up in my face. Um, but this is what I do. So this is what I stick to. Every time I go through a drawdown, I'm like, oh, my God. You know, but the truth is I, I stick to it. I stick to it. I stick to it. You know, it helps me in fairness a lot because I, um, I manage a business where I manage money for people who have given me money for this specific purpose. You know, I fit a purpose in their portfolio. Right. So therefore they're paying me to do that. So that's what I do. Right. Um, so that helps me a lot with my discipline, quite frankly, because I'm here to do what I told them I would do. Right. Um, so I stay disciplined to that. That, that, that helps. Yeah, perfect. And uh, I saw a few questions about, uh, where people can find the COT data. Do you have any recommended sources for that? So COT data is available for free. It comes right from the CFT website and the data is there and you can download it. I can't because I am completely incompetent, but anybody that is competent in computers whatsoever can download it for free from the CFT website, right? There are places all over the internet, you know, all these different whatever chart places and, and stuff that, show cot data with their charts you can see it there too um so you can get it for free all over the place um we have our own cot charts on crowded market report i like to believe they're the best ones out there i used to pay because i didn't like any of the free stuff i used to pay a place um to get cot charts um then it's not a lot of money but I like the way it, pre it was presented better than any other ones. But my partner who started this crowd market report went and developed much, much better charts for that. We already, first of all, he covers a lot more markets. 
Second of all, he's made it very, very interactive. You can change the dates on it, you know what I mean, to whatever dates you want. You can also combine it if you want to look at, you know, instead of S&P, what's the commitment of traders on S&P? You can say, okay, what's the commitment of traders on all equities here? Russell, S&P, Dow, what's that look like? I, I haven't seen anywhere that can do anything like that. So uh, that's available on our website. But like I say, it's you can get decent COT charts for free out there. Yeah, perfect. Um, and I saw there was a question earlier in the chat, with, which I know you answered, but I think it'd be good to kind of re reiterate um, what what kind of markets you trade. And I, I saw that uh, some people asked specifically about uh, crypto and, and Forex as well. And are you kind of market agnostic? Do you not really care what the particular market is? Just, you know, what what the signal kind of tells you? I do not care. There's no difference to me between S&P and soybeans. Um I trade all the U.S. futures markets because that's what this commitment of trader is available on, U.S. futures markets. So I trade all the U.S. futures markets that have liquidity. So there's basically 37 markets between the stock and the seas, the fixed income, the currencies, the commodities. You know, um, I do not trade Bitcoin, um, but we do obviously because there's been a lot of interest in it. We do present the in my weekly report the commitments of trader. Um, charts for bitcoin and ethereum because there's futures markets on it now and i will comment on what that looks like and and so far um the commitments of traders has been very very good for for bitcoin because it shows speculators way too long up there at thirty six thousand, and then it showed them way too short down there at whatever it was 17 16 000. so it was kind of giving a sell up there and it was giving a buy down there so um it's been pretty good so far in that yeah perfect um as we get more questions coming in, uh, I just have a few more here. Um, first of all, I, I know uh, you've kind of recently joined Twitter, which I, you're definitely a recommended follow. I definitely go ahead and check out Jason. Um, have on there. Obviously, there's a lot of traders talking markets, talking trading, um, taking that into account, and also just your own personal experience uh, with your service. Uh, what do you find are some of the biggest mistakes that traders make, and what are some things that they can do to correct that i think the biggest mistake that traders make is they try to outsmart the market you know and this year has been a perfect example right everybody knew that the recession's coming everybody knew that the economy is going to be bad everybody knew all these things and everybody was shorting and they have gotten their face ripped off right um and i think that's the biggest mistake people make and a mistake that I myself was very guilty of um, in the first five to 10 years of my trading, right? Um, and particularly when you have winning trades, all of a sudden you think you are smarter than the market, right? I think that you are going to learn over time that you are not smarter than the market and that will kill you, right? Um, so I think that's the biggest, the, the other one, and you know, Warren Buffett, of all people has said this one too, is people try to correlate the economy with the markets. And the famous line is the markets are not the economy. And you better believe that. I have done videos where I have shown this stuff and written papers and that have shown this stuff um, where if you correlated the economy to the market, if I had given you all the economic data a year in advance, then you would have done this and you would have lost money doing that. If you were correlating market to economy, um, I think one of the great ones, and I know there's plenty of counter arguments to this, but be, just because I was involved in, in the Hong Kong market for a long time, because that's where I started trading when I lived in Hong Kong, the Hang Seng when I was there in 1994 was like 13,000. Okay. And at the time in 1994, China had nothing. I was there. Okay. It had nothing. The tallest building in Shanghai was 18 stories high, all right? And from 1994, I went back to Shanghai for the Olympics. Well, I went to Beijing for the Olympics, but we visited Shanghai in 2008. So from 1994 to 2008, Shanghai was the biggest city in the world, all right? Forget about 18, so there were now no 18-story buildings because there were 8 million 80-story buildings, right? Makes New York look like a backwater, all right? And in that time period, the Hang Seng Index went from 13,000, and look where it is now. It's at 18,000, 
right? And at the time, I was a 22, 23 year old kid. And the obvious trade was China was going to grow because that was right when China was opening up, right? And as a young person, that's where I should be putting my retirement money into Hong Kong or China or, because that was going to have the biggest growth in the world. Well, it did have the biggest growth in the world. That was 100% right, okay? It had probably, I would argue, for 15 years, the biggest growth in the history of the world. And the Hang Seng has gone from 13,000 to 18,000. And the NASDAQ in that time has gone up God knows what, right? And even the S&P has gone up much, much more than that. So... I think that's sort of proof positive that you could have the economic data before it comes out and, and it's not going to help you because the, the correlation is just not there. So I think those are the two biggest mistakes people make. Yeah, perfect. You know, um, every time yeah. I see somebody on TV and the question is, well, what do you think the market's going to do? And their first line is, well, the economy... Okay, but that's not what I asked you. I didn't ask you what the economy was going to do. I asked you what you think the market's going to do. And that's always the first answer. So I think that's a big mistake. Yeah, for sure. Um, and another question I want to ask you was, um, is there a loss that stands out to you looking back at your career that was very meaningful, that taught you a big lesson Um is, is there a particular one that stands out or it's kind of all uh, a wash? I think there's a number that stand out, but um, certainly late 99, the second half of 1999, right? Um, and this was before I started using COT data. And this is actually what pointed me towards COT data. But the second half of 99 was a humongous bubble in the internet. We all know that in a retrospect. I knew that in real time because it was obvious, right? The shoeshine boy was giving stock tips, right? We all know what that means. So I knew that that was a ridiculous bubble. I had friends who were telling me how they turned, you know, $100,000 into $5 million by buying all these stocks and they were all heroes and, you know, they were all going to be very rich and all that. I knew it was a bubble. And I got my ass kicked because the second half of 1999, that bubble went up another 40 to 50%. Okay. And by the time it ended, I didn't have no money left to trade to take care of the shorts. Right. So that had a very big effect on me. You know, um, they say the market can be irrational longer than you can stay liquid or whatever. Right. That was what I lived in that. And that was when I found the commitments of traders. As it turned out, the commitments of traders didn't show people crowded long mm -hmm. until like January or February of 2000. Mm -hmm. So it would have kept me from shorting that market all the way until January or February of 2000, right? Which would have saved me, I can tell you, a hell of a lot of money. Right? And that's really when I started to look deep into commitments of traders when I saw that. Because trying to be contrarian, okay, but contrarians get run over, in particular if you're just doing contrarian price. All we need to do is look at NVIDIA. You know, recently, as a recent example, NVIDIA, for all I know, let, let's call it 50 times overvalued here. All right. Just for argument's sake. OK, but that means that 100 percent ago, which was only about two or three months ago, it was 25 times overvalued. Right. So if you were shorting it because you knew for a fact that it was 25 times overvalued, you've lost 100 percent on that trade. Man, you, you've gotten crushed. Right. So you can't just do it because of what you think you, you need the market to tell you when, however you define that. I have my definition of that. You could have your definition of that. It doesn't matter what you really use. You have to use something. Use a moving average. Use a reversal day on the candle. Use whatever you like to use. But don't just fight it because you think X, X, X. Because thinking is what's going to get you in a whole shitload of trouble on this. It will work sometimes, right? But over time, it's going to get you in a lot of trouble. Take it from me, because that's what happened to me, and it's what happened to essentially everybody I've ever known. So you're not going to be different. Yeah, perfect. I know you want to believe you're going to be different. We all want to believe that we're different, right? Yep. But we're not. There's a normal distribution curve. We all fit in it. And I always say there's one person out there, arguably, who is the single smartest person out there, okay? That's not even enough because the market price of something 
is the combined knowledge of everybody out there. So you have to be, you don't have to be the smartest person out there. You have to be smarter than everybody combined out there. And that's impossible. Einstein wasn't that smart. Nobody's that smart, right? And I, I like to point to Druckenmiller. I think I might've said that in the interview, but I, you know, Druckenmiller is a humongously successful trader. We can all agree to that, right? I have a client who has had money with him for 25 years. And he says, the guy writes up these monthly things and he says he writes so well. He's such a smart guy. He writes so well. And he writes in such a clear way. And he's wrong 80% of the time, okay, about what he says. He makes this whole economic argument and the whole this and that. He says the guy writes beautifully. If you were to read it, it would convince you you would want to put those trades on. He's wrong 80% of the time. And yet he makes money consistently. And he has said it himself. I am wrong way too much to count on being right as a way to make money. To me, that says it all. Stop trying to be right. Just make money. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. And I know you mentioned that uh, you may want to share some charts. Uh, do you want to go through a few COT charts live and kind of uh, talk through how to interpret them? Or what would you like to do? I guess if I were going to talk about something like that right now, um, if we're going to talk about the current market, I would share... I hope I can do this because, like I say, I'm just so incompetent. But let me try and share. Can you see that? Uh, you may have to press uh, share screen first. And right, while, me, while you're doing that, uh, please let us know if you have any questions uh, for Jason in the live chat. And, uh, yeah, it's just coming up right now, Jason. So, perfect. I see Excel. Okay. So, this is what I've been looking at all day today. Um, and what this is, is this is the commitment to traders charts for the combined fixed income, two, fives, tens, and thirties. All right. And the red means commercials. The blue means speculators at market turns. What I'm trying to do is fade these speculators and go with these commercials. So this would indicate I should be getting long fixed income at some point here. Right. But what's, it, it's very interesting to me what's going on in the fixed income world here, because on the one hand, the Fed continues to tell us that they are not lowering rates, right? They're going to stay higher for longer. They might pause, but they're not lowering higher for longer, higher for longer. On the other hand, the pricing in fixed income, which can be measured mathematically, um, the fixed income markets are telling us that they are going to lower rates two, three times by the end of this year, which is only six or seven months away, right? So there's either the hugest opportunity here, if, if they're not going to lower rates by the end of this year, then being short, especially the short end, like the two years, is, is a humongous opportunity. Well, I always look at it like the markets don't offer you opportunities like that, right? Something goes wrong, right? So this is showing speculators are massively, massively short fixed income, the most they've ever been by a long shot. The old record was here which is, you know, sort of towards the end of 2018. And by the way, this is right where fixed income bottomed in 2018 and had a humongous run up here. Um, I just feel like this is something to keep an eye on, right? I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow or this week or anything, but I feel very strongly something is going to happen here. Now, I understand, from what I understand, a lot of this has to do with the fact that these big hedge funds have essentially not made money in stocks for so long here, right? Because it's been so hard. You know, they've all been short because of the fundamental stuff and all that. They've kind of given up on trading stocks and they have now focused on trading this fixed income. They go back to their old fixed income basis trade, right? Where they'll make one penny and they'll leverage it up a hundred times. And I think that's what this is a function of, right? What I know is that always ends badly, all right? It's ended badly many times in my career. Um, simply because of something will happen somewhere and they'll have to cover these trades. And because they're all so short, there will be nobody to, to, to sell it to them, right? It's just like what happened with LTCM. The LTCM trade was 100% right in the end, but they blew out on it because something happened. They had to get out of the trade because they were too leveraged and everybody else was too leveraged and they couldn't get out of it because there was no buyer, right? And so they blew up and the trade ended up being 100% right. That's what kind of happens when things get this crazy. The timing is a different story, but 
that's what I'm keeping an eye on right here. I think it's extremely dangerous. And we can get into what's going to happen, you know what I mean, if the economy actually starts to – right as people are now starting to give up on that on this recession thing, they're just starting to give up on it, right? And you can go back and look at my videos and my interviews and stuff at the beginning of last year. I was saying – at the beginning of this year, the end of last year, I was saying this recession thing is just way too – in the market, right? Looking at the positioning and everything, everybody's bidding on this recession thing. I don't think the stock market's going to go down until they give up on it. They're starting to give up on it now. So right as they give up, I'm guessing that this could happen, but right as they give up on it, now it comes, right? And all these people that are shorting fixed income are going to get burned. <laughs> when they get burned, it's going to be ugly. So I just think it's something to keep an eye on. It's not anything that I'm trading. Look, I'm long stocks and all that kind of stuff, but not something I'm doing right now, but it's something that I am keeping an eye on very closely here. Yeah, perfect. And take a step back, would you mind kind of walking through this chart and explaining the different components and kind of how you incorporate it into your analysis just for people who are completely new about this? So let's take a little better one because um, that's a long-term one. It's kind of sometimes hard to see that, but um, I'm still yeah. seeing uh, the other chart. You may have to oh, yeah. stop, yeah. share, and reshare. Yeah, hold on, hold on. Yeah, no worries. I got to figure it out. Sorry. No worries. In the meantime, if you have All right, any questions. All right, here. You yeah, see there that? We go. Yep, we see it. Let's just take the two-year notes, okay? So what this says here, the red is the commercials, right? So it, it breaks down that there's three types of people that are, that are called the trade, right? As they're divided by the CFTC, right? Which is you have a commercial trader which is the red, a commercial trader is, let's say in wheat, a farmer. He actually has wheat to back up his trades, right? And the reason he wants to declare himself a commercial trader is because he gets lower margin rates because he actually has the, you know, the wheat behind it, right? So everybody else is a speculator. There's a large speculator, which is this blue line, and a small speculator, which are these yellow lines. A large speculator means there's a certain number um, in each market where if you have that many contracts, you have to declare it. And, and they do that because they don't want people to be able to corner a market, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're one of those people, you're in the blue. And everybody else, you know, that's one lotting, two lotting, 10 lotting, whatever, is the yellow. So this shows that the commercial, and, and commercials are going to be equal and opposite to the total of the speculators, right? So where I trade it is when all three of these match up, right? Commercial super long. Large speculators, super short, and small speculators, super short. So this is why I'm not fixing long fixed income here because you can see the small speculators, the yellow, have been long, right? And when you test this data, the small speculators are the worst of all of them. So I don't really want to be on the same side of them, right? So if we can get to a point, hopefully, where fixed income keeps going down and these small speculators get out and they start getting short to match this, at that point, I will be looking to get long fixed income. And God knows, I hope it's soon because... Uh, I could use it in my portfolio, but whenever it is, it is. That's when I will have it. So that, that's that's kind of how uh, how this data breaks down. And how do you kind of define extremes? What 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 tells you that the uh, large speculators are getting extremely short uh, a particular market? So I take this data and I turn it into an oscillator. And they're just like any oscillator. There's a, a look back period, whatever it is, one year, nine months. You know what I mean? Um, and that oscillator tells me when it gets to zero that, you know, they're super short. And when it gets to 100, that they're super long. And that's when I look to make a trade. And once you're in a trade, uh, you're you're watching for it to become neutral. Is that correct? The, the oscillator? Yes. Once yeah. my oscillator goes to 50, I'm out. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So that means that it, it like people get confused. Okay, the oscillator goes neutral, I'm out. That doesn't mean now the market is going to go down. The market might keep going up. It's just going to go up without me because I did my job. I caught that turn. That's my job. Right. From here, it's the trend followers job. And clearly, if they went from super short to neutral, it means the trend followers are getting in, right? Because a lot of these guys are trend followers, right? The blue, large speculators are essentially not all, but a lot is the CTAs slash hedge funds, which are trend followers, right? I mean, at the end of the day, macro investing is really just medium term trend following also. So if they're getting in, I'm getting out. And then if it keeps going up, good for them. They can make that money, right? But what I find is, and it makes sense, but the, the volatility after that point Increases. starts to go up a lot, right? Which is why you see 
the returns of trend followers being a lot more volatile um, than their returns, really. You know, their sharps are less than one because they're playing in a very volatile space, right? And I, I don't, A, I don't want that in my returns. I, I like where my sharp is. Um, and B, that's, like I say, that's their job. This is my job. That's their job. Let's all just do our job. And uh, the open risk line, the green line there, is that something you consider at all? or that's Not really. It's process. just part of the chart because people like it. So uh, we put it on there. That's the open interest. You know, that's just the open interest number. And, and we're starting to build the charts, too, to try to get price on top of this as well. So I know my, my partner is in the middle of uh, doing that project now because a bunch of people have requested that. Yeah, perfect. And uh, let's see, there are a few questions um, coming in. Let's see. Uh, there's a question about why, uh, in particular, you don't like to trade Bitcoin. It's not a question of I don't like it. Um, it's a question of, first of all, I need history of data before, I, like, if I'm going to set an oscillator on a, on a look back, you know what I mean? I can't do something with something that's been trading three months. Now, Bitcoin has now started, the futures have now started to have some time period in there. So I theoretically could start to build it and start to trade it. Um, to be quite honest with you, I think a lot of it comes down to laziness. I've been trading these 37 markets for 22 years. Um, for you don't me need another to, one? Yeah. I mean, you could always use one, I guess, to diversify. Uh, but the truth is I have to then go to my clients and say I'm adding a market. And then we have to go to the brokerage houses and get that market approved by the brokerage houses and we have to come up with limits. And, and quite frankly, I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm just too lazy to do that. You know, I don't need to hear it. Oh, why do you want to trade Bitcoin now? Oh, well, we have to come up with limits. And then the brokerage houses are so wacko with the Bitcoin limits these days anyway. You know, I mean, they're probably not even going to let me trade enough of them. And I, It's a stupid reason, but I'm just too lazy to deal with that at this point in my life. Yeah, fair. But we do cover it. Like I say, we cover it. And it has made, let's look crypto you can see here this is august okay speculators super long here right this is where we're looking to get short bitcoin right and here's january right speculators are getting super short right this is where we're looking to get long so we're getting short bitcoin in august and we're getting long bitcoin in january and then we're looking to maybe get short or at very least out of those longs just three weeks ago and now the speculators are actually getting out of those longs. So maybe Bitcoin can move, but people are, are wondering, well, how come Bitcoin, you know, the NASDAQ, remember Bitcoin used to be so correlated to the NASDAQ, right? Well, the NASDAQ has ripped and Bitcoin's gone nowhere since here. And if you can ask me why, I'm going to tell you it's because the speculators were too long here. So maybe now it can start to move, but, you know, it's only neutral, so there would be no trade here. But um, another interesting one on this was as that was going on, we're showing speculators super long, this Bitcoin here. Mm -hmm. And we're showing speculators super short, the Ethereum here. Mm -hmm. So you could think about at that point, which was earlier in this year, going long Ethereum versus short Bitcoin. And I don't follow it closely, but I believe that's worked. I think for the first time, everyone's a lot been talking about from what I understand for a couple of years, how Ethereum was going to be the new thing and it was going to outperform Bitcoin. It never did. And it started to right here. Now, you can tell me a million reasons why that happened, and I wouldn't be able to argue with you because I don't follow it close enough, but I can point to this and say this would have told you, without knowing anything about any of this stuff, this would have told you be long Ethereum versus short Bitcoin here, right? Right here, 411, right? 411, right? Be long Ethereum, be short Bitcoin from April 11th. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that that's worked. I believe Ethereum has, has outperformed Bitcoin in that period. And are there any common uh, mistakes or misinterpretations that uh, newer traders first looking at COT data might make in your experience? Yes. The first thing and the most important thing and the thing that I tell the people on my Discord and uh, everything almost every day is that just because a COT trade worked, like a trade using this data worked, doesn't mean it works every time, all right? It does not work every time. I can assure you with the amount of losing trades that I've had, it does not work every time. So you have to be very disciplined in the use of this, right? 
Um, and I talked about that, I think, during my presentation. There's other things that you have to do on top of the COT data to make sure that you're not catching, you know, you're not getting caught in the losing trades, you know. Like what might look like, even if we look at this Bitcoin, okay, right here, this looked like speculators, the large speculators were super short, but look what happened next week. They got even more short, you know. There's no limit to how short they can get. So that's, be careful, number one, right? Just because they're super short here doesn't mean that it's going to look like that in a month. And and we can go through that uh, with, with just about all these things. The two-year notes here, they look super short here, right? Mm -hmm. And look how much shorter they got, right? right? You have to be, and it doesn't just change with the COT. It's with every single trading process you use. You have to be super, super patient, right? Wait for the market to confirm whatever it is you're doing, whether you're using COT, whether you're using, I don't care what you use. The most important thing for me is wait for the market to confirm your view and then go with it. Don't fight the tape. These are all very old adages, right? But they mean something. Do not fight the tape under any circumstances. You'll never catch me buying something just because COT says it's crowded, all right? until the tape confirms it. And even then it doesn't always work, right? But until the tape confirms anything you want to do, you just have to wait, right? That would have helped you not have been short NVIDIA. Arguably, NVIDIA Friday, you could call the tape confirming, okay? Because the market's ripped and the video went down, all right? So if you wanted to call that confirming by the tape, okay, then shorten the video on Friday, right? I'm not condoning that, but that would have been the first time that you should have shorted the video was Friday. Would have saved you a hell of a lot of pain over the last three, four months. You know, you're talking about 100, and what's the video up this year? 180% or something, you know what I mean? It would have saved you a hell of a lot of pain because you were shorting it because it was overvalued. Let the tape tell you when. If you're going to be right, you're going to be right big. So let the tape tell you when. Don't fight it and don't try to be smarter is, is my point. And you just stop to to keep those losses small if you're wrong. That's right. If you were to shorten a video on Friday, well, then if it goes through the highs, then cover it. Right. You know, get out. And uh, you mentioned something in the chat as you were answering a question that I found really interesting. Uh, you mentioned that you don't raise your stop loss um, you keep it at that original level throughout the length of the trade. Could you kind of talk about that process and how you kind of arrived at that methodology? So it matches, first thing is it matches my process, right? I am picking, my process is I'm picking a turn, all right? So whatever your process is, what is telling you that it's right and what is telling you that it's wrong? If it's right, then stick with it. If it's wrong, then get out. So I'm picking a turn. So what tells me that I'm wrong? Well, if the if I'm buying something and it goes to new lows, then clearly I didn't pick the turn. It's that simple, right? So I stop out. Anything in between those, right? Okay, if I'm right and it goes up, well, now you're just in randomville. The market goes up, the market goes down, the Fed says this, the Fed says that, this and that, and the other thing. It's just randomville, right? How many times, I mean, I've essentially been long the stock market this whole year, right? How many down days were there during that period, you know? How many times would I have, if I had been trailing stops, would I have gotten stopped out, you know? Um, and then how do I re-enter? Because now I don't have my process to know when to re-enter, and, and, and it just becomes a shit show, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I used to do it where I would, and I was pretty good at it. I would get out of my position at a very good level and it would like, let's say I'm long, I would sell it. The market would go down and I would think about what a hero I was um, trading around my position. And by the time I got back in, it was gapping back through the highs. Right. And now I can't do it because now my whole risk thing has changed. Right. I'm buying it back higher. Now my risk is all messed up. So I don't do that, you know, and, and obviously I've been able to test all this stuff in certain ways. And it, it has shown me that, trailing stops do nothing you know people were talking earlier about how all oh, the algos will target your stops right and that is true right so it purposely they, they stopped me out and now i wish i didn't get stopped out right so i just sit on it if i'm buying a market low then by definition the market is going up 
and I just want to be there. I, I personally don't have any ability to, 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 to forecast the path of how that's going to happen. Right. And I need to be there because less than 40% of my trades work. I need to be there for the big trade. You know, I need to ride, you know, the, the NASDAQ up however many hundreds of points, right? Because I have a whole bunch of trades in the meantime that are stopping me out and stopping me out and stuff. I need those to pay for my losers. So I just sit on them. Um, I'm not interested in this random bill stop out crap. And, and does it happen sometimes that I buy something and it goes up a whole bunch and I'm happy. And then by the time I get out, it actually goes all the way back down and I get stopped out and I miss out on, you know, I had a winning trade. That turned. Yes, it happens. And, it, and does it suck? Yes, it sucks. But over time, that makes me more money than the other thing. So that's what I'm interested in doing. And I think that's a very important thing for people to understand. You know, um, you don't find this out until later when you're older and it's too late, right? It's all about over time, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about what you make today or this week or this month or this year. It's all about over time. That's where you're going to make money. I went 10 years of this whole make a bunch of money, lose a bunch of money, make a bunch of money, lose a bunch of money. And suddenly I was 32 years old and I had gotten nowhere, right? You can't get that time back, you know? So this all has to be about over time. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really and, and the only way to do that is to stay small in all your trades. Well, a guy in my Discord was saying it last night. One trade should mean nothing. When you can get to the point where one trade means nothing, then I think you're doing it right. Excellent. Um, yeah, I think that's a really important point. And with regards to the COT data, is there anything else with the charts that you really like to emphasize? Any special situations or um, yeah, anything else that you'd like to cover before we wrap up? Not really. I think uh, this is a very, you know, this is a very hard thing to do. I think people need to realize that. You know, it's a very hard thing to do. It's to me... I mean, I think that being a fireman and going into a house and saving people's lives is harder than this, you know, because <laughs> no one here is is risking their physical being. But as far as a mental exercise, trading is a very, very hard thing to do. And know that 95 to 98 percent of the people lose money doing this over time. Know that. And I know you want to believe that you're in the, in the three to five percent and you could be in the three to five percent. But think about how that's going to happen. You know, you better be doing something different than those other 95 percent of the people. Otherwise, you're going to end up just like them. And as I did until I changed and learned and as other people did. And, and you know, what made me change and what made me learn? I, you know, people like to think it's like this romantic thing where, oh, I kind of stuck my process and I learned and I did this and I did do all that, but it was completely out of necessity. Okay. I, I was unemployable. You know, nobody wanted to hire me because I was such a, you know, contrarian. No one wants a contrarian sitting next to them. You know, a big part of hiring is, is can the person sit next to you and deal with you, right? And I was very hard to deal with as a big contrarian, you know? So I had to do it out of necessity, right? And necessity is the mother of invention, as they say. I invented this whole thing out of necessity. So you have to kind of approach it like that. This is a very, very, very difficult thing to do. Know that going in. I know that you had success at some point and it seemed like it was easy, okay? Um, and now you've probably learned, most likely, given what the last three years have been, you've most likely learned it's actually not that easy. Um, it's not. Okay? So think about that because that's extremely important. What are you doing that's different than these other 95 to 98% of the people? And I can tell you that your ability to pick Fibonacci numbers ain't it. It, it just ain't it. Your ability to spot breakouts on a chart, it ain't it. Okay, everybody can spot breakouts on a chart. You know, they all do it. You can go on Twitter and you got people that are giving you their list of chart breakouts and all that stuff. It ain't it. That'll work sometimes. In a bull market, if you're buying breakouts on charts, it's a good chance it'll work, right? Um, but then in a bear market, it won't, you know? And even this year in a bull market, it has not worked on a bunch of things. It has certainly worked on these tech stocks, but um, then you have to say, oh, it's breaking out, but it's, you know, a thousand times, you know, revenue. So how the hell am I going to buy that, right? Um, so that's really what I would concentrate on. What are you doing differently than these 95 to 98% of people that are losing money? 
because if you're not doing anything differently to that than them, you are going to lose money as well. And, and losing money sucks. To state the obvious. For sure. I think I think that's a great point to leave it. Uh, Jason, thank you so much for your time. I, I really, I've learned a lot from you over the past uh, two interviews that we've been able to do. So thank you so much for, for taking the time to be a part of this. Uh, I'm sure everybody watching enjoyed as well and, and got something valuable out of it. Um, to everybody watching, uh, this is our last presentation of today. So thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, make sure to leave a like down below, subscribe to the channel, uh, consider a donation to St. Jude's. Uh, and I'll be right back with just a brief closing message uh, before we wrap up uh, day one. So thanks again uh, for tuning in. And uh, Jason, thanks again for, for being a part of this. Um, I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll be right back. Take care. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jason. Sh All right. So that signals the end of day one of the 2023 Trailline Training Conference. Uh, thank you guys all so much for tuning in. And we'll be right back tomorrow with another stellar lineup. We've got Jim Ropel, Chris Peruna, Lance Bredstein, uh, Ryan Pierpont, Brian Feraldi, Brian Shannon, and Linda Raschke. Really excited for all these presentations. You can see the topics right there. And we'll get started uh, tomorrow at 8.55 a.m., so a little bit earlier than today. Um, I'll have some quick opening remarks, and then we'll get right into it with Jim Ropel. Always gives a fantastic presentation and great talking with him. So make sure you guys tune in to that. Uh, go ahead and subscribe down below and click the notifi notification uh, bell so you'll be reminded. And moving on, uh, once again, just want to say that we're really proud to be putting this on um, over here at Trailline. This conference, once again, is my favorite thing to do. Uh, and this year, we're also giving away a free Ultimate Training Guide and email course, over 100 pages of educational material that can really help you develop as a trader and improve your ed. So go ahead and click the link down below in the description or popping up in the live chat if you're interested. And one more time, I also want to say, please consider a donation to St. Jude's if you are finding value in the conference. Um, it's a great cause, and you can go ahead and use the link down below the chat. And even $1, $5, $20 if you can uh, would be fantastic and a great addition to a great donation to, as I mentioned, a very worthy cause. Uh, so with that, uh, thanks so much for coming. We'll see you guys all here tomorrow. Uh, leave a like down below and subscribe if you haven't yet. And uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow around 9 a.m. Eastern. Take care.